Buenos días. Buenos días, bueno. Elena. Buenos días, Alida y Elena. Hola. Sí, hola. Qué linda, qué linda. Qué <ríe> Espérate, 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 para que saluda. ¡Oh! ¡Ay, Dios! Oh, ¡Qué belleza! 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 ¡Qué Sí, está Miguel. Miguel, saludos, buen día. Eh, quería comentarte, y bueno, ustedes también que están ahí. Yo tengo una vista pública a las 10 de la mañana y voy a, a tratar de participar en las dos cosas a la vez. Puede ser que sea una vista pública corta y, y en caso de que tenga necesidad, pues, Puedo salir del salón de la vista para hablar y compartir la información que necesite o votar o lo que sea. Eh, y si no, si ven que no contesto o pues no soy responsiva en el momento en que sea necesario. Pues, mira, láser, mira. Ri, Ricardo va, es, va a estar conectado y va a estar pues, bien perfecto. atento. Que me puede, me, me va a representar en caso de emergencia. Perdón. Hello. Okay. Good morning, everyone. This is Marcos Hanke, CFMC chair. Uh, we're going to wait uh, three minutes more to start the meeting. We have a very loaded agenda today. We need to, to be very effective in this way, just three minutes waiting for other people to connect. Chapel. I'm just checking my microphone. Loud and clear. Thank you. Hello, good morning to everyone. Wilson here. Wilson Santiago. Thank you, loud and clear, Wilson. Yeah, thank you, Marcos. Saludo a todos. So, any idea when we'll be having the next in-person meeting? We're going to discuss a little bit about that, but not yet. There is no, it's really hard to predict. Awesome. Good morning. Good morning.
Good morning to everyone. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. This is Marcos Hanke, CFMC chair. We're going to start the 173 council meeting. Today is April 27, 2021. It's 9.03 a.m. Uh, by starting this meeting, I will invite everybody to read again the code of conduct, which is always state your name before participating, speak loud and clear, use the chat to ask for a turn to speak. Important, show respect, decorum and professionalism at all times to the all members and agencies. Your mic will be muted if personal insults, foul words of out of order conducts are used. Participants, participants have to be, they have to be short and to the point. Mic muted at all times. Just open before the, the turn to speak. Eliminate ambi ambient uh, disturbing sounds. Avoid feedback by using one sound source. Thank you for your patience. Uh, the roll call, uh, I think uh, Christina or Leah Haig gonna support me on that? I will be doing that roll call, Leah Haig. Go ahead, Leah Haig, thank you. Okay, good morning, my name is Leah Haig Rivera. We will, start now the, we will start now the roll call, starting with myself, Leah Haig Rivera, Miguel Rolón, Angie Rizarri, Alexis, Alida Ortiz Sotomayor, Angie Rizarri, Carlos Farcheri, David Ortiz, Diana Beltrán, Diana Martino, Edward Schuster, Guillermo Cordero, Elena Anton, Jessica Stephen, Jocelyn De Ambrosio, John Walter, Jose Rivera, Julian Magras, Julie Neer, Kevin McCarthy, Marcos Hankey, Maria Lopez Merced, Matt Walia, Michelle Duval, Nelson Crespo, Orian Sadik, Refik Orun, Rich Appledron, Ricardo Lopez, Robert Copeland, Sarah Stephenson, Senai Hapstis, Shannon Calais, Stephanie Martinez Rivera, Wilson oh, Santiago, Yamitza Rodriguez, and Jasmine Vélez Sanchez. Miguel, Those are all you... on my attendees on my list. Hello, Marco. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Miguel. No, está bien. Ya empezaste la reunión. Yeah, we start. I'm gonna, okay. I'm gonna open the, the state the date again because of the recording. Sí. Today is April 27, 2021, 173 CFNC meeting. Uh, we start uh, at 9:03 a.m. Right now it's uh, 9:03. 6 a.m. Uh, we just listed the the roll call made by Leah Hyde. We're gonna pass now for adoption of, of the agenda. Before uh, you go into adoption of the agenda, we need to excuse uh, Graciela Garcia Moliner due yes. to passing of her father uh, and uh, Vanessa Ramirez. She will join us after lunch. She's also in another family. Uh, funeral the, this morning. So those are the two that have been asked to be excused. Yes. I also missed Christina Olan, who is the one driving the presentations. Thank you, Lehi. Uh, on the adoption of the agenda, uh, any consider extra consideration or, or we need a motion? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Uh, tomorrow morning, uh, we would like to start at 8.30. There will be a presentation of unsolicited proposal by Dr. Virginia Chervet. It's about the project that she's proposing the council to consider for funding uh, for the lane snapper. And then in, in other business tomorrow, we should read for the record the letter sent by Dr. Michel Shatter regarding the Red Hine uh, closed season and closure for the record. And then we you, you, you decide what to do at that time tomorrow morning, tomorrow uh, at the other session, excuse me, other business. 
Thank you, Miguel. We'll do the next steps. Yes, and uh, one other uh, very small change on the agenda is that uh, some route will be presenting for Paul Duremos on, on the, the listening section. And uh, he will be presenting and running the meeting for that hour. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, we, we need a motion to adopt the agenda. Call for Sherry motion to accept the agenda as read. Back on Tony Blanchard. Good morning. I'm here with Julian. Thank you, Carlos and Tony. Uh, there is a motion to adopt the agenda. Any opposition? Hearing none, the agenda is approved. Uh, the consideration of, of 172 council meeting verbatim transcription, any comment or a motion to, to accept it? Motion to accept the verbatim minutes as read. Call for Shelly. Second. Second, Tony Blanchard. Thank you for of both. Any objection? Hearing none, it's approved. Uh, executive, executive Director Report, Miguel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Not much to add, except that uh, we visit the funding for this, for this year. We're waiting for maybe addition uh, funds during 2021. But the monies that we have received are enough to undertake our operations uh, for the for this year. Um, the council, as you know, is is working with the WCAPSI, the the United Nations Western Central Atlantic Fishery Commission, and we are participating in several working groups. Uh, this year, the council will be assisting in funding with NOAA, NOAA International Fisheries Office. Uh, in the work plan that was adopted last year by the Western Central Atlantic Fishery Commission. We will be able to have those meetings virtually this year, maybe in December. We will have a mix of virtual uh, and in-person meeting, in-person meeting. Due to the pandemic, uh, problem that we all know is happening. Uh, the council staff will continue working, uh, doing the teleworking with um, sporadic visits to the council office. And the building is, is also requesting every office to uh, maintain the control, the COVID-19 control plan. So we will be continuing working until 2022. And but the, the council staff is available for any any business that that we need to deal with during this year. The August meeting was supposed to, or we were hoping to have a, an in-person virtual meeting, but it is probably not going to happen because of, you know, we have problems in Puerto Rico and elsewhere. And it seems that we have a third, fourth wave of COVID that would preclude us from uh, having that meeting uh, in person. The, the other uh, issue that, that we were discussing before have to do with uh, the, not, not issue, but uh, notification, the CCC will meet in, in May and the agenda is already um, adopted by the majority of the, of the groups. Then the the strategic plan is going to be presented at this meeting by Dr. Michel Duval. And we are proposing to have a one day meeting of the council by July 21st to finish the process of adopting the document. And remember the document has to go to public, uh, to the public process. So we can uh, adopt the five year strategic plan in 2021. That's what we have so far, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Miguel. I just want to recognize Andy Strolchek from uh, Ciro. I just re received Maria Del Mar 
the text that he was having problem to connect. Uh, do you have any sh uh, any word for the council and then welcome for the process on the process? Yeah, thanks, Marcos. I really appreciate the introduction. I'm serving as the acting regional administrator currently for Southeast Regional Office uh, after Roy's retirement on December 31st. I look forward to working with you. Thank you very much for uh, attending our meeting and uh, uh, thank you very much for your interest and let's keep mo moving forward. Thank you very much. We have the next item, item on the agenda is the Southeast data assessment and review that presentation. There's no presentation. Um, I was just going to give you guys an update on CDAR 80, Caribbean Queen Triggerfish. This is Julie Near, by the way. Sorry, CDAR coordinator for this assessment, CDAR 80, Queen Triggerfish. Um, the assessment started. I do have, um, there is a schedule that was supplied to you guys in the briefing book, I believe. We could put that up if you wanted to see that. Um, but basically, we started in early January of this year with this assessment. We had a data scoping call for the life history group. Um, and it was at that time that the group was informed that there is no, that the ages will not be ready until the end of September. And so there was some discussion amongst those on the, at the group. Council staff was present as well and SSC representation as well. And it was determined that we really want those ages. The Science Center informed the group that they could continue with the schedule um, on track um, as planned um, and finishing it on time, but it would certainly limit the availability of options with regards to what type of assessments we could do without having those age data. So it was determined by the group that they prefer to push the assessment back to allow for that age data um, to be made available. So instead of the assessment basically being underway now, um, full bore with a completion date in fall, um, we have now have a sled most of the assessment process back um, waiting on that age data. And now the assessment will be completed in April of 2022 instead of, I believe it was originally October of 2021. Um, 20, um, so, um, but the group really thought it was critical to have that age data available for consideration and inclusion for possible modeling um, options that it would afford us. And uh, that's pretty much all I had with regard to an update for that. Thank you very much, Julie. Do you, do you have any question or any other observation for the, for the council? No, oh, that's it. Um, that was pretty much it with regard to Triggerfish. And then I believe Graciela mentioned that at some point the council is gonna talk about, well, I heard you're gonna talk about a proposal potentially for Lane Snapper. Um, the steering committee is meeting in May, May 13th, at which time we need to know the council's um, requests for 2024. We need to know what species, what platforms um, you guys are interested in having assessed for 2024. Um, we'll need that information in about three weeks. Thank you. Thank you for, thank you for putting in context the need of those information to, to come up to the council. Thank you very much, Julie. Sure. Uh, we we have the next item on the agenda. If there is no question, there is any question for for Julie. You know? Hearing now the Southeast Fishery Science Center. The part of the agenda of the Southeast Fishery Science Center, uh, Miguel Oleja, who, who will be presenting on that 
Mark. Uh, hi, good morning, Marcos. This is Clay. Um, I just just got back from the chiropractor, so I think uh, uh, John Walter was going to um, give a little synopsis of where we are. But John, you're muted. No, I still don't hear you. I see your lips moving, but no sound. Yes, we're, we're having a... We have some difficulties with John Walters and he's trying to join in again. This is Shannon Calais. Can you hear me? Yes. We can wait a few more minutes for John, but if John is not able to get his audio straightened out, I'm prepared to introduce this topic. Yeah, why don't you go ahead, Shannon? Okay. Thank you, Shannon. So we do have some news to announce, and I will be yielding the floor ultimately to Kevin McCarthy. But first, I did want to introduce Kevin McCarthy. Many of you know him well. He has been a member of the Caribbean SSC for a number of years. And he is now our acting branch chief of the new Caribbean branch at the Southeast Fisheries Science Center, and he will be introducing them shortly. I also wanted to introduce Keeley. Um, unfortunately, John knows, John can introduce Keeley much better than I can, but Keeley is our new communications officer at the Southeast Fisheries Science Center, and she's working directly with Clay and with John to facilitate our communication. So we, we really want to say that I think that's a great addition to our directorate, and we look forward to improving our communications with this council. So at this point, I will now open the floor to Kevin, who will tell you more about the Southeast Fisheries Science Center topics. Good morning, Kevin. Go ahead. Good morning, Marcos. Um, just doing the sound check. Can everyone hear me? Yes. OK, great. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon. Uh, thanks, Marcos. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I won't, I won't belabor the, the 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 introduction of myself since Shannon's already done it, and a number of you um, already know me. Uh, but I would like to introduce um, the staff of the newly formed uh, Caribbean branch at the at the Science Center in Miami. Uh, some of the names you'll recognize, and and some will be new to you all. Uh, so Nancy Cummings, uh, Adian Rios. Stephanie Martinez and Rafiq Orhun uh, comprise the staff along with me. Um, of course, Nancy um, and Adian are familiar to a number of you from uh, previous stock assessments. Nancy also has a, uh, an important and leading role in the WCAPSI uh, group. Um, Stephanie uh, is new to the Caribbean, at least in terms of her um, of her her work with the Science Center, uh, but she's but she's from Puerto Rico, so she's not new to the Caribbean uh, in her in her in her own life. Uh, Rafik uh, has done uh, a, a, for years now um, work in the Gulf of Mexico, um, but he's also done a lot of work with aquaculture. So the uh, the group itself brings together a lot of expertise. Um, data supply, data analyses for stock assessments, stock assess assessments themselves, as I mentioned, aquaculture uh, with Rafiq's background. Um, also, uh, a number of folks have been involved with outreach and education. Uh, Adian Rios, for example, has done some work mm -hmm. in the region um, with outreach and education. A number of you may have seen her presentations in the past. Um, uh, just a couple of other items uh, before I yield the floor back to Clay or, or John or Shannon, whoever, whoever may be picking up the baton from here. Um, we're, we're working, uh, the group here is working collaboratively with DPNR and DNER, uh, universities in the region, University of the Virgin Islands, for example, um, other federal agencies and contractors on more than 14 projects. Uh, in the region. So we're excited to keep those going and, and I'm excited to have some other folks coming in to, to work on those. Um, these include port, uh, improved port sampling, 
uh, life history information, gear selectivity issues. Um, we also want to improve our communications uh, with with you all, not not just um, with a new communications uh, director, but but in general between directly between this um, new Caribbean branch and council staff and other folks in the region. So, um, uh, but I but I would say we want to we want to maintain the 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 channels of communication that we've already established. Um, so, for example, council and SS, SSC requests should still go to Larry Massey, John Walter, Shannon Calais, and now me. Um, uh, we're also working with other folks um, in the Science Center that aren't necessarily in Miami, although there are some other folks in Miami that will continue to do Caribbean stuff. Kim Johnson, for example, uh, is in the Miami lab, uh, but not in the Caribbean branch. So we've got some cross uh, uh, branch uh, work going on within Miami, but there, are, and, and many of you may be aware of this, we've got uh, staff in Panama City and Galveston in the Pascagoula Laboratory, uh, among, among others that are, that are doing work in the region. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm going to do um, is, is set up a regular meeting, maybe a monthly meeting with council staff, with uh, Graciela and, and whoever else is appropriate, just to just to be talking more and and um, and staying on top of issues that that uh, we don't want to to fall through the cracks due to lack of communication. Um, I want to reiterate um, a number of the points that that uh, Julie Neer just made. Uh, that CDR eighty is underway. Queen Triggerfish. Um, the and that we've the project schedule, as she's mentioned, has been adjusted to to allow some of the critical age data from Virginia Chervet to be to be included. Um, there is an updated uh, schedule on the website. Um, I think we also would like to reiterate that um, that a stock assessment prioritization uh, should be should be conducted. Let's get the highest priority species on a routine schedule. Um, and uh, and and some sort of appropriate assessment frequency. So uh, we can work in this new Caribbean branch to help facilitate that, to help facilitate identifying the high value species and indicator species that that uh, that should receive some high priority and, and regular uh, assessments. Um, we've got uh, just a couple of science issues that I'll that I'll go over and then and then yield uh, the floor back to others at the Science Center. Um, we do have cooperative research program funding. Uh, we've got a project in Puerto Rico right now, um, uh, and cooperative research program uh, that that is a that is a, a project. Those are projects that. That directly involve the, uh, the the industry. So either uh, commercial uh, uh, folks or or the people from the recreational sector are directly involved in the process with scientists. So that's a that's a program uh, that we're very excited about. Um, it's uh, it, it it facilitates not only the science but it but it gets the community involved. Uh, to to take active uh, an active role in collecting the data for for management of their resources. So I think that's a very important program. We're really excited about it, um, and 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 hopefully that funding will continue into the future and will and will expand um, the the programs and the research that we're doing through that through that uh, mechanism. Uh, one of the other issues that we'll be working with uh, Puerto Rico DNER scientists is to uh, automate the correction factor calculation. As as you all know, that um, the landings uh, in Puerto Rico uh, are utilize a correction factor to to calculate uh, or to estimate the the total landings. Uh, that for Puerto Rico staff is is fairly laborious. And so the Science Center uh, staff are going to work with uh, 
um, DNER to improve that process. Uh, right now, it, it, it takes quite a while to, to get the data entered and to analyze the data. And that's a process that we think we can uh, automate and, and make it a, a bit more uh, streamlined and, and rapid. Uh, that way we won't be waiting uh, longer than, um, than is absolutely necessary to, to have those landings in. And because the landings are so important to the management process, we'd, we'd like those to come through uh, as quickly as we can get them through. We're also working with uh, Virgin Islands DPNR, uh, Division of Fish and Wildlife Scientists to improve port sampling efficiency. Uh, folks uh, at... Uh, at some of the uh, the landing spots and the and the boat ramps may see uh, may see uh, the fish and wildlife scientists out. Uh, we're, what we're trying to do is improve the speed at which port sampling occurs. We don't want this to be uh, any more burdensome to the fishers than it than it absolutely has to be. But the the the, the landings and the, the size composition of the landings are critical for management. So we're, uh, we're excited that this project is, is beginning. Uh, and, and so you may see a bit more uh, activity with uh, DFW staff. Um, they, are, they are going to be um, using photography, but these are uh, to, to help facilitate this process. But what they'll be doing is they're taking pictures of the landed catch. They're not taking pictures of people. They're not taking pictures of vessels. They're taking pictures of the catch so that we can more readily uh, automate uh, I, species identification and we'll get links of the fish from those photographs. But, I mean, this is a process we'll have to We'll have to uh, work through it, um, so we won't we won't be fully um, underway uh, immediately. But it's uh, but it's a method to try and and improve sampling efficiency. So so when somebody comes in with a bunch of fish and they're and they're due to be sampled, uh, it won't it won't take uh, an extraordinarily long time to sample the catch. We, what we're trying to do is make this less burdensome for the fishers, um, and so that's the 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 kind of activity that that you may be seeing in the in the coming weeks and months uh, at some of the landing sites in the Virgin Islands. So that I think is all that I had. Um, so I'm I'm prepared to yield the floor back to to John or Shannon or Clay, whoever needs to take this up. I'll jump in. I'll just jump my sound works, my sound it? Works, does it? it does. All right. I wanted to just apologize for my inability to manage Zoom. This is John Walter of the Southeast Fisheries Science Center. Good morning to everyone. And um, we're really happy to have Kevin on board and to form the Caribbean branch. And I won't take up any more time here on that, but I think we'll be working very closely and it's going to increase our ability to focus on the Caribbean and provide a much higher level of service. Uh, also, I think uh, Shannon noted Keeley Belva, our uh, communications manager, so we'll be able to communicate a lot better as we've hired a, a dedicated communications manager, and that's a really big thing for our center. And so with that, um, I'll yield to anyone else from the center. Thanks. So, so thank you for that, John and Shannon and Kevin. I really appreciate it. You did a very thorough job. The only thing I would add is that um, as I mentioned at a previous council meeting, the Southeast Center is going through a complete reorganization. And so I, I'm, I'm the blame for that, but the idea is that we're trying to find ways to be more efficient with the resources that we do have. Uh, as many of you know, resources have been pretty scarce everywhere, including in the Caribbean. And we just got a, a $1.2 million budget reduction this year. So it's all the more important for us to try and figure out how we can be more efficient. And one of the ways we can do that is to centralize across our own organization, uh, both in terms of things like administrative tasks, but also try and do a better job of having uh, people who are experts in a particular field supervising only that field and not try and be a jack of all trades. So we've completed 
two phases of that reorganization and from our perspective completed the final phase and are almost ready to go it's just that it's hung up in the department of commerce now uh, hopefully that will happen soon and then we'll be completely reorganized and you'll start seeing a lot more efficiencies but as part of that reorganization uh, we stood up the Caribbean branch that you've already heard about. John Walter's position as deputy director for council services is also part of the reorganization. And that's something that I put in place because our center is the only one that has three councils and really a fourth council when you count HMS sharks, because although they're not formally a council, they act like one because the sharks aren't managed by another management body. So essentially we have four councils. Uh, the most any other science center has is two. And being that divided with so many meetings, it's really hard for me to give the due attention to everything. So John is going to be my, my right hand, helping me staff the meetings, make sure you you get the service that you deserve. Um, and as he mentioned, Keely Belva is our new communications lead. We're looking to step up our game in both internal and external communication. And I will say we're, we're courting funds to try and expand our engagement in the Caribbean. Um, we have some, some good leads and possibly we'll end up getting some funds, but it's really too early to say anything definitive yet. Um, but overall, I have to say I'm, I'm pretty excited. You listened to that long list that Kevin gave of all the accomplishments that we're making in the Caribbean. Uh, spiny lobster assessment is is a huge one, actually. Uh, it's the first time we've had an assessment of that level completed in the Caribbean. So really excited to see that get used in, in management. And overall, just uh, really happy with the way people are, are coming together and we're starting to see some real progress in the Caribbean. So thank you very much. Anybody, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Anybody else from uh, from your group want to speak? Otherwise, I have a comment. Uh, this is Marcos de Hanke, and I want to welcome all the new members of the Caribbean branch. And at the same time, I want to say thank you to the previous people that have been uh, addressing this and forming this great group to work with our region. Spe especially to Kevin, Adian, Shannon, uh, and Kevin. And the communication with the fishermen have been improved. And uh, especially based on working with the fishermen, uh, being available and transparent during the processes. Also very patient uh, explaining the technical and scientific elements to the fishing community. That's essential for this area uh, because this is where the connection take place uh, that didn't happen in the past and this team uh, uh, are able to, to do. And this way I'm very happy for, the, for this new uh, timing and uh, the new accomplishments and new things coming up. Thank you to all and uh, any comments from the rest of the, of the council members to move on? Any question? Hearing now, if you if you guys uh, see, I'm speeding up the whole process because we have a very loaded agenda. Thank you very much for the presenter so far. Uh, hear no, hearing no question, we're go, going to go for the next item on the agenda, which is the statistic, uh, scientific and statistic community. Right, thank you, Marcos. Uh, you can hear me, correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we do. All right. So there's a presentation. Um, yeah, there we go. And go ahead and make that full screen. So this is a report of the SSC. Next slide. Uh, in our last meeting, we discussed uh, two issues, the ecosystem conceptual model and updates to spiny lobster uh, ABC process. And so I'm gonna go first with the conceptual model. Next slide. Uh, this is going to be uh, somewhat of a review from what I gave last time. 
to the council. So the SSC has been working on a single generic model. It's been a very evolved process as we've gone along. That model, as you will see, is highly complex. And this reflects the diverse expertise and experience of the SSC members. I and mean, when we have uh, biologists, stock assessment people, economists, sociologists, et cetera. Um, so we have a, a very broad area of expertise represented. Um, and um, that expertise and the, the issues that they deal with are expressed in the model. Uh, one of the concerns um, is the time to uh, develop a model versus how many models we were asked initially to do. So we've been working on one generic model and um, as opposed to three separate models for each platform uh, because we've spent all this time just on one model so far and to triple it would be, um, well, an ongoing, perhaps never ending process. Uh, we were also concerned about the independence of the product. That is to say, um, we're de developing a generic product. If there's any expertise uh, on the platforms, it's largely with Puerto Rico. Uh, but for any of the platforms, for the SSC to really develop something there, we would have to heavily rely on the input and knowledge base um, other people from those areas, and that would be specifically the DAP members who have already produced their own models. So to keep our model independent um, was another reason for not doing three separate models. Um, and we think that uh, the generic model will be suitable for comparison purposes, and I'll talk more about that um, at the end. Next slide. So just as a review, we started out looking at uh, a bunch of sub models that spanned the human dimensions that you see on the left and the natural dimensions that you see on the right. So each one of those submodels has a bunch of things in them and the lines there represent potential um, connections between uh, those submodels. But at the time, um, this is just kind of where we were at that time and things have gotten more complex. Next slide. So as I said, it got more complex and this was still early in the stage, just back in September of 2020. And um, we've progressed from there. This is, uh, um, next slide. So we have eight submodels and those submodels vary in the number of components. The numbers listed in there show the number of of components within each submodel, it turns out that if you were to look at all potential connections, that's 64,000 potential connections that you're going to argue in committee. Um, you know, you can see how laborious this process would be. Uh, next slide. So we broke this down and we were looking at first uh, connections within the submodels. And this is a matrix of all the submodels. Um, uh, along the top and along the side. So the diagonal is within submodels and the kind of peachy coral color uh, that you can see in those boxes represent where there are connections within a submodel between components of that submodel. Uh, the green don't really pay much attention. That was early thinking on potential connections between submodels, but we hadn't gotten there really yet. So you can see that there's a lot of uh, connections just within submodels, which is why we have the submodels. And, um, and but there's a lot of white space out there to, to that uh, remain to be looked at. Next. So um, we had this exercise where we were looking at the priority connections between the components within each pair of submodels. So for each pairing of submodels. We asked each of the SST members to identify their three most important connections. The direction as is a positive relationship or a negative relationship and their strength as I say low, medium or high uh, in their strength. And this would produce what we were thinking at the time as interim results that could be used by the council and the TAP and could also be used by other projects like the Lenfest project and the ecosystem status report. Next. 
And to give you an example of, of what we went through, um, this is the spreadsheet we were working on. There's 56 sets of comparisons across those eight submodels, um, not including, and you know, without having the the, the self within some model connections. So we asked each one to say, okay, what would be the driver component in one submodel and who would be the target component or the response component in the other submodel? What's the direction of that relationship and the strength? So this is the spreadsheet that everyone had to fill out on the, on the, on the SSC. Next. And as an example, again, uh, like I think I gave this at the last review, but um, just as an example of what we were thinking about, the three most important connections from the socioeconomic and cultural drivers submodel affecting fishery submodel could be uh, seafood imports and exports affecting commercial catch, market demand affecting commercial catch, and tourism affecting recreational catch. In this case, there were uh, two driver components affecting the same component as showed in the next one. So this is the list of the components in each one of those models. And you can see that as an example, here are three things that could be affecting uh, two other ones as perhaps the priorities. Uh, put that in a graphical form, next slide. It would look like that. Uh, gets a little bit more messy, but it shows the same thing. Next slide. So, and this is how you would score that on, on uh, our, our sheet where um, you see the driver component, the response component, the direction. You can see for seafood exponents, that direction is zero. It means it's both positive or negative, depending on whether you're talking about imports or exports. Um, and then uh, some example of what the strengths might be in terms of medium and high in this case. Uh, next. So this is an example of the actual outputs. This is uh, just one of those 56 sets of comparisons. And this is uh, competing uses of resources versus land-based uses. You can see, although we were asked to identify our three top priorities across the SSC, there were 10 connections that were given um, priority by at least one SSC member. And um, the scores are that you see are the strengths, so three would be a high. Um, and we get a number of data points from that. We get uh, what was the, the mean score, uh, if you're looking along the, um, the right-hand side there. We also get the tally, which is the number of SSC members who uh, rank something as that being that high. And then we get the product of those, which would be the sum. And there's also variance uh, values that are associated with this. So uh, we're able to take this ranking process and generate some quantitative information in, in terms of where the SSC saw uh, in importance and, and how that importance was scored. And remember with each one of these, there's also a direction um, that's associated with these. So this is the kind of information we were generating each one of these comparisons was discussed. Um, people were allowed to change their scores after hearing arguments from other people. So it took a while to get through all this. Uh, next. So the overall result was that uh, there were 484 connections identified between components across submodels. Uh, the minimum number would have been 168 if we all agreed on what the top three was or were. And uh, as a consequence, we had a 288% increase over that minimum. Next. This gives you the uh, a color representation. Now we're ignoring the diagonal and the red blocks are where we see connections uh, between subcomponents. You can see there's a lot of red there. And we can use just this graphical output to identify some some key areas uh, right away. Next slide. So for example, uh, no, the one before, there are uh, 
36 cases where natural disturbances was identified as being a, a, an important driver uh, across many of the submodels. So a lot of components within those submodels were identified. Uh, so if we're looking at, you know, what's the role of something, well, natural disturbances have a strong influence across the system as a whole. Um, the next one. Uh, to a lesser degree, but still strong components were coastal development and the regulatory structure um, affecting, again, a lot of the components in the various submodels. So there's um, some key uh, subcomponents that have a broad reach across uh, all of the models. Next. We can also look the other way, which identifies who's being impacted a lot. And you can see coral reefs, and here is the lead, where there were 28 components from various submodels that are impacting coral reefs. Um, fishing grounds was the next one. There are 27 uh, components that affect the fishing grounds component. And seagrass beds were affected a lot, as were inshore forage fishes. And this is not surprising. These are the bases of our fishing. Um, the habitats, the, the food base, and the locations where uh, things occur. Next. So we had 484 connections um, across submodels. We add those to the 304 connections between components within each submodel. So uh, we have 788 total connections. Um, within the, the model as a whole. And we're getting quantitative outputs for these that reflect the diversity and strength within the SSC. Um, I think the compilation is still in process, um, although it may be close to being finished now in the sense that um, there has to be written descriptions and definitions of each of the components. And that information and discussion is um, regarding the strength and direction of stuff. And that's all stuff that's extracted from the transcripts of our discussions from these uh, meetings that have been going on for, I think, over a year. Next. So where are we? Uh, the SSC has finalized its generic ecosystem model for the US Caribbean. I said we'd like to stop there. The US believes that the ecosystem conceptual model in its current state meets the objectives that the SSC was tasked by the council following the Caribbean region EBFM roadmap implementation plan. The SSC also feels that the generic model it developed should be sufficient and that developing three separate SSC island-based models is not necessary to meet the objectives of the overall process of developing a fishery ecosystem plan and specifically the next step of comparison of conceptual models. Next. The SSC recognizes that the ecosystem conceptual model will be useful in developing the next steps in the process of developing a fishery ecosystem plan and addressing concerns specific to the SSC. And here are some examples. Uh, it'd be useful for generate questions to help prioritize management strategies, such as management strategy evaluations. Uh, it can help generate questions to help prioritize future research and identify data and knowledge gaps. It can be used to identify hypotheses to be tested using available data in quantitative modeling approaches. So we noted that of the identified leakages uh, that were given priority, 28% of them um, actually have data so that shows us that there are places we can work, but then there's also lots of gaps that we need to uh, look at to try and get the data for them. Um, so this is just how some data does not account for the data extent or quality, but at least uh, there is some data for 28% of those. Next. And continuing on examples, uh, we can identify key ecosystem linkages and indicators for risk assessment. And we can explore different visualizations and communication tools for effective outreach of conceptual model outcomes. Um, and there are specific issues like magnitude, variability, and directional relationships would need to be um, dealt with or confronted in order to realize these next steps. So there's still work to be done. Next.
I think that's it. Yeah. So our conceptual models, I've joked before, uh, kind of started looking like this. Um, next. Next slide. Then things actually got out of hand and it was looking a lot worse. But I think we've actually gotten things a little bit more under control and it looks a little bit more contained. Um, but we did not see the, the uh, at this point of having to slug our way through 64,000 boxes when we've already got 780 something uh, taken care of. Next. Uh, so that's the end of the um, conceptual model review. And then now we're going to talk about our recommendations regarding OFLs and ABCs for spiny lobster. And um, the uh, recommendations that we're making are going to be uh, in response to things that were brought from uh, the Council and the Science Center. So these are going to be discussed, um, I, I believe, by the Science Center uh, later in uh, this morning, or uh, at least later in, in, in the, the Council's meeting. So uh, the details of those, I think you'll have to wait for and I'll just give the what our recommendations are on this. So the next slide. So first of all, there was an issue that uh, we are making changes just by kind of updating data and not really changing how we're doing anything. And it was requested by the center to allow the chair to approve those updates uh, without having to call a full meeting of the SSC. And the SSC voted to uh, accept that. So they will allow the chair to approve updated OFL projections and ABC estimates for spiny lobster using updated landings data and expansion factors such as Puerto Rico for 2019, which should be coming online um, for presentation of the council. So that should simplify uh, things as we go forward. Next. Uh, the SSC requested to the center to run updated projections with revised Puerto Rico landings data for spiny lobster for 2019 and the 2019 correction factors, and then updating the ABCs and OFLs uh, accordingly for the, the five year period 21 to 26. Next. The SSC recommends for the purposes of the draft framework amendment. Uh, to the Puerto Rico, St. Thomas, St. John, and St. Croix fishery management plans to modify spiny lobster management reference points based on the CDR 57 stock assessments. And the SSC recommends a constant, recommends both the constant catch or variable catch ABCs for 2021 to 23, um, um, as has already been done. So we're just being consistent with our recommendations that either one of those approaches is okay. Next, the SSC uh, requests uh, that the Science Center perform an interim assessment for spiny lobster by April 2022 and update all the landings and the tip data into the model for the three islands. The final data for uh, 2020 or 2021, depending on what's available at that time. Next. The SSC reminds the council to request spiny lobster be scheduled for a CDR operational assessment, given that the previous assessment used data from 2016. We note that the CDR data operates with a two year lead time as Julie had mentioned uh, previously. So um, we're kind of running toward the end of um, that, that period where the, we have confidence in the data. So we, we wanna look forward to making this a regularly scheduled process. Next. Uh, in the unlikely event that subsequent rulemaking with up, uh, updated spiny lobster OFLs, ABC, ACLs is not in place by the end of the SSC recommended year period 2023, the SSC recommends the following for each island group for both the constant and variable scenarios that the OFL ABCs for 2024 and beyond would be equal to the variable OFL ABC for 2023 until modified by subsequent rulemaking. This is a situation we are hoping would not occur. 
but we wanted to be on record that this is what should happen should it, uh, something unfortunate happen. Uh, and I think that's the last one. Next slide. Oh, there's one more. Uh, we recommend that for spiny lobster stocks, the council continue using the aromatic mean for ACL monitoring purposes. That's to say for triggering uh, uh, the AM correction and, and calculating length of AM based closures. Um, the, this was the question that was brought to us from the science center. Should we use the geometric mean or the arithmetic mean? What we've done in the past is the arithmetic mean and we would like the, um, we recommend to the council that they continue using that. Next. Uh, we had one other concern, and this is actually going to come up uh, this morning. Uh, the SSC recommended to the council that they request to the center to give high priority to reviewing the mayor report on the Puerto Rico port sampling and catch validation project. Uh, we think this is really going to be uh, a valuable tool uh, going forward on how to uh, improve uh, statistic uh, landings collections and, and um, uh, correction factors in the future. And uh, we're excited about that. We would like to see um, that presented to the SSC as soon as it is uh, clear as improvement through the center and, um, and try to utilize this information to make those improvements uh, within Puerto Rico uh, following recommendations as <clears throat> as reviewed by the various groups that are involved. So uh, we're excited about that and we'd like to see it move forward as quickly as possible. So that's my last slide. I understand there are some questions. Um, yes, Tony? Richard, we have Tony Blanchard. Yeah, my name is Rich. Tony Blanchard. Um, I see that the SSC recommends and the conceptual model, so only have a generic model. I mean, my opinion on that is I don't believe in anything being generic. But the simple reason is I understand the line of reasoning that they want to come up with a gen the generic model, but it would be like going to untuck it and you have a custom made shot to fit you. And then you go to the regular store and you buy a shot. That shot will not fit you like the custom-made shot. So I just like to put an Audi that, in my opinion, I don't believe in the generic fit. And uh, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, I, I think your your point is, is, is well taken. The, the, the generic model is not custom designed to fit any of the uh, islands. And uh, if the council and the TAP want us to uh, go that extra step, uh, we can do that. It will take a lot of time. Um, however, we think that uh, the, there are a lot of parallels between all of the models that have been used and they are custom fit the, uh, from the DAP's point of view. Uh, but uh, I think that they all fit in that kind of framework. Uh, but for the SSC to continue down this road, we would have to get, um, uh, if, if the council and the TAPS wanted an independent assessment, we would have to get expertise, uh, further expertise on those systems that would be independent of the DAPS. And I don't see that happening because the DAPs are in fact the, the leading expertise in these areas. So um, uh, one could then say, okay, we don't want something totally independent, but we would like a hybrid system that is custom made to that. And if the council would like us to do that, um, we're certainly open, but it's gonna take time and a lot of meetings to do that. Um, so your your comments are, are, are correct, um, but this is also, the realities of time and effort that we're talking about. Thank you, Richard. Any other question? I'd like to follow up. 
go ahead, Tony. I understand what you're saying, Rich. And I, I don't believe in cutting a corner. I understand how taking a shortcut because usually, I'm not saying all the time, when you take the shortcut or you don't go the route, you end up running into a problem where it takes you more time because you realize that this just ain't working and you should have just done it the right way first, in my opinion, and eliminated going over what should have been fixed. Thank you, Tony, for, for your follow-up. Any, any other council member wish to, to participate or have any question or comment? Hey, Marcos, this is Andy Strelchek. Um, I have a it. question. Yeah, I have a question about the generic model and then a couple of questions about spiny lobster. So first, Rich, thanks for the presentation and the work on the SSC. Um, I guess I'm interested in your perspective, the SSC's perspective with regard to the generic model and kind of one versus three models. You know, I'm getting up to speed on this, but it seems like the, the drivers and impacts as identified in the generic model likely are going to be similar drivers and impacts across all three platforms. And so I'm just curious kind of your reaction to that comment and, you know, kind of the, the need to go to three islands versus the ability to use this generic model kind of across the three platforms. Okay, uh, first of all, um, I, I think that uh, you're right, there is similarities. Um, where you see a lot of differences are, well, not differences so much, is that uh, things will collapse down perhaps um, when you start going into uh, each of the island platforms uh, because um, perhaps a lot of things are concentrated in, in say one agency. So where we have a lot of boxes, they all go down to like one agency is handling those kinds of things. The, some of the problems that we were dealing with are um, much more uh, prominent in Puerto Rico, which, for example, has permanent rivers. And so runoffs um, um, are, are much more of an issue there than in, in St. John and St. Croix or in St. Thomas. But um, I, I think those things would show up in uh, when when the TAP and the other group like Lenfest is also going to, I think, use these models and try to look at um, stacking these things. And I think that process will identify where we have those similarities and differences. And if it becomes a problem uh, in those stages, they can certainly come back to us and say, you know, hey, wait a minute, we need some guidance on how you would handle this in this specific situation. But I, I think at this point, the situation, the, the model is so complex that that someone really needs to take a look at it and use it and find out if it's uh, suitable for the purposes for which we were asked to produce it for. And um, we do have a couple of TAP members on the SSC and they were sort of comfortable at this point with, let's see how this works before we go and spend a lot of time um, doing something that maybe we already have sufficient information for. So that's kind of where we left it. We're not averse to going forward, but it was kind of like, we've done a lot of work and we would like to have someone who's gonna use this say, this is good enough or it's not good enough. All right, Th thanks Rich, that's helpful context. And then I guess the, the two questions which aren't necessarily directed at Rich, um, there was two recommendations that the SSC was offering to the council. One was to ensure we don't lose sight of scheduling an operational assessment for spiny lobster. And the other um, pertained to the Science Center's review of the MER catch report. So I don't know, um, Miguel or others, if we need to make a recommendation regarding the operational assessment for spiny lobster given the coming steering committee meeting. And then I would certainly be interested in hearing from the center about the review process for the catch report and any thoughts on an independent peer review of that. Marcos? Yes, go ahead, Miguel. If I may, the Andes question is exactly what, what we need to do. And I'm 
We'd like to hear from the center the reaction to the question posed by Richard's report, because uh, uh, we want to pursue this in the best way possible. So I believe the next thing is to, to hear from the center the reaction to the questions and the request uh, by, by the SSC. Regarding the, the models, remember that this is not the last time you are going to be seeing this. The next step, and also I want to re remind the, the group that you can have a, the, big, the biggest model you can get, but under the Magnus and Stimulus Act, the only thing that council is supposed to be working in is anything related to the fishery. So I, I believe that the SSC have done the work that was trusted for them to do. Now we have to wait for the LENFES group and the Charita would trust a group working on the other components of the other models. And then we need to sit down with those three, the SSC and those other, two other groups and, and look at the similarities that we have and the, the difference that we have. So we can put together a list of next steps. And uh, certainly uh, Tony's uh, comment is, is not uh, in the air. We, we need to go back to each one of the islands when the island based FMPs are implemented. We need to see what parts of the model fit into each one of the areas, what parts do not fit, and then how, how can we come up with the best available approach uh, for this model. So that, that's where we are. I, I believe that uh, maybe somebody from the center can ask, can answer any of the questions, the, the question that Andy proposed and the center. I mean, and the SSC. So Marcos, I can jump in on that. Um, we haven't, right. yeah, we haven't had a, a chance to thoroughly review the mayor report, although we think it's a, a huge step forward. What we plan to do is get somebody with, with um, survey statistics expertise, just to give it uh, an extra sort of independent look, just like we do with any of our information. We want to make sure it's um, the best available science before we we push on push forward on it. And as for the uh, spiny lobster operational assessment, we do support that. It's getting kind of out of date now because it's taken a while to act on the information. So uh, ideally, we would get an operational scheduled here fairly soon shouldn't be a, a huge lift for us to pull that off thank you uh miguel do you do we need to to do any any step forward any 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 other uh, no, step from, on now from, from this meeting graciela and i will pull together a list of actions regarding this final lobster and we will report back to you at the august meeting Okay. Know, there's a lot of uh, conversations that we need to do with the center and the people involved. And of course, we are going to touch base with the SSC. But at this Thank time, uh, I believe, Mr. Chairman, that the SSC uh, report, uh, number one, uh, finish the task that was assigned to them at this time for the model and also uh, incorporates their uh, recommendations regarding the spiny lobster. Uh, certainly there are many of the, of the acronyms and things that we use here that will be explained a little bit better at the August meeting so everybody will understand where we are. So I believe that that, okay. that closes. And I, and Mr. Chairman, I uh, would like to suggest for you to ask those people who came later, I just admitted uh, Nicole Angeli, so identify themselves for the record. Yeah, let's, I would like to recognize the new people. Uh, please identify yourself on record. Todd Gnamke has arrived. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Hi, this is Shailene Nalba. Thank you. Jack, you're here. Uh, I, 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 I heard Chuck, there was somebody else. Yeah, hi Marcus, Lauren Remsberg from NOAA Office of General Counsel. Thank you very much. Anybody else? 
Yes, Tana Rankins here. Michelle Sarah. Okay. Thank you, Tana. Uh, Chelsea, are you there? No, this is Michelle Scherer, SSC. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Do we have anybody else? Adian uh, Rios, Southeast Issue Science Center. Thank you, Adian. Anybody else? I have Virginia Sherbet, just join in. Thank you. Welcome, Virginia. Hi, sorry I'm late. <laughs> don't worry. Uh, I don't think we have anybody else. Otherwise, please uh, post on the chat that you, and we, we recognize you later on. Let's keep moving with, with the agenda. Uh, we have the next presentation with uh, Ecosystem-Based Fisher Management Technical Advisory. Yes, good morning and thank you for the recognition, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Cristina, if you can put up the uh, presentation. Dr. Haptes, could you identify yes, yourself for the record, please? Yes, my apologies. Thank you, uh, Miguel. Um, Sanai Haptis, Chair of the Ecosystems Based Fisheries Management Technical Advisory Panel. Thank you. Okay, if you could put it to full screen. All right, thank you. And good morning again, everyone. Um, I know we have a busy schedule, so I won't take up too much of your time, but I wanted to update you on some of the things that are ongoing with the EBFM TAP or the Ecosystems Based Fisheries Management Technical Advisory Panel. Next slide. Uh, we held our most recent meeting in February 4th through 5th of 2021. I, my apologies for the typo, not 2011. Um, and what we went through there was a review of the current updates from our partners, meaning what's going on with the LEMFEST project, as well as the ongoing process for collecting and analyzing existing data sets that can be used to understand overall ecosystem trends within the US Caribbean, um, and also a better understanding of the process for which we're going to collect information on conceptual models through the stakeholder meetings that LENFEST um, and uh, other partners are conducting. We also identified it a need for creating a subgroup on data validation and hosting. And I will bring that up in a recommendation to the council a little later. Um, but essentially, as we are working with all of our regional partners to collect and analyze these existing data sets, we've realized that there is a need for us to get clarification from the council on how we can create a centralized repository for the hosting QAQC um, and sharing of this data. And even if that's necessary for what we're trying to do. In addition, we've identified the need for some of the council's help inviting some regional agencies and partners to submit data um, that we can use for identifying these overall ecosystems trends. Um, and finally, um, we approved the latest draft or finalized the draft of the FEP goals and objectives, um, which I'll present to you. Uh, and we would like for the council um, to either provide any necessary feedback that they feel fit, or we would suggest that you guys make a motion to approve that. Um, so the main thing that we came up with was a timeline of activity that the TAP is going to follow to conduct the necessary requirements in order to draft, end up with the final process for drafting an FEP. Um, as you guys know, that is going to incorporate two larger subsets of work. First, it's looking at the overall indicators and trends in ecosystem services, as well as data across the US Caribbean. The other is to look at the management objectives and conceptual models derived from stakeholders and the SSC and do the stacking technique that uh, Rich had described to understand where these overlap, where they can be used and how they best fit um, for being used to identify threats and factors that influence change 
in overall ecosystem services in the US Caribbean. So next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, hold on. I guess I, I should finish going through our activity plan. So the, what this looks like is we have finished revising and drafting the EBFM TAP goals and have that to present to the council. Um, and we will continue working on the existing data sets through the end of 2021. We hope to have by that time, uh, either December or January, December 2021 or January of 22, a finalized repository that contains all the information and data sets that we'll be using for analyzing ecosystem trends. Um, hopefully within August 2021, we'll have um, completed all of the stakeholder meetings and designs of the conceptual models that we will be analyzing in the TAP. And hopefully by April of 2022, we'll have completed the process of uh, looking at the different conceptual models that have been created by our partners in LenFest, as well as the one that was associated with the SSC and the ones that will be devised through the stakeholder meetings with Melvore Consulting to identify um, best uses for the overall FEP that we're trying to draft. Um, by December 22, we hope to have the strategic objectives prioritized and a completed outline as well as the beginning of some of the writing for the FF, FEP um, and continue that work towards developing operational objectives with concrete action items for writing assignments associated with the FEPs. And then finally, in 2023, the plan will be to develop performance measures for the last section of the FEP and a draft management strategy that can be submitted to the council for approval, as well as a feedback mechanism for using the information from the FEP um, to, that can also be approved by the council towards creating operational decision making using um, ecosystems based fisheries modeling. And then finally, complete the FEP document and submit it to the council for approval between August and December of 2023. Next slide. So having said all that, what's ongoing currently is our partners at LEMFIS. And I wanna make clear, this is an additional project that is outside of the TAP, but many of its members are people that work within the TFP, TAP. And so they are doing this work as part of a separate proposal that's funded by the LENFEST program. And we will evaluate their efforts as part of the TEP. So they are continually holding stakeholder meetings um, with Melivore Consulting and LENFEST. They had the first with St. Croix Environmental NGOs on April 22nd. Um, and that will continue throughout the summer. And then the LENFEST project team um, will work to create and develop stakeholder meetings to identify the basis for conceptual models with regional scientific agencies and, and fishermen um, over the rest of the summer. So that's what's ongoing in terms of all that, as well as the continued um, reaching out to agencies to try and collect all of the necessary information for understanding the overall ecosystem trends that we're trying to put into these conceptual models. Next slide. So having gone over all of that, some of the things that we've identified as needs, which we would like to suggest that the council approves. Um, and if the council is so moved, they are welcome to use the um, wording that I have provided on the slides. But the first thing is that we are really in need of creating a subgroup within the TAP um, to create some sort of data repository, as well as the procedures and methods by which we evaluate how we within the TAP can host and share that information with partners. Um, you know, a lot of the information that comes in has privacy concerns. And so we wanna make sure that we have clear protocols for using that data appropriately. And so what we would like to do is create a subgroup that contains members of the TAP, as well as, um, oh, excuse me, I'm speaking about the, the next slide. Um, well, I mean, I'll come back to that one. What we're currently requesting is that the council 
allows the TAP to work with council staff to draft letters um, and email requests to other agencies and institutions within both the USVI and Puerto Rico, as well as nearby jurisdictions that will allow us to have them share data may be useful in understanding overall trends in the ecosystem, and then to share with their data with the EBFM tap. Um, so this is a recommend, and we are asking the council to consider it, and if necessary, vote on it and send a motion. Um, and if the council is open, so they welcome to you the wording that I have proposed on the slide. Um, next slide. So the next uh, motion that we are recommending that the council takes a look at, uh, I just noticed that Michelle put in the chat that the uh, dates for Puerto Rico are incorrect. I apologize for that, Michelle. I will try and get the correct dates from you for that and update this presentation and send it back to the council. Um, the next thing that we would like to recommend to the council or suggest that you take a look at is the FEP goals and sub goals that the TAP has drafted. Um, we have sent this to the council previously. We have not heard back if there were any comments, edits, or revisions that you would like to make. Um, and if there are none, what we would like to, to suggest is that the council moves to approve and accept these goals for the ecosystems-based fishery management TAPS um, fishery ecosystem plan. Um, and I will just quickly re allow you guys to look at those while, I, while we discuss. If the council so moves to, to bring this to a vote or to a motion, they're welcome to use the information on this slide again to do so. And I would be happy um, after the presentation to discuss any questions, revisions, or edits to these goals prior to the council um, taking a look at this. All right, next slide. And last but not least, as we are trying to get a lot of this data um, that can be used to understand the overall ecosystem trends um, we will need to create some sort of subgroup that can work on both uh, the logistics of creating a data repository, but also methods and procedures by which we maintain confidentiality, protect privacy, and understand how to use this data effectively in the repository without breaking any of the needs of our um, partners that are sharing the data with us. As such, we would like for the council, or we suggest for the council, um, to direct the EBFM TAP to create a subgroup of the TAP to provide guidance on data management policies and data repository options for the purpose of archiving the data used for the development of the FEP. Uh, we already have four EBFM TAP members who have indicated that they would be willing to sit on the subcommittee and a list of potential um, outside members that we would like to bring in as invited experts to help us um, develop the both procedures and logistics of the repository. And so if there's time, we would love for the council to um, think about this motion and bring it to a vote. Okay, next slide. All right, so that is it. That's what we've been working on in the TAP. And uh, at this point, I will be happy to take any questions, concerns, or put any of the suggested motions that we would like for the council to consider um, back up for review. Thank you. Uh, anybody can help me uh, with the chat, uh, Marcos, with the list of participants? Marcos, you have a question by Tony Blanchard. Tony, go ahead. Yes, good morning, uh, Mr. Hapis. I have a question as to the which government agencies would be contacted for information? Which local government agencies would that include? Sure. Uh, at present, we've reached out to DEP in Puerto Rico, DPNR, um, Fish and Wildlife, uh, and CZM. 
as well as all of the universities and institutions and agencies. We're also working with some uh, people within NOAA Southeast Fisheries Science Center. Um, and we would be happy to, if you can think of any other agencies, I'm sure I'm missing a few, but if there are ones that you know of that has information on long-term data collection, meaning things like abundance and distribution of organisms, um, one of the areas we're looking to try and bring in is the National Park Service. And that's one of the ones we'd like the council's support with perhaps drafting a letter and, and seeing if we can create more collaboration with getting some of their data. Any, Any Anybody else? Marco? Yes, uh, I have something to say before. Go ahead, Miguel. No, I was going to say there's nobody else in the chat line. Okay. Uh, uh, Sinai, you, you request. Oh, hold, hold a second, hold a second, Mark. Clay, I, go, I go ahead. I want from Clay. Clay, go ahead. Still muted, Clay. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Thought I muted myself. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'm looking at you know the spaghetti diagram that Dr. Appledorm showed us, just getting at the complexity and also at your presentation, which seems really ambitious, um, but the resources aren't equal to the task in the US Caribbean. So I, I wonder if you've given any thought to maybe carving and thinking about the fishery ecosystem plan, carving this up into some bite-sized chunks where we identify some of the things that we think are the most important drivers and then focus our resources on that. I mean, we're, we're taking that approach uh, largely in the, in the Gulf of Mexico just because the system's too complex and we don't even have the resources there. So we're focusing on things like red tide or in that case, one of the most abundant fish, forage fish is menhaden. So we have projects working on that. But the idea is to pick those things that are everybody agrees are likely the important channel our resources there and hopefully come up with um, useful for results because we put enough resources to actually get a, a result there. And I wonder if there's been much thought about doing something like that in the Caribbean, because it's so complex, so many things you could look at that I could see us kind of treading water for a long time before we really make any progress. Sure, um, I would say I think that part of the purpose of doing the um, conceptual models with stakeholders is to identify exactly those important um, areas that we can focus. Uh, we're, we're still in the planning stages, so it's hard to really think that we can accomplish everything that's you know, listed as ecosystem drivers, primarily because there are data limitations to what's available that we can understand. And I think those two factors are gonna be driving the direction that we use to develop the FEP. And that I believe is exactly the purpose of the TAP is to take all of that information into account from the conceptual models and the stakeholder driven process, as well as looking at the overall trends that are identifiable in the data that we're able to collect um, through our partners with the LENFEST program uh, and use that to identify the areas that need to be the drivers for the FEP. Of course, all of that is at the discretion of the council. And so if they have sections that they direct us um, to be focused on or more important, we can obviously add those in. And it's in, we hope that this becomes an iterative process, meaning a management tool that can be used repeatedly to identify directions for more research or for more management needs based on an ecosystems-based approach. Marco, Thank you. Yeah, we have uh, Jocelyn de Ambrosio and Michelle Duvar waiting for the turn to speak. Yes, I recognize uh, Jocelyn de Ambrosio and I, after Michelle Duval, but I need to make a comment before we end. Go ahead. Hey, thank you. This is uh, Jocelyn. Um, one um, point that I wanted to make was about the um, 
potential for the subcommittee of the TAP um, and the potential recommendation for persons outside the TAP to be on that subcommittee. Um, I would recommend against having persons outside the TAP on the subcommittee because that could um, sort of bring us back into needing to make sure we're complying with the Federal Advisory Committee Act. Um, under the Magnuson-Stevens Act, the, these committees of the council are exempt from that act, but if we have people that are sort of outside the, the TAP, that might sort of run back into Federal Advisory Committee um, uh, Act issues. So you could have speakers come and, and offer input. They're, uh, you know, not necessarily input, but rather just to have a presentation rather at a public meeting, but um, having them actually on the committee on a subcommittee might be a little bit confusing. So if you if we wanted to add them to the TAP and then have them as part of the subcommittee, that would be a potential process, but just wanna be careful about um, Federal um, Advisory Committee Act um, issues. My apologies on that. Michael, in, in hot pursuit to that, that's my com that was the comment I was going to make. The TAP was created as a unit. Eight members, that's it, you work on it. So anything outside of that, we have to go come back to the council and we are not going to add anybody to any subcommittee because of FACA. And, and that's why we need to find, I, I can talk later with Dr. and I about other possibilities to incorporate people or what they need to apport to the discussion of the TAP. But what, what uh, Jocelyn uh, just said, uh, the Ambrosi just said is, is really what we need to be guided for. No, got the by at this time. Thank you, Miguel. Very good. Cool. Uh, Michel Duval. Michel Duval. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and just a, a quick comment. So apologies to Sanai for not having um, for, for you not having the correct dates for the the Puerto Rico outreach outreach meetings that we're doing, but those are um, May 25th for businesses and uh, May 27th for NGOs. And also just to quickly address um, a comment from Raimundo in the chat. So those invitations go out one month in advance. So today is the day that those invitations will go out and um, be checking your email this afternoon after I finish my presentation to the council. Thank you. Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, thank you, Marcos. Uh, so just just uh, circling back to, to the TAP and the subcommittee, um, I, so long as the, the committee can seek outside expertise uh, to for some guidance. Um, I, I think we're fine. Um, I, I'm thinking particularly uh, when we're talking about databases and database construction and development. That's that's some uh, that, that's a, a very um, complicated business that that requires a lot of expertise um, and. Uh, Having having done some of that um, myself, uh, I haven't done the development. I've I've consulted with experts. I know that it's very complicated. So so long as there are is there's a mechanism that we can receive guidance from 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 experts. Um, I think that's really important for the work of the committee. So they don't need to be on the com uh, on a new subcommittee as as we're clearly not going to do. But some mechanism to to get some outside guidance, I think, would be uh, extremely helpful. And I think I heard from from Jocelyn that there's a mechanism to do that. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, Miguel, do we have anybody else on the chart? Or I can make my question. No, after you talk, I have a comment. Okay, uh, Sinai, can you please put the back of the presentation with the blue? with the blue table that you have that start activity, uh, revise sure. the draft. I'll have, Chris, Christina has it, so I think she can put it up for us. Which one is your slide? Second slide, Christina. Okay. Oh. One more. Is 
Is that the okay. one, Marcos? Yes, thank you very much. So now I, uh, I'm gonna make a series of questions that please write them down about the blue table that you have there. And my opinion is that we are not ready. I am not ready for, for approval, the goals and objectives that you got, the way you guys presented. And the reasons are, uh, once you stated there on the number, um, use the conceptual models of additional products to create island specific risk, risk assessment. Once you establish those risk, you, you identify those risk assessments which margin management implication that will have. That's number uh, one. Okay, Go Marcos, Marcos uh -huh. I'm gonna say concern. And number one, I don't think that you have time. You're already over time for this topic. And it's such an important topic that I believe that we should have uh, time between here and the next meeting of the council on July the 21st. And we can have, let's say in the morning, we will have two hours dedicated to the five year strategic plan. In the afternoon, we can have two hours to address all this. And Graciela and I can meet with Dr. Senai Hattis and then go over each one of them because you cannot assess any of this without looking at the fishery management plan that you're working together, the draft that you have. So we need to work this a little bit more, but I believe that we, we would like to thank the TAP because this is exactly what we need to do. We need to revisit those goals and objectives and make sure that we don't confuse goals, objectives with other things. And we can come back with a clearer uh, picture of what is needed from the council. Uh, regarding the, the, the data collection, we need also to ask a question today or maybe on the 21st. Do we need to be the depository of that data? And what for, do we need that data? And remember, you have to keep an eye on your goals and objectives under the Marshall Stevens Act that are really, really fishery related stuff. Because in the models, you have data, if, if you accept what the, 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 the wording that you have here, you will need to ask the NASA and all these people to tell us about the hurricanes and everything. Those are components that we have in the, in the model. And of course, nobody's thinking about that. So I believe that what the TAP is suggesting is to looking for data that is germane to what we need to do, that have relation directly to what we need to do. So my suggestion is that allow the staff to work with the TAP and come back at the July meeting with, with these this specific questions. However, one that we, that we can address now is to see if you agree uh, with one motion about allowing the staff to send letters to the institution to uh, see if we can have con uh, contact that can allow us to get the information that we need. And that doesn't mean that we are going to duplicate all that information. So she said like, if you pull up the skin. Uh, will you meet yourself? Somebody is talking there. Um, and then we, we can, if we do that, we can start sending those letters. Um, Christina, can you put the, the wording or the motion that Dr. Sanai presented regarding the letters? Miguel? Yes. Uh, hello? Slide four, Christina. Okay. Miguel? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Yeah, Somebody uh, else uh, is talking and, and that's what we're trying to. Yes, uh, it's a little uh, confusing. This is Marcos as as a chairman, my, my intention was just to highlight a few things for the council members to, to think about it and to consider, uh, because on the end of the day, you know, it's important for the council members to participate and, uh, and to have an opinion about it. And uh, I want to just to highlight the, the things that I think they should think about it, which is the risk assessment element on their indicators. Uh, the implication uh, and what we're going to use the indicators for uh, the use of the on the, the CFNC process wording in there, development operation objective will concrete action the action items how that will interfere with the way the council uh, interact with that and uh, also the manage uh, the management strategy that is used for situation during the CFMC decision-making. All those implications are in there 
And I think we need the council members to have opportunity to really analyze this. And that's why I'm not ready personally to, to approve the way it's written because we need to better understand it. That's all I want to say. Thank you. No, but that's, that's perfectly all right. And that's why I'm suggesting to do it at the July meeting and then do today what we can do today. Uh, and also we will need a, a memo from you to all council members, everything that you just said. Mm -hmm. and, and the council member to think about this uh, presentation, it will be, of course, in our web page. Uh, yes. So at this time, Mr. Chairman, our suggestion is, this is an easy one, if, if, if it's allowed legally to do, which is to um, allow the staff in coordination with the TAP to send letters to other agencies and institutions within the US Caribbean that uh, can give us some information as to data that they collect, what are the, which are the contact person that they have uh, and see how, how they are, uh, these agencies respond to us. Of course, uh, Dr. Haptes also indicated in his answer that they have an idea of, of, of these uh, uh, agencies. In addition, the, the other two projects Landfest and the Charito Trust, they're doing the same thing. And Dr. Michel Duvalis had been working with them on that matter. So uh, at this time, the question is, if the council members agree uh, with this language, with this motion, and if you think it's, it's agreeable, then let us know what the next step should be for the TAP and the staff. Any council member would like to participate? Yeah, I like I like to uh, to make a motion to to support this motion that is on the screen here. But I have a question as to well, I shouldn't say a question. I I would like to make a, a comment as to how I think it should be done. I think the the local and agencies that should be contacted is the same local and agencies that the DAP had requested to have made contact with. And that's the statement I like to make, but I will support this request for the approval of the council to send letters to the other agencies and institutions. Uh, Tony, you're, you're exactly right. The list that we have on record that Graciela and I uh, put together based on the request made by the DAP St. Thomas Alon in 2020 and 19 will be used by Dr. Haptes and, 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 uh, and the staff and Graciela to work this on. So if you agree with that, I, I can read for the record the motion as written by Dr. Haptes and the group, and then we need a, a person to. Uh, move to approve the language and a second, and then you can vote. So for the record following uh, Mr. Blanchard's statement, the language of the proposed motion will be the EBFM TAP is requesting the approval of the council to send the letters to other agencies. So the motion will be, uh, the motion will be for the council to approve sending letters to other agencies and institutions within the USVR and Puerto Rico uh, that have collected data that may be useful in understanding overall trends in the ecosystem and inviting them to share the data with the EBF MT, AP. It's a long thing for the TAP. Uh, uh, so a proposed motion. So proposed motion by Tommy Blanchard. Any second? Call for Angeli. Second. second. Oh, sorry. Uh, 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 Carlos came first online. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, was second by Carlos Farchetti. A any opposition? Any comments? Uh, any, 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 any discussions or comments? Hearing none, any opposition? The motion carries. Okay, Dr. Haftes, anything else from your report that you would like the council to consider at this time or can you wait until the July 21st meeting? I think you can, the, the rest can wait until the July meeting, but I would 
really appreciate if council members can take a look at the FEP goals and sub goals and provide us with concrete feedback on things that they really feel are either work or do not work or within the permit of the TAP or not. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Haftas. I believe, Mr. Chairman, that Graciela and I would put together a communication to the council members and it will be posted in our webpage. Uh, for just to remind everybody, these are the goals and objectives that we have so far, and this is a goal and objective that we would like to propose for consideration at the Ju July 21st meeting. Then you can move to the next agenda. Yes, we're gonna go for the next agenda item. I really invite the council members to read about this and think and, and submit their comments. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the Puerto Rico port sampling and catch validation project. Can people hear me? Yes, we do. Very good. Well, thank you, Marcos. Um, there is uh, a number of faces here that I haven't seen in a while. So please, hello to those that I know. And there are also some others here that I that I do not know. Um, but we don't know you. Can you identify yourself and your affiliation? I, 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 I am working on it. Um, so my name is Todd Gadamke. Uh, I am presenting on behalf of Mayor Consultants and for a project that... Uh, We've been working on for the last uh, about five, six years. Um, and uh, for those uh, that, that uh, do know me, uh, I have been given 15 minutes to uh, give a summary of this three-year report and touch on details of quinter triggerfish, details of lobster, recommendations on species of interest and plan next steps. So for those that know me, uh, they know that I can't get a bad joke or tell one of my stories in 15 minutes. So I'm going to go really fast uh, during this presentation. I have maintained figure numbers and table numbers that refer to the much more in-depth report uh, on this whole thing. So para Boringens, lo siento para mi uh, arriba y mi inglés. Um, and I also wanted to just make two quick points out right at the beginning. Trap fishers, uh, I heard a bunch of the, the VI guys at the end of this. I would love your input uh, on a couple things. Uh, and we are also going to be looking for people to be working with us in Puerto Rico. So first of all, this has been a long group effort. It started in 2010 with data improvement meetings. Uh, and uh, it really wouldn't have been possible without the, the team of people that you see uh, on the screen right here. It wouldn't have been possible without hundreds of people. Uh, but Steve Turno, Daniel Matos, Peter Freeman, Michelle Share. Hello, Michelle. I heard you're on. Uh, look forward to catching up with you. Marcos, Alahad. Anyway, there, I am going to miss a lot of people on this. Uh, my role was just to guide everyone on the ground to accomplish this work. Uh, in Puerto Rico, we dubbed this uh, project Senso de Pesca, uh, and we began working in 2014 to try to figure out how to come up with a design for the U.S. Caribbean. Uh, me and John Honig in the, in the bottom left of the screen there wandered all hey, around. John. John, sorry to interrupt. This is Kevin. If you think you're presenting slides, we don't see them. Well, that would have been good. <laughs> Well, I'm glad I, I'm glad we caught it early. Yeah. We got a screen there now? Yes, uh, but it, it, yes, it's not in presidential mode. There we go. Yes? Perfect. Yes. Okay, so really the only thing that's important, I'll just show you a couple of the pictures. Uh, from the beginning, just just out of uh, out of interest, um, and this is just a list. There is so many people to thank for this uh, that uh, I really I I, I want to make sure that that we get uh, we get everyone on board. But uh, anyway, we started working on this in 2014 uh, at in basically just trying to get a handle on how to design an efficient port sampling program. We worked all over the VI and Puerto Rico. 
We developed training programs. We started working in partnership with territorial agents uh, all over the Caribbean. We developed reference materials. We developed ID manuals. We also developed an electronic reporting platform to, uh, to work with this team. We had these people, I'm gonna go back, these people here trained for three days and threw them into the field. We needed a way of making sure that we could validate their work entirely. And this re reporting platform served very, very well. We had the ability to evaluate data the evening it was collected. Uh, it was stored locally, up to, uploaded and went online. We had fish identification ability uh, on there. We had the ability to track individuals to make sure that they were on site. Uh, this is one location um, in one day where you could see the sampler was there and you've got the times they were there. Uh, in a previous presentation, I showed someone in Puerto Rico leave his location in Humacao and go visit his girlfriend in Caguas. So we were very easily uh, able to keep track of people uh, as we went. And most important, we also were able to keep track of the, the fish IDs. We ran a pilot study in uh, April and May of 2016 in Puerto Rico with 57 sites to get an idea of the variant structure. And what I mean by variant structure is the relative use of sites. Can everyone see my mouse? Yes. Okay, good. So in St. Thomas and St. Croix, there's a limited number of sites. It was easy for us to basically look at those and say, yes, these are high. But if you look down in the north, our first guesses of to what high use at locations and low use locations was incorrect. That's what pilot studies do. They allow you to arrange these in a way you minimize the variability of your estimates. So the final product of that whole thing was to basically take a look at how much money is it gonna to cost to achieve the objectives. So if you wanted to put 200 people out sampling, you could get a standard error of 10. So in other words, plus or minus 20% on whatever estimate you come up with will result from this. So given all this information, we basically were tasked with saying, okay, you now have it, let's go into the field and study uh, give a full year of data uh, for P Puerto Rico. We started with some training programs again. We got good at this. We started investing a, a, a little more time uh, and we, we started coming up with, 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 uh, with uh, fishers contributing fish. This is an obvious need doing fish ID. We also did things like how and why to subsample. Yes, those are pool noodles and balls and we played games like seven years old. But the idea was to teach people, if you got a cooler of mixed species fish, how do you go in there and get random and representative samples? Uh, and then I think one of the most challenging things to do is to figure out how to catch, approach the captains in the vessels or how to get yelled at gracefully, how to thank uh, fishers and, and walk away. Um, so we've tried to keep all, all components of the, of the training. So we, we went through uh, the, the whole process we basically limited it down to 39 key sites in Puerto Rico. We started on August 7th of 2017, eight samplers a day from nine to five uh, at, at 40 sites initially. And then we added other samplers later on, but we started August 7th, 2017. So I'm gonna give you the results as we go along and feed them in, because for those that are real familiar with the dates, we started our sampling and then two events came in, which sort of changed everyone's life a whole lot. Um, for those that don't know, I sailed a boat down to do this project. And uh, once I was in that situation, I thought uh, uh, I, I was not sticking around for Irma. I've seen enough. We sailed south of Irma, got just south of it. And I do have a lesson for the fishermen in the crowd, not that anyone wants to do it, but the rack lines on the southern edge of a hurricane uh, you can fish the refrigerators and it was really, it was phenomenal down there. We got back, I went to uh, Florida for Irma too, got back for a refresher training course and then Maria kicked right in uh, after that. And I never left the dock, uh, but luckily for me, that's my poor little boat. I nicknamed, got the nickname Spidey Man after this and somehow uh, got through the hurricane and now I know less about the ocean than I did before. 
Um, and uh, I'm, I'm very glad that all my friends made it through. And it was a very, very trying time uh, for everyone. So we had to go take a new look at things. Uh, we were not able to sample during the time period right after Maria up until March 18th. Um, when you can see the levels of, of landing started to slowly recover. But luckily, we had a full team of people ready to go on the ground um, uh, during the recovery period. As soon as it was safe, we had people out spot checking, doing site evaluations, and doing damage assessments uh, for DRNA. Uh, this was pretty helpful. Uh, and getting a bead on people, but it was also um, it was also slightly overwhelming at times. Looking at uh, the communities that uh, are busting their butt, and and in a lot of cases, a lot of the infrastructure had disappeared. Uh, we we had a little bit of a camaraderie with the team. Had a strong camaraderie uh, with some of the communities, and all of our work in the reports that we have put out. We dedicate all of this work to the fishing and fishing communities of, of Puerto Rico. Uh, for those that haven't seen the video um, on, uh, on this, it, there's a link to it in the report and you'll have all these slides to take a look at later. So since August of 2018, we have uh, consistently been sampling these 41 uh, sites. And since once we get into sampling the sites, you don't need to have the details. And once again, I'm going to leave these, these slides will be up, but point you're looking at here is the black are sites that we determined were high use. The lighter color was lower use sites. In January and March, in the beginning of that year, we were finding some sites that we thought were low, maybe having less activity. But the key is, if you look at the South from the beginning, and to the end, we basically had them all stacked up. We had a good understanding of how the site and efforts had reallocated themselves following the hurricane. Uh, and this just, because we had the electronic reporting, we were able to look at this almost monthly. And we did full analyses every, every three months to make sure that our design was appropriate for what we were looking for. So in March of 18, we felt comfortable with what we were, we were looking uh, at in the sites had recovered, we in, in some sites had recovered. So we began our daytime sampling again. And this whole thing is going to fill out as I talk. The dark lines with the, the arrows, excuse me, the darker lines are the, the estimates that came out of this study. And the reported data is this gray line. So you can see in this time period when we first started sampling, our estimates are generally below the, the, the values that are being reported by the fishermen during this time period. And this was not, not unexpected because we were missing a lot of locations. And we started auxiliary sampling, uh, which means we went out 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. We went out at um, 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. We began to sample Vieques and Culebra and also Sundays. Um, Vieques and Culebra, we sampled two to four times a month. And then we also, for Sundays and nights and evenings, we used a bus route or roving sampling design. This allows a sampler, uh, say, in the southwest coast to visit uh, Puerto Real, uh, Faro, and um, uh, three locations. And basically, during the course of a sampling, they would drive to these three sites and look at activity. There are expansions that come out of this, which are, 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 can be uh, uh, challenging, but this allowed us to get a good evaluation of those non-target areas. So once we add this, uh, we, we, we add those in, we can just take a look at the sampling effort we did as a whole. And the sampling we did as a whole, what we accomplished almost 5,000 total when you add in the auxiliary uh, assignments completed during the whole year and a half period. Um, in, during those, that, that period, those 4,700 chips or 5,000 turned into us sampling close to 9,344 trips. And the sampling team actually had eyes watched 435,000 pounds uh, come in. And so we, we expanded from there. 
But I think it's important to note that the, the other thing that we learned throughout this whole thing is that on the ballpark, a sampler is going to see two trips on an assignment, and the average trip weight is about 40 pounds a day uh, uh, across the board. Now, this is a total summary of everything by region. Um, the total estimated pounds here, the observed pounds here, this is the number of sample trips. Um, so actually 8,758 commercial trips um, in here. And then this big one at the end, uh, which, is, which is number of unique species. First of all, I wanna point out over here on our total estimated pounds, the reported during this same time period was about 2.7 million pounds. So our estimates were surprisingly close to uh, the, the reported landings data. Trust me, you'll see that it doesn't mean that everything was a one-to-one -one match. We were really high on some and low on others. It just kind of happens that it was a one-to-one. -one. But most importantly and of most, most use immediately from this research is the number of species that we observed. We documented 267 species and the number of species reported during the same time period was 76 species. Yes, there's 50 or 60 aquarium banded arrow crabs and other things like that in here. But there's a larger number of species uh, that we documented, as we all know, but we now have the ability with some of this to at least at this point in time, break up some of those larger categories. This just shows you the contributions of the different types of sampling that were done during the project. So the weekly estimates from the daytime sampling are up in the 20,000 a week or 30,000 a week range. Everything else, morning bus routes, PM bus routes and Sundays came in with values that are in the thousands. This one blip right here, these four points for the AM is two uh, king mackerel trips that were observed on the same morning and expanded out. It's called rare event and it's easily filtered. But I just wanted to show that daytime is still driving the results that we uh, came up with in this study. So we now added the auxiliary sampling in to this. And we went in uh, uh, full-fledged starting in about September of 18. And you can see our estimates and the reported estimates more or less track themselves over the rest of the time period that we sampled. Now, I wanna make up a, a, a point here for the, the statisticians and the design people. I never, ever, ever in my life thought I would be presenting weekly estimates uh, of landings from this type of study because they normally would be all over the place. Really, really noisy. I would have separated this by month to smooth it out a little. But this pattern, once here we were lower, we added the AM PMs, we jumped right back up in line with exactly what's being reported. Now, like I said, I never would have thought weekly, but this I also found amazing. If you look at this pattern from reported and our estimates, and you start just looking at the peaks and the drops, there is a consistent drop in this location. This is where we did not have auxiliary sampling, but we started the auxiliary sampling here. You had a rise, both reported and our estimates. You got a drop uh, coming, both reported and our estimates. Another drop, another rise, another drop, another rise, another drop. These, base, these patterns are from two entirely different data sources. This is one is the fishermen reporting their data and the others are our, uh, our observations at the dock. Is this lunar cycles? I, I can't prove it right now because I just haven't had the time. It doesn't match up exactly on the full moon. And for those that have yelled at me that I have no idea what I'm talking about, about yellowtail snapper fishing and how important the currents are and the moon, hey, this is my objective is to show science can actually pick some of these things out. Um, and and I, I really look forward to exploring this a lot more as, an, as another way of, of identifying uh, covariance. I am now going to get in and present a couple things. And I heard the question asked of the center. 
uh, their next process. I just want to be absolutely clear um, that this work was commissioned by NOAA and the center. Uh, they are buried and they have not had the opportunity to send this out yet. So I am presenting on behalf of myself. This has not been determined to be the best available science. The other thing which I will repeat again in one second is that we did not use official DRNA 2019 expansion factors. We did not have them, but I used 2018 for illustrative purposes. So now this is the same exact image that we just looked at, but I have put the expanded data for total pounds in these soft dots over the top, okay? 2018, these from here over are official, the, you, the uh, expansion factors that were used in 2018. From 2018 forward, we just simply use the expansion factors from the previous year. So this data is not official in any way, shape or form, but it does illustrate what I hope everyone can obviously see that overall the expanded values in here um, are, are, are higher than what both we estimated and what is being reported by the fishery. Now, I'm not gonna let that statement sit and any fisherman in Puerto Rico or any other fisherman that is listening, I wanna make sure that you understand something in this case. Neither of these estimates are the truth. They are both estimates. The reported landings are taken by DRNA, they estimate what percentage are reporting and they multiply up to come up with expanded. If you look at conch here, the reported is at this level. They expand up into this level here. We are totally consistent with the reported conch landings given the currently used expansion factors. The dashes or the shaded area means standard errors. So in other words, those expansion factors over this time series worked perfectly. For Caribbean spiny lobster, we are a little lower until we started doing our auxiliary sampling. Our standard errors now starts overlapping lab lobster. So in other words, what we're saying here is that the expansion factors used by region are doing all right for queen uh, and spiny, but I really wanna stress, neither of these are truth. Both are estimates. No management should be done with one, one data stream. For the statisticians or the fisheries people in the crowd, you, you can take a look at the bottom two plots on your own. Okay, I am just gonna skip through some of these images uh, and, and, and give you an overview. If I spend a lot of time on here, I'm gonna go forever, but by region in the north, our estimates were below, picked up, but basically kind of tracked and showed similar noisy patterns to what we would expect. But the important thing in the north is look at this axis. This is 5,000 and 10,000. All the others are 20,000 and 10. So north has a much lower uh, overall landings. Um, you go to the east. We basically have the reported landings just below ours throughout, so slightly underestimated, uh, or, or ours are, are under uh, those, uh, excuse me, our estimates are slightly higher than those estimated by the expanded landings. In the South, pretty close when you look at reported versus expanded, except for this right here. This is a rare event species. This is two king mackerel trips. It is something that as the data goes on for a few species like tiger shark, like king mackerel, when you end up with a lot of pounds being landed in one trip, you can expand up um, for this. The report shows exactly how to deal with uh, this type of, of situation. Uh, in the West Coast, and uh, you can see that we estimate values that are a good bit less than what is being reported on the West Coast, which in any survey design, that is a red flag. You don't want to be under. Um, uh, the expectation is there will be under-reporting rather than people over-reporting, but this is due to queen snapper uh, and silk snapper, which I'll touch on in one second. 
Again, I'm not going to go through the whole table, but this is the species composition from 90% of the landings. The only thing that I really want you to notice, lobster, conch, makes up 53% of all of the landings that we observed. So this is a lobster conch driven fishery as we all knew. Um, if you take a look at this next uh, table, it adds a little more information. Once again, lobster and conch were the top 50%. You can see here that during our day, we estimated 671. We end up with 740 as our total combined estimate. The reported landings are 703,000. Conch, our total estimate is 575,000 pounds. The reported is 500,000 pounds. So these are very, very close. You look at King Mackerel, and I put this in to show you that the numbers tell us this, this might be questionable. During the daytime, we had 21,000 um, uh, pounds. Our auxiliary estimate, once again, this is two trips of about 800 pounds. There, it is much farther off than the reported landings, and it's shown in our proportional standard error right here. So for those with the knowledge, this is all here. You can look down to see how accurate our estimates are here. Uh, and I want to point out a couple other things. Octopus common, we got 54,000 uh, pounds estimated. There's no reported octopus common. It's all reported as octopus. Queen triggerfish is the one that, that Graciel and the council wanted me to look at. 50,000 pounds, there is 88,000 pounds reported uh, and we had 50,000 pounds. There's only one species of trigger. We found five species of trigger. And also just out of curiosity, this is a real data, 10,000 pounds or 11,000 pounds of Spanish slipper lobster uh, were landed during the course of the year. And Spanish slipper lobsters ranked 27th in landings in Puerto Rico. So just gonna flip through a couple of these, um, the, these images. So you get a feel for by species. We've looked at the lobster, looked a little bit at the conch, king mackerel. You can see here, once again, that's our spike. You can see this one alone, and this is also driving a little bit of an overestimate. Dolphin, on the other hand, you can see we're capturing dolphin, and this is a pattern that would show from a stratified random design. On some days, we end up higher estimates. Other days, we end up with lower estimates. Overall, over the year, our estimate is pretty close. Okay, octopus, I just showed you for common. We caught a lot, none reported. Um, I can't even see the species with that blocking me. Queen triggerfish. Um, our estimates, once again, are a little lower than reported, most likely due to species lumping. Mutton snapper, track it almost dead on. Yellowtail snapper, as expected, we didn't track it that well. Okay, can you guys still see my slides? There we go. Okay. Yes, yes, Todd, thank you. And uh, we are really tight on time. Can, can you please? I'm, I'm almost done. On. Okay, you thank you. It. So I'll show you the octopus. Silk snapper, we had some differences. If you look at hogfish, right on. Red hind, red right on. This I will skip over uh, for the statisticians. Please use this. But the bottom line with this plot is the more landings you have by the bubble size, um, you end up with more precision. We have less of a clue when you start looking up at tiger shark and striped mohara. So I touched on the speeding species recording questions, uh, the groupers, all of them tracked very, very well. Why? They're basically driven by red hind. Triggerfish, once again, tracks very, very well, all of them, but we got ocean triggerfish. We had gray triggerfish landed 100 to 200 pounds a week. Um, the queen is up in the thousands and durgeon. So we found multiple species and that's gonna have to be addressed. Same thing with parrotfish, tracked very, very well, multiple species tracked on there. So last thing, last two things here, uh, and I will be done in three minutes, recommendations on species of interest. This work really is not gonna give you 
a, a good clear, there's a lot of work that has to be done with the species before you're gonna get species of interest for this assessment. So I have one recommendation and that is use existing work. I saw Virginia is on this call. I think Virginia and Honig's work is, should be used as a point to make these decisions right now. Um, they went into the fisheries, looked at maturity and the bottom line for queen triggerfish, this had the lowest percentage of mature fish in the catch, 86.4 mat mature. But these other species, these six, had almost 95% of the population they sampled in the catch uh, at, at full maturity. And it, theoretically, it's impossible to crash these stocks given those results with the same selectivity. So next species of interest, focus on stuff that has auxiliary research like this. For our plan, next steps on this thing, we're following up currently on deepwater snapper, yellowtail, silk snapper, and viecas. Uh, we are following up on a rapid sampling project, which some have seen before. We have the ability to put fish on a scale. It will weigh it, photograph it, automatically measure it, and we are working on species ID for this. Uh, why? I've measured tons of fish in the VI. You have to sort the fish. You then have to put it on a scale. You then have to measure it. You should not be handling or touching a fish more than one time. It leads to Chubb busting his butt, other people walking around writing note, notes down, and it happens everywhere in the world that I have done this. But I have also done enough port sampling. You need one person and the right equipment to get this thing done. This system was developed uh, in the UVI by me and Peter Freeman. He worked with uh, JP on marine spatial planning over there. We worked directly with the fishermen. We tested at Hull Bay. Uh, the program currently gets annotated for length. It uses spectral analysis. It suggests fish right here and will get automated length. We've even got the computer artificial intelligence working to give hotspots right here. So Cornell Ornithology Lab will be on board on this very, very soon. Write down Merlin app. Uh, they can ID pictures uh, of, of birds in trees and also birds uh, from their sound. We've got them running our analytics on this program. And lastly, we are repeating a select cooperative selectivity study as we go. Uh, Nikki helped, I saw Cindy sign on. Cindy, I hope you're well. Uh, she ran this project. We are doing the same thing because the last assessment of lobster raised question about the selectivity curve. Is it dome shaped, which means it looks like this, or is it flat topped? And the difference here will determine the amount of lobsters that are on the bottom or the health of the population. So trap fishermen, I'm gonna stick on. If there's a lunch break and they'll let me do it, I want your input uh, on this, but we are designing a trap to catch bigger lobsters, but less overall. We're designing catch of the typical size and we're designing one to catch more of the small ones. So COVID times has made it challenging, but we're currently in the process of building. We have a standard design with a 10 inch opening, six inch drop and a four inch uh, uh, drop down for the opening. Trap fishers, a quick discussion on three options for this and how you'd catch big fishers would be fantastic. Thank you very much for giving me the uh, little extra time. I tried my best, but you guys all know I'm very long winded. Uh, and for those also that, that are in PR or have friends maybe looking for work, we are going to be hiring team leaders, samplers, and analysts over the next uh, two months. So uh, please spread the word. And thank you very much for the opportunity. This is exciting, exciting, exciting to me. And we're making huge steps of progress. So thank you. Thank you, Todd. Let's let's. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have the opportunity for much more details, but for sure, it's a lot of very important and uh, data in this link. Uh, Nelson, very quick, one minute. Okay. Hi, everyone. So that's a very impressive information that, and that's convinced me that we have to put on the ground uh, the port samplers again. You know. To validate all that information, you know, we, we have to have them in, in, in the field, definitely. Thanks. 
Thank you, Nelson. Julian, the same. One minute, please. Thank you. Uh, Julian McGrath for the record. Um, and I still have the same issue like I had before. It clearly shows with the data that was presented, they're off by big numbers. When we say small numbers, a hundred thousand pounds difference with the actual hands-on from this way this project was done is a big difference. That can drive my fishery into accountability measures. And I will continue to repeat, the only way to get proper information which is needed for the seed up process is to measure each fish. Right now, our fish and wildlife have four people that are measuring the fish where it used to be done by one individual. Working alongside the fishermen. Okay, especially in St. Thomas, St. John, with Puerto Rico, you can get the job done and collect way more accurate information. I do not believe in taking pictures to come up with length and weight. I believe that you take each fish, you weigh them, you measure them, and you get the correct information that is needed. That's my comment. Okay, thank you for your comment. And uh, I, I, I cannot, Marco. I cannot keep uh, going on with Marco. the back and forth on, on the presentation. Miguel, Marco, go ahead. We don't need to do any of that, but yeah. the most important um, your five, five, six hours. To ask, he, uh, your mic, doctor, mic is on. Uh, they asked Dr. To ask Dr. Gedanke if the report will be available uh, sometime this year. This is yours, Andrea. Julian, you have your mic open. So uh, I, I'm not sure that's directed at me. The report, I can send a link, is available now with the same disclaimer that the Southeast Fishery Science Center has not had the opportunity to, to vet it. I don't think they have any major concerns, but legally, someone else independently has to review it. I want to make a very, it, it's critical, Marcos, give me 15 seconds. Uh, Julian said this could take us into accountability. I made the strict point that there neither are truth. And what we're doing is collecting a separate set of information. If our information shows there's an 11 inch ruler to measure a fish, that fish is 11 inches. The accountability measures and everything would all have to be adjusted given new ways of, of estimating landing. So Julian, no, I, I don't, there is no direct line from new research to accountability measures on this. The ACLs, the way of calculating sustainability would also, would also have to change. And the other thing I just want to say is that the, the, the idea of using pictures, uh, the, the length of each individual fish is captured. But I want everyone to be absolutely clear. There is no way that I say, yes, two more amount of fish, we estimate it. And someone says, well, that's true. You go into accountability measures. The center has a lot of work and the territorial to figure out exactly how to apply and use this stuff. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the clarification. We are, we are uh, very aware of all of that. Uh, let's keep moving for the next presentation. Thank you very much, Todd, for your excellent presentation. Uh, the next presentation, and before I move on, I will ask if there is anybody on the group that have problem to cut the lunch time to half an hour uh, because our loaded agenda, I was trying to speed up the most I can. Uh, any, any opposition to that? Hearing but none. You, what you're saying ahead, is to go to one o'clock and then have a half an hour lunch and come back at 1.30. Is that yes. what you're talking about? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, okay. Miguel. Uh, let's uh, keep moving next item on the agenda, please which is a uh, presentation of regional electronic technology plans. Great, this is Jessica. Can you hear me well? Yes. We yes. Can. Okay, and I think I'd sent the presentation if someone could bring it up. Yes, I will share it. I'm not sure if I see the presentation. Does anyone else see it yet? 
No, they're working on it. Oh, they're working on it. Okay, thank you. All right, great. Thank you. Today, I just wanted to bring to your attention that the Southeast is working on a regional electronic technologies implementation plan. I've worked together with folks from the Science Center to put this plan together. What we're going to show you now is just a brief presentation over the highlights of it. And then uh, shortly in, in a few weeks, I think you'll be getting the actual plan and ability to comment on it. Next slide. So I want to go over a little bit of the history of the electronic technology plans. We began our first uh, plan framework was in 2013, and then we actually began the first plans within 2015. And these were finalized within January of 15, and we used biannual updates throughout through 2017. In 2019, there were cons consultations were initiated that had looking at how the plans are being used and how to compare them across regions. And a new plan goal was set for 2020. This goes along with the electronic technologies, fishery dependent data collection policy that was put forward. And the main intention of the new plans was to make the plans comparable among the different regions and to have status reviews annually done by leadership. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, our intention of getting the plans done in 2020 got pushed back and the new plans were now due in 2021. Uh, our current status is that we have a draft document of that that's nearing finalization. Next slide. So the new electronic technologies plan was to establish kind of a regional vision for electronic reporting, which we refer to as ER, and then electronic monitoring, which is EM, and to forecast what the region intended to do for the next five years. So that's going through, it was originally through 2024. I need to make an update on the slide that um, with the pushback from the pandemic, we're not gonna make these plans viable through 2025. Inside of the plans was the vision for developing, integrating, and implementing various different types of ET plan programs across the different councils. So the plan does include regional priorities as designated by NOAA Fisheries. We're also going to be looking for um, past council actions and future council actions in the research and development. We will be coming back to the councils to get their input as well on what they feel the priorities, particularly if they differ from what the regional priorities are. The purpose of these plans was to help prioritize the internal and external funding for electronic technologies within NOAA. That's made a little bit easier by the comparison in the similar type of plan across regions. Highlight areas where integration efforts and coordination and standardization may increase the ability of ERM to function. And then identify what the challenges were in implementing electronic technologies um, and identify as well as the cost and any funding transition plans. And finally, kind of go over a status of the review. Next slide. So for the plan, and I want to mention now it's 2020 to 2025, our general vision for the Southeast region as a whole is to align our electronic technologies with the regional strategic priorities to identify and quantify the cost of electronic technologies. This can include such things as infrastructure, cloud servers, staffing, and software, and hopefully to continue to expand electronic reporting within the region. We're also looking to develop processes to review the electronic reporting programs we have in to date and their progress, looking at things such as the lessons learned and potential areas of cost savings. Another area we're working in is a concept of one-stop reporting with the, the greater Atlantic region and the states up along the Atlantic coastline. And that is that if someone has to report to multiple NOAA regions and or states, hopefully that they can report once instead of multiple times and that one report gets to all needed parties. And then the last concept was to look over our data governance plan and form a data governance committee. The data governance would look at how we manage our data, how the data workflows, who has access to it, and hopefully streamline the ability to share data with our partners moving forward. Next slide. 
Continuing on with where we are currently with electronic reporting, we are looking to continue the four higher reportings that both the Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico are working in. It's streamlined and improve this process and the data connectivity. We're hoping some of the information and lessons learned from this region would also apply to the other regions as we're moving forward. We're also looking at our commercial electronic reporting in the South Atlantic to move wreckfish logbooks over to our coastal logbooks and potentially move wreckfish into a catch air program electronic online system. And in the Gulf, we're looking at our commercial electronic logbook system that is currently out of date and we're looking to have a replacement system that's more modernized. Overall, as a whole, within the region, we are also looking at updating our permits and our catcher systems. Both are currently in the middle of modernization processes, and we're hoping to move them to cloud services. So when we're impacted by hurricanes, these systems can continue to run. Next slide. Along the lines of electronic monitoring, which again is the video aspect of electronic technologies, we're looking to coordinate with Moat Marine Lab for a lot of their electronic monitoring information. They are considered a center of expertise now, and we're working with them through various other grants, such as through the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation or the Bycatch Reduction Engineering Program. Another aspect that applies particularly to this council is we're looking at the rapid sampling in the Caribbean. I believe Des just had quite a bit of a presentation on that. So we're hoping to continue that as a high priority moving forward. Uh, in general, kind of the ideas here is again, is using the fish under the cameras and using artificial intelligence to help identify the species and the size. Next slide. So I think this is my final slide. I just want to give you an overall idea of what the current ongoing initiatives are. There again is the for hire reporting in both the Gulf of Mexico and South Atlantic. The catch air programs in both again, the South, Gulf of Mexico and South Atlantic, modernization of our permit system, moving our commercial logbooks electronic, moving the Gulf shrimp commercial logbooks electronic and modernizing them. And then the, to finalize the rapid sampling of the EM project here in the Caribbean. And here I'd be happy to take any questions that you have about this electronic technologies plan as a whole. And keep in mind that you will have an opportunity to comment on it and we will be doing annual updates to it. And on the annual updates, we'll be coordinating with you earlier in the process to get your information and thoughts put into that annual update that will be generally between February and March of each year. Hello, uh, Jessica, are, are you there? I, I stopped hearing. Hello? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. OK, uh, there seems to be a little delay. OK, thank you for your presentation, Jessica. Do you need anything from the council or uh, because we are very tight on time, if, if you don't mind, we can uh, ask them to put the questions over the chat and interact with you. Yep, that is fine. I don't need any feedback directly right now. Um, if you guys can get so many comments later to us, that would be helpful. Okay, thank you very much for a great right. presentation. Thank you. Next presenter. which is Evaluation of Marine Reserves, U.S. Caribbean, Diana Beltran. Yes. One second. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes? Yes. Yes, we can see it. Perfect. So, hello, everybody. I am Diana Beltran. So today we'll talk about the U.S. Caribbean Marine Managed Areas Literature Review that I made uh, for some of the air, some for seven focus area areas in Puerto Rico and U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, today I will present the summary of the literature review of the seven of the U.S. Marine Managed Areas some general, generalities, studies carry out gaps and recommendations of each of them. 
Then I will move to general view of the US Caribbean MPAs, including those in territorial waters and others in the EES. Uh, I will be, I will be doing, uh, oh no, I will, pre I will present in one of the analysis taking in consideration the new global initiative that pretends to uh, be in 2030 that we have 30% uh, of the ocean preserved. So under this uh, vision, I want to show you what is the current status of the US Caribbean marine protected areas under the UCN categories, how much of the US Caribbean waters is currently a, as an MPA or as an MA, and how we can improve that situation that we have. And after all this, I will give you a general recommendation that I, I suggest. So first of all here, uh, you can see the seven is, uh, focus areas uh, that are Bajo de Sico, Turmarine Bank, Abril La Sierra, that are located in the west part of Puerto Rico. The other ones are High Bank Marine Conservation District and Gramanic Bank that is south in the south of San, San Thomas. And then we can also have here in the in the right side the mutos, muton snapper snapper spawning aggregation and the red hind spawning. So here we have the same seven areas. Uh, so most of them are seasonal, seasonal closure, and you have here the the dates that the closure are in, in that area. And we have one of them that is one uh, year round closure. So we will start to doing some uh, explaining one by one. So uh, here we have Abril La Sierra in the, in the table and in the right side of the, of the, of my slide, you have a, ta a, a, a table that show how many studies uh, we found uh, remember that this is scientific studies that was made in the last 10 years in each of those areas. Uh, this is Abril La Sierra, it's a seasonal fishing closure area, was um, established in 1996. Uh, the principal objective of, the, of that area was protect the red high uh, spawning aggregation. So most of the work that uh, I that I recollect of that area came from one study uh, that was uh, made by Garcia in 2013, and seven more than are using uh, acoustic or telemetric uh, methodologies. So the gaps and recommendation that we have for that, uh, that for that area is that the last and the only benthic and reef fish service went down in 2013. So is, uh, we, need, we will need a new survey to know the current state or status. status and to know if the closure is helping to the, record, to the recovery of red hand populations. Also, uh, that other thing that I found, it was very difficult to get the information for fishery independent surveys because it's not, it, are not available for all the, for, for any person in Puerto Rico are very difficult to find out. So it probably is a good option to do a, one of those studies again, because, because it's important. And another thing that is very remarkable is that we can promote studies to quantify the density of the other commercial important red fish species that are using that area as an spawning aggregation sites. Uh, also, uh, we, we want to recommend to encourage and support more acoustic studies to understand fish home range and connectivity with the nearby marine managed areas. Uh, this will allow to us to know if the size of the area is adequate for managing that population. I know that most of the, the, the acoustic studies there uh, was working only with the red hind. So we can 
also uh, explore if there are another species that are using that area. Uh, the next one is Turmarine Bank. This is a seasonal fish enclosure area also, was established in 1993. Uh, the Turmarine Bank was, uh, the Turmarine Bank, as you see here in this map, uh, co partially co coincides with the Puerto Rico Marine Reserve of Turmarine. So that give little more information of the scientific information because this is a point that we can find information from the Puerto Rico Coral Reef Monitoring Program. So we have there some, uh, the, some data that came every two or three years from that program, and that helps to understand more that, that the status of that reserve. If you can see here, we can, we can see what are the areas that the monitoring program and another studies are being, uh, are being, oh, oh, was were taken there. So most of them, the, the areas that there are a sampling are in the end of the platform. Uh, <clears throat> uh, that area was also uh, established to protect the red hind, the Pinephelus butatus. Uh, it's important to know if are other commercial important reef species that are using a turmarine bank as an spawning aggregation site. Uh, I recommend also uh, know more information about the fishery independent surveys because uh, the, the, the information is not, it was not available. So it's important to know what happened there. And uh, I also recommend to carry out passive acoustic telemetric and acoustic receive, receiver array, array, array along uh, Turmarine to track the movement, movement of the snappers and groupers that may are using uh, that area. Garcia et al. in 2003, uh, they suggest that uh, probably some other species aside uh, red hind are using that area as a place for spawning aggregation. We continue with Bajo El Sico. So Bajo El Sico is a seasonal closure, was established in 1996. Uh, also was created to protect the red hind Epinephelus lucutatus. Here we have a lot of, uh, of um, yeah, more variety of the, the work uh, that was doing with acoustic studies with other species like the black grouper and not so grouper. Uh, the last and the only benthic and reef service were uh, in that area were done in 2007, 2007 for, by, by Garcia. So it's important to uh, improve and update that, that information to understand how, we, how are changing those habitats that are important for the spawning aggregation species. Uh, the same like before, we don't have a, oh, we didn't have, probably we have there, but we didn't have available the data from independent surveys. So maybe we have to, have th that data available for every, everyone that wants to, to, uh, to analyze and understand the, the, the status of the populations. And I think that the continued passive acoustic telemetric and acoustic receiver arrays to study, to track the movement of a a snapper and groupers uh, between this area is very important. And also, I think that, me that methodology helps to understand a lot, a lot, how is the behavior of the species, not only what is the uh, spatial use of the area, but also we can uh, understand what is the, perf the, the perfect timing when the, those aggregations start starting or happen. Then we move to Grammarie Bank. So Grammarie Bank is a seasonal closure, was established in 2005. 
Uh, I think this is the most uh, studied area in the Caribbean, in the US Caribbean. We have a lot of information here and we have a very, very detailed information. So here we can give more a specific recommendation for the for improving the area because of the quality of the data that we have available. So uh, in in this in this area, uh, uh, this, the 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 researchers are recording during the spawning aggregation uh, species like yellowfin grouper, naso grouper, dog and snapper, cubera snapper, and Bermuda chop. If you can see here, we have here the Grammarie Bank and we have in, in this small area, and we have here the Red Hind Marine, Conser Marine Conservation District. And in this area, we can see where is the points of the studies that we find, that we find there. Most of this area is the area where the spawning aggregation occurs. Uh, as I said before, we have a lot of information there and very, uh, very good information. So we can see, for example, in this graphic that the number of nasal groupers across uh, all through the time was increasing the, or is increasing. So that means that the protection of that area is working. So the species that are there are, in, in, are protected in the spawning aggregation area and give the opportunity to continue and increase and, and do the, the fertilization and increase the growth in the population. Also, another thing is important here is that, for example, in, the, in this area, we can see one study from Nemet 2007, he or, or there, a tagging a tag some fishes from the spawning aggregation, and then uh, those fishes were recaptured in those areas here. In when you see the square, the gray square, so that means that the, the animals that are there have the ability to move and move and share uh, with another marine, um, marine protected areas or marine managed areas. So one of the recommendations that several studies that um, uh, was made there is that it's important to increase the size of that reserve. And also, if we cannot increase the size of the reserve, we can create a corridor to give the opportunity to the animals to move and share between spaces and, and be a, between marine protected areas and be uh, less in danger for the fishers, fishing pressure. Another thing that uh, they found there is that the males arrive earlier than the timing of the spawning aggregation and the males stay longer. So probably we have also to uh, extend the closure. Of, the, of that area to give the opportunity to protect all these animals that came uh, to do the reproduction there. Uh, we are moving from the Red High Marine Conservation District. Uh, this is a year around a uh, no take zone, it was created in 1999. So it uh, was, was initially on was um, was a uh, sorry was established to protect a red hind and tiger and tiger grouper. Uh, this marine managed area is allowing to the red hind population to increase. So we have that area from the 1999. In the, in the first studies, when they evaluate the increasing or the improvement of the population of the red hind was more or less in 2004 and 2005. And in that moment, they already understand that the population was increasing. That means that the 
that area was uh, doing a very good job for that species that, they are, that we are protecting. After that, uh, we don't have any other study to uh, estimate the current population of the, of the red hind there. So it's important to do something new in that area. Here we have the points that most of the studies are uh, sampling. Okay. So we are moving to Land Bank. Uh, Land Bank is a session at closure, was established in 1993. Um, was a, the principal objective of that, of, of that area was protected the red hind also. In, in that area, we don't have too much, uh, oh, a, vari a variety of uh, studies. Most of the information that we have came from the territorial Territorial Coral Reef Monitoring Program from the U.S. Virgin Islands because they have one, one place or sampling point, sampling point there. Uh, another thing that is important there is that Tradition in 2017, they found that the species that oh, yes, they, they study, they, 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 they uh, found lower pred predatory fish densities in St. Croix than in the North Virgin Island. And we, we already have a lot of current on new fishery independent surveys. And this is important to, 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 to have this information to evaluate what is the status of what is the actual status of the population. Then we are moving from uh, to the Mutton Snapper spawning area. This is a session at closure, was established in 1993. Uh, was uh, the principal objective of that area was to protect the Mutton Snapper Lujanos Analis. Uh, here we have the, 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 the map of the area and the points that the, I think the only independent students that are taking place there. So Pogis and Queen in 2011, they went to the area, tried to find uh, the spawning aggregation by diving, but they never uh, find the, the oh, bigger, oh, that never find the, the spawning aggregation. Uh, so the thing that they, that they ended doing was a, uh, Fishery, uh, fisheries independent analysis to understand what was the situation with the motor sniper. The result of that study uh, show that the motor sniper is a snapper is important in that area because the capture of the area the, of the of that species was bigger, was uh, significant. So they consider that yes, this is an area where this where the species joined to do that um, the spawning aggregation, but unfortunately they don't find the special or, or the correct place where the spawning occurs. Uh, here we um, we can recommend that alternative methods are needed. To find the primary spawning site, we can conduct a cost, a, for example, acoustic telemetry uh, with acoustic receivers arrays along the mutton snapper spawning area. Uh, also, in another study, in the study, Cadison in 2017 uh, found lower pred predatory fish densities in St. Croix than in the northern, in the northern Virgin Islands. So they found that. Uh, they have in the Northern Virgin Islands, the, 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 the species are or have bigger size and are more abundant than compared with the St. Croix. Um, and also uh, we have here a lack of current or not fishing, fishery independent surveys or capture per unit effort studies. So this is another thing that we can do to improve the knowledge of that area. 
Uh, after that, here uh, I, I show you the like a summary of the scientific studies that we found in the last 10 years in those areas. Most of the marine managed areas that are located in, in US Virgin Island have a lot of information that came from the Territorial Coral Reef Monitoring Program. In Puerto Rico, we don't have the same case. We have only tourmaline as a point in the Puerto Rico Coral Reef Monitoring Program. And we have a, a few studies in the other ones. So it's necessary to improve and support more research in those areas to have a actual information and to compare this information with the last uh, studies. Aquí, here we have the summary of the species that are reporting, reported per marine management areas. So uh, the, the, as I said before, the Grammarie Bank ha, have a lot of information, have a lot of, of studies. So there are several researchers working there in different species, in different methodologies. So we have here, we see here the, the, the difference in the absence of, of when you compare grammarie or, or uh, uh, the other, the, the, the areas that are in the south of the San Thomas with the other ones. Okay. Here uh, we stop with the abstract about the, those areas and we are moving to well, the summary of those areas and we are moving to, uh, uh, to, to see one of the evaluation that I did uh, with the marine protected areas in the US Virgin Island and Puerto Rico compared with the, with the number of the areas. So in that case, in the, for, for doing this analysis, I, I take the information from the three different databases. So one is coming from the w, WDPA that is developed by the U, I, UCN. The other ones came from the Marine Invent, MPA Inventory that came from the NOAA. And another one is from the Puerto Rico, a comprehensive inventory for protected areas and other land conservation mechanisms in Puerto Rico that uh, was developed by the Department of Agriculture and Forest Service International Institute of Tropical Forestry. So the, the idea here is that most of the, most of the um, agencies are trying to update on the databases, updated of the databases. So I have to use three because most of them have different uh, marine protected areas in, the, in, in, her data, in her databases. So I want to complete and join all the information. So the first thing that they want to do is uh, all the thing that we, we have or the, 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 the global initiative want to do is the, the necessity to standardize our worldwide classification of the marine protected areas. So we are following the definition of the EUCN 2008 as a marine protected areas. It's a protected area that clearly have a defined geographical space and recognize, dedicate and management through the legal or other effective means to achieve the long-term conservation of the nature with associated ecosystem service and cultural values. Under the use the IUCN, for example, all the temporal or permanent fishing closure that are established primarily to help or build up and maintain the reserve stocks for the fishing in the future and don't have wider conservation aims or achievement are not considered to be marine protected areas. This is why when you can, in the following, uh, este, in the following slides, the marine management areas are not into 
any of the categorization of the use EUCN. So, as I said, as I said before, we need to standardize with worldwide classification. We have some areas that are very, very strict, no take areas. Uh, that areas are called LA, and another ones that have wider uh, regulations that uh, have less restrictions. So, in the in the in the conservation means the the healthiest ocean and benefits to the people needs to be in that direction to high protection of the areas. So here we have a different a table that shows us the different categorization for the UCN category. So we have here the LA that means that the most protective zone as a no take zone, and we are moving down to areas that are less uh, protected. Yeah, no, you have five more minutes. Okay, so we have here um, the the areas, the num the different marine protected areas in Puerto Rico, together yes, with yes. the in Puerto Rico and U.S. Caribbean, uh, together with the management areas. So in, in the color here, we have the representation of the level of the categorization of the UCN. So if you see most of the areas right now are in the category four. So that means that that category uh, have as a definition that the area probably needs to have a, um, active intervention to address the, require, the requirements of particular species to maintain habitats, or for example, needs to have more enforcement to, be, uh, to, to fulfill all the commitments. So how much of the US Caribbean economic exclusive zone is protected? So here we have in the map all the, 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 all the areas, representative and here we have the percentage of the protected areas that are uh, in the in the all US Caribbean so that means only 2.2 to only 2.02 percent we have in protection in all the EES how much of the those areas are not takes on so are in the extreme part of the full protection we have less than 1% in that area. If we are moving to the, how much of those we have in the US Virgin Islands, we have into the territorial waters and outside of the territorial waters, we have that the total, uh, the, the total percentage of the protected areas in the territorial waters are 27.68%. And if we want to know how many of those areas are not takes on into the territorial waters, that means into the three nautical miles are 11.20. And how much of those are not take outside of the three nautical miles, we have only 0.15. How much of the those areas are in Puerto Rico? We have a total, in the total area of Puerto Rico, we have 37 uh, areas. And that means that the 28.46% are protected uh, in, into the territorial waters. That means into the nine nautical miles, we have only 0.94%. And in the exclusive zone, we have 0.03%. So in the territorial waters, we are close to, uh, so uh, you know that we have right now a global initiative that wants to be, uh, to have 30% of the ocean protected by 2030. So we are, if we are looking only the territorial waters, we are close to the, to that goal. We are about 27%, but far in the, 
yes, yes. Consider uh, we have how 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 we can improve that. We we can consider the around closure of the section of the marine management area, so they can become uh, MPAs. We can consider increasing size in the areas that the studies suggest that they should should increase. For example, Grammarie Bank and Marine Conservation District. Also, we can consider increase the area of not take in existing MPAs or MAs. Some areas are too small for protect the fish home range. And also we can improve revising all the all management plan and developing ones in the areas that we, we don't have any plan, any plan management plan. So here I have uh, some of the recommendations, bigger recommendations. Most of them I already said, but something that I want to, to, to talk is that the acoustic, for example, we, 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 we can, or we, we need to, in, Oh, no, we, we can develop a monitoring program with the acoustic tagging and telemetry. That a methodology helps a lot to understand what is the home range, the, the situation of the spawning aggregation. Also, uh, in the areas that we don't have information, we need to implement monitoring of permanent transects that we allow to estimate change through the time and the current state of the vented communities. Another thing that we don't have uh, is an stock assessment for some of the species that uh, are already protected for the areas. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we, we can use also another type of, of new technology that right now are more uh, uh, easy to, to acquire and are cheaper. So, and helps a lot to doing a lot of the patrolling or doing a lot of surveys right now. Uh, another thing is, that is important also, and I find a lot of problem was getting the information. So, for example, I, I think the science can be, or needs to be open. So most of the information of the data that came from the studies, uh, Need to be available to the other people can uh, analyze and and use for the next uh, types of research. And another thing that I found that is that in in the in the start or in the initial phase to designate those areas, uh, they don't think too much about the connectivity. So this is very important in the marine realm. So we need to think of, of those marine protected areas, management areas as a connection, as a network. So we have to do and move with some research to help to understand how those spaces are connected in those areas. We can use, for example, a generics, we can use a physical models, you can, we can use acoustic tagging, we can use also microchemistry autolites, or we can dye the autolites also to understand what is the movement of the fishes and what are the areas that those fishes are using. And um, Diana, uh, Marcos, this is the chairman. We are really uh, short on time. Can, can you please start to, yeah. to wrap it up? Thank you. Yes. This is the, 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 the uh, another thing that I have uh, to say is maybe to, to understand that the, the connectivity is an, an important issue we can, we can form a committee or a task force to understand that situation and join with the territorial uh, begins the coordination of activities across the various protected areas and design strategies that incorporate the network nature of these management areas. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Too much time. Uh, Thank Marco. you, Diana. Go ahead. Uh, we, we, with the time that we have, we do not pretend to go over the, the whole thing, but I believe that 
uh, first, I like to thank Dr. Diana Beltran. This is excellent, excellent report. And I'm looking forward to her final report to us. We are going to distribute the report and load it up in our webpage for everybody to see. But now the next step will, will be for uh, the staff to sit down and look at all this information and, and prioritize the information. Then uh, I believe that we should go back once the island-based FMPs are implemented, we shall go back with each one of those uh, recommendations she has uh, and present uh, their recommendations to the DAPs of St. Thomas and John, St. Croix and Puerto Rico, because I, I need to also thank uh, the group of some from, from St. Thomas and John, because this is an initiative that they started. The Tony, uh, Julian, Ruth, they all were asking me, you know, what's going on inside those areas. So this is the, the first step. And I believe that Dr. Bertrand has indicated to us uh, the path to follow in, in many of these uh, areas that we have. Of course, there's a lot of work here. There are a lot of consideration, even legal, because we don't follow IUCN. We follow the M MSA, and, mm -hmm. right? But this information also is very helpful for section eight or 14 AA that we are going to discuss this afternoon at three o'clock. Of course, we are going to discuss uh, the executive order 14 AA, 008, uh, uh, section uh, C, 216C, which is the one that deal with fisheries. But also section A deal with the, the closed areas that she was mentioning, the 30 by 30 uh, nickname uh, at this time. Um, so, Probably by August, Mr. Chairman, we will be able to give you some ideas of what the staff is looking at with Dr. Bertrand's uh, report and wh where the next step will be. Uh, if the island bases are implemented this year, then we will start immediately to work on some of the issues, modification, et cetera, that we need to do to uh, make sure that we focus on each one of the areas, the St. Thomas and Jones and Croix, et cetera, uh, issues that we need to address to modify the island based FMP and to implement some of the recommendations that we have seen today. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, any comments, uh, any uh, question, please send via chat to, to Dr. Uh, Diana Beltran and you guys can interact through there. Uh, let's go for the next presentation, island-based fishery management. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. This is Maria Lopez. I just have a quick update. Um, so from the island-based FMPs, um, at this time, I really don't have any new information regarding the implementation of the plans as to when they are going to be um, effective, other than that, um, we're making really good progress with the review of the very extensive proposed rule that reorganizes the Caribbean regulations by FMP. And uh, we hope that we're, we were able to provide more information at the, at the August meeting. That, that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Maria, for very short participation and precise. <laughs> uh, modification of the buoy gear, please. Okay, so this is me as well. Um, Christina, I send the presentation if you can put it on, please. Thank you very much. Everybody can hear me well? Yes. Yes, okay. All right, so this is gonna be, I'm gonna be presenting on uh, an amendment, a draft amendment that uh, staff is working as requested by the council um, to um, modify the buoy gear definition for the harvest of managed reef fish in federal waters of Puerto Rico, St. Thomas and John and St. Croix. And what I'm going to be presenting in uh, today is going to be uh, basically a summary of the draft amendment one, the first version of the draft that it's included in your briefing book. Last time that uh, we hear about this topic was at the December meeting when we presented an options paper um, with, uh, with obviously the, the potential options and how to deal with this. So that transformed into, um, into a draft amendment that we're still, um, we're still working on, but I wanted to give you an overview. Next slide. Okay, so the issue that it's been dealt with in this amendment 
is that the type of buoy gear that has been used to, uh, that is used to fish commercially for deep water fish. And when I refer to deep water fish in this presentation, it's going to be snappers and, and certain groupers in Puerto Rico and in the US Virgin Island does not conform to federal regulations. And I added in there the name, uh, the local name in Puerto Rico, Scala Comboya, and in the USBI, uh, deep drop buoy gear. And although this um, locally used commercial uh, fishing gear type is very similar to the buoy gear that is defined in federal regulations applicable to Caribbean fisheries, it differs in the number of hooks that are allowed to be used with the gear, as we discussed in, the, in previous meetings. Buoy gears is defined in federal regulations at 50 CFR 620.2 as a gear that cannot, uh, one of the, I'm sorry, one of the, um, Parts of the definition of a buoy gear um, that is defined in the federal regulation is that it cannot contain more than 10 hooks connected between the buoy and the terminal end. And I'm just uh, pointing this out at, as this is the, because this is the uh, part of the um, of the definition that it uh, that the gear the gear configuration that it's used in um, the U.S. Caribbean does not conform conform to the definition of the buoy gear as it is in the regulations. Um, it's, it's included at the end of this presentation in, in case you want to um, revise it. So state regulations for Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Island with respect to the number of hooks that can be used uh, with this uh, gear, they do not specify the number of, the number of hooks. And there's also no definition uh, for this gear in, in, in Puerto Rico or USBI, USBI regulations. So although this gear configuration is used in both uh, federal and state waters of each one of the island management area, and it's mostly most used in Puerto Rico, um, less used in the US Virgin Islands, it is not clear how much harvest occurs using gear containing more than 10 hooks between the buoy and the terminal end in federal waters. So Caribbean fishers have indicated that they would like to increase the number of hooks that are allowed under the legal, legal definition of buoy gear for federal waters. Next slide. Okay, and then uh, this is also a refresher of what we have discussed before uh, with respect to this action. The use of any gear not listed as authorized for the fishery is prohibited. And this is the use of any gear not listed um, in, is prohibited for its use in federal waters. So authorized gear types for the commercial harvest of reef fish in the island base of MPs includes automatic reel, bandit gear, buoy gear, hand line, long line, rod and reel, trap, pot, and spear. A gear type configuration that has more than 10 hooks between the buoy and the terminal end does not meet the legal definition of buoy gear in federal regulation and is then not considered an authorized buoy gear. So this gear does not meet the definition of any other hook and line gear authorized. So that what this means is that the gear cannot be used by those fishing commercially for reef fish managed under the island based compete unless that gear type is added as an allowable gear type under the island based FMPs or the definition of buoy gear is amended to include this gear type. Also, as you have heard before, the federal regulations set for the process for a person seeking to use a gear not authorized for a particular fishery to notify the appropriate council of the intent to use that gear and to obtain permission to do so. Next, next slide, please. So in this amendment, with that said, the council will then um, proposes to modify the definition of buoy gear included in 50 CFR 622.2, which is the federal regulations, as it applies to those persons that are fishing commercially for managed reef fish to address the use of additional hooks preferred by some participants of each of the Puerto Rico and USBI commercial reef fish fisheries har harvesting deep water reef fish. Next slide. Okay, so I'm going to stop here a moment uh, before continuing with the discussion of what is included as an action in the amendment, because we need to address um, an area that's very important for uh, continuing the development of, of this amendment, and that is the description of the Puerto Rico and the USBI 
uh, fisheries and uh, in terms of the deep water reef fish component. So the information that I have listed in here is a summary of, the, of some of the information that we have included in the chapter three, which includes the description of the fishery. And that inform this information comes from interviews with deep water fishers uh, from the NER staff, from testimony at past council meetings, and also from some publications, for example, uh, Mato Santo Torres Rosado, um, 1989, Agar and Shivlani, uh, 2016, which is a socioeconomic study of the hook and line fishery in the common Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, among others. And while I am, I would like to ask um, any of the deep water fishers and other people that are um, knowledge knowledgeable about this fishery, if you see anything in here that is not um, that is not correct or needs uh, more context or more clarification, to please let me know because this is very important so we can capture a good description of the fisheries um, of the fisheries that are occurring in in, in our waters. So as I mentioned earlier, the local name in Puerto Rico is Cala Comboya, and the species targets targeted with this uh, local um, buoy gear type um, are um, silk, blackfin, black, vermilion, wenchman, and these are um, caught in shallower, shallower waters from 40 to 100 fathoms. And then also used and mostly used for deep, uh, for to harvest species in deeper waters from 170 to 230 fathoms such as the species that are included in the snapper, uh, snapper complex number two, queen, queen and cardinal snapper, and also misty grouper and yellow edge grouper. And also to capture uh, big silk snappers in those deeper waters as well. So some of the bycatch species um, that um, Fisher had mentioned that are caught using this gear include the glass eye snapper, the Atlantic scumbrubs or cartucho prieto and the dogfish. The hooks that are used are circle hooks and are related to fishing effort, depth fish, previous, previous experiences with lost gear, and, and among, among other. So in terms of the number of hooks, um, so species that are belong to the snapper complex one, which are the, the ones that are deep water species, but still um, ch um, shallow, shallower than, than the snapper U2 species. They're typically fish with less hooks, um, that is like from five to 10 hooks. And then for those species that are harvested in deeper waters, they are fish with more hooks, sometimes up to a maximum of 30. And um, from what I, from the information that I uh, recall hearing from, from many of the fisher, most of the harvest of these species that are from deeper waters in Puerto Rican waters occurs with that, with that local buoy gear. And that also this is a very specialized fishery. The average number of set lines used three, but obviously that can vary. Bait use, liter tuni, sardines, bonito, bacora. And the west coast and the east coast are important landing areas for these species. Now, another particularity of, the, of, of this fishery is that Puerto Rico state waters has a special permit for cardinal and queen snappers that has been in place since 2013 and has consistently had around 60, 60 participants that are um, allowed to participate in this, in this fishery. So it is estimated that approximately 200 fishermen use this gear in Puerto Rico to fish for all of those species that, that I mentioned before. The market are um, restaurants, um, Villas Pesqueras that has restaurants and, and other a prior to presence, and then the price per pound fluctuates between 750 and 850. So, other things that were mentioned is that the number of hooks is used to, uh, used is adjusted to balance the potential for for that maximum productivity, and the factors that affect the gear use are strong current, swell, high predation, predation potential, weather, area fiction experience, for example. That that fishing occurs only for a few hours and that this gear is very expensive. So fishers try, do try to save some gear and some have noticed that there is no need to use that many hooks to obtain the desired landings. Um, they also noted that this gear acts as a spring that lifts the weight and moves the line to another place by using the current and, and the weight. The gear bounces on the bottom, it doesn't drag and it's very important for the fishers to not lose their gear so they don't want it to snag. Um, next slide.
Okay, so this is just a snapshot of harvest that occurs with what um, in the landings data is classified as bottom line or in, in Spanish cala or bottom hook and line. And this is not cala comboya. This also includes other, it is, includes cala comboya, which is the uh, type of buoy gear configuration, but it also includes other bottom line uh, configurations that are used to fish for deep water species, for example, so with the reels attached to the boat, etc. And this snapshot that I'm presenting in here is just to give you an idea, it's just for the three species that have some of the most landings um, um, with this gear. Um, I, I just did this data query, so this is not final. So um, I also need, it needs to be corroborated, but this is just to give you an idea of the harvest that may be occurring in federal waters, Puerto Rico waters, and then also what is um, uh, classified as unknown, which means that no information was provided as to where the, the harvest took place. So if you see um, the, the graph on the left, um, this is Cardinal Snapper. The blue is um, the percentage of, in, of uh, landings that occur in state waters. The uh, orange is the percentage of landings that occur in federal waters. And the gray line, which in 2012 is pretty high, is unknown, meaning that no, it was not specified. So as you can see for Cardinal Snapper, um, most of the landings occurred in state waters, have occurred in state waters. And another thing that we can see in 2019, we do have an increase of a percentage of, of landings from federal waters, but we also know that with, through time, the information um, that has been listed as unknown has, has minimized, has diminished. In terms of Queen Snapper, um, we can see also we can see that um, the percentage of landings in fe from federal waters is a little higher, and we also see that um, that the uh, unknown listing of unknown it's um, gets better through time. Lastly, uh, for the silk snapper, we have um, we have uh, also, uh, also state waters having a higher number of landings in terms of percentage, although at the end it's kind of comparable. With, with the unknown. So this gives us an idea of how much harvest occurs in federal waters, which is um, uh, what we're trying to accomplish in here with this action. Um, but we don't really know how much of the harvest reported occurs using the specific type of buoy gear configuration that contains more than 10 hooks between, between the buoy and the terminal end. So this is some kind of the information that we would like to have uh, more refined if possible, so we can include it in, the, in this amendment. Can we go to the next slide? Okay, so now I'm gonna turn my attention to the USBI uh, Fisheries Deep Water Reef Fish component. There is even less information available for, uh, for deep water reef fish component. And it's probably because it's not, it's not a fishery that is uh, conducted a lot in the US Virgin Islands. So the local name, deep drop buoy gear. And again, as I mentioned earlier, I'm sorry for the interruption. If you see anything that you can provide more context or needs to be corrected, please let me know. We'll be happy, happy to do that. We need your, your, your input on this. So the species targeted are almost the same as in Puerto Rico. Queen snapper, black fin snapper, black uh, snapper vermilion, uh, the gold eye or glass eye snapper, uh, mist and misty grouper. The deep rub buoy gear is used from 300 to 1200 feet. Um, and fishing with this gear type is more common in St. Croix than in St. Thomas and St. Joe. And I forgot to, to mention, but this information comes from a couple of publications. So for example, the USBI fish censuses from Koji's 2004 and then Koji's et al. 2017, and also from some other, uh, and another um, publication from Olsen in 1974, as well as recent uh, personal communications with USBI fishers and fisher administrators by um, NOAA fisheries staff. Um, so the number of hooks used varies, um, but uh, fishers mentions an average of 22 can be up to 50, and I have an asterisk in there because I think this is some of the information that still needs to be corroborated. Some fishermen may use up to six buoy lines, buoy uh, lines, some just, just one line. 
And as in Puerto Rico, the number of hooks is also related to the effort needed, the depth, the species targeted, the areas fished in and previous is experiencing with lost gear or the cost of the gear, et cetera. The bait used in the U.S. Virgin Islands is little tuny, squid, and small skipjack. The species that are harvested using this gear are sold in the local marketplace, usually on Saturdays, and the pr price per pound usually fluctuates. Um, it's, I'm sorry, usually it's around $8. So other names for this buoy type um, that we found in the, in the uh, publications is vertical set line or, or vertical long lines. And um, it, there seemed to be some confusion between the buoy vertical lines that are used to fish for pelagic species and the buoy vertical set lines that are used for, to fish for deep water snappers and, and groupers. So um, this is, definitely some of the information that we still have to have to gather. So, um, so can we go to the next slide? Now, when we try to create similar charts um, as the ones that are presented for Puerto Rico, uh, we encountered that these species are har harvested with all the gears that, that are listed in there, but then we don't really know which one of these gear types the ver that vertical set line or the deep drop buoy gear falls under. Um, and then also for purposes of creating charts in uh, tables, there's also data confidentiality issues because of the low number of participants. So um, for in terms of the USBI, we, we definitely need more information and we will benefit, this amendment will benefit greatly from having a little bit more information from the USBI to complete the description of, of this fishery. Um, next slide. Okay, so I'm circling back to the action proposed in the amendment after we talk about the description of the fisheries. So all of every amendment has a draft purpose and need, and in here, I mean, a purpose and need, and here the purpose is to modify that definition of buoy gear that it's included to allow the commercial sector of the hook and line long line hook and line component of the fishery for managed reef fish described in each of the island-based FMPs to use a larger number of hooks when using buoy gear. I, I, I'm hearing uh, some feedback. I don't know if somebody has the microphone open, if they can be muted. Thank you. The need is to ensure that commercial fishermen fishing in federal waters of Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands for managed refish can use the gear type preferred by some fishers with that, those additional hooks. Okay, next slide. So the alternatives that are proposed in the amendment um, is the, uh, this is only a one action amendment and a different alternative can be selected for each island management area. I'm just saying, saying this, but you know, obviously this only has to, but the alternative one is the one that we always include is a no action. The current definition of buoy gear specified in 50 CFR 622.2 would be retained. And then alternative two will modify the definition of buoy gear as it applies to the commercial sector um, of the fishery for managed free fish to allow the use of up to 25 hooks connected between the buoy and the terminal end. Next slide. So what this alternative one means, it means that nothing changed, right? That definition remains of change. But one of the specific requirements under this definition is that that buoy gear cannot contain more than 10 hooks connected between the buoy and the terminal ends. So in those components of each of the island-based FMP fisheries where buoy gear is an authorized gear, which means the commercial sector harvesting managed reef fish is the only one from the managed, uh, council managed fisheries where, where this uh, gear can can be, is authorized, fishers then must limit the gear to those, those 10 hooks. Next slide. Under alternative two, then this modification will, will increase the number of hooks allowed to be used for to up to 25 instead of the 10. And then that would allow um, the, those fishers that are fishing commercial in federal waters for those managed reef fish to legally use that gear configuration that are employ employed by some in state and, and, and to some degree federal waters. That modification would only apply to those using this gear to fish commercially for managed reef fish. 
The rest of the specifications that are included in the definition of fluid gear, um, federal definition, such as the weight and the construction materials for the drop line and the length of the drop line will, will remain unchanged. Okay, next slide. Now in the amendment, in this draft amendment, um, we included some preliminary effects um, analysis, um, but this analysis um, at this point, because we're still um, gathering some data, trying to clarify um, some things about the data and, um, um, and also some more information that will help us um, describe, better describe the fisheries. This um, analysis that is included in the draft amendment uh, is qualitative. And the way that it was done, and I, um, at this point, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna get into a lot of details about it, but it's assuming that changes in the total land, that there will be changes in total landings of target species because of those changes in the total number of hooks used per trip. And now some of the questions that perhaps are appropriate for, for, for the council and for um, fishers um, is that would increasing that number of allowable hooks per set affect, have any effect on the total fishing pressure and potential for additional catch and landings or, or additional bycatch. So there's a couple of things in here that are unknown because harvest reported is, you know, you saw that there were some, some ways of distinguishing some of that harvest between federal and, and state waters, but harvest reported is combined usually between state and federal waters in we don't really know the number of fishers that may possibly increase the hook numbers. So also harvest levels may already be accounting harvest with more than 10 hooks. So the IPD, which is the interdisciplinary planning team um, for that is working on this action, um, will try to um, complete, will complete, I will try, will complete um, for the next trap, um, an effect analysis that hopefully um, can include more information on that would could help us answer some of these questions. Okay, uh, next next slide. Okay, so this is my last slide. Um, these are some of the next steps that we are recommending. We would like to um, uh, in, obtain some input from the district advisory panels uh, to complete the description of the fisheries, uh, as I mentioned earlier. So um, we want to ask the council um, to, if they could, uh, if they think it's appropriate to task the DAPs to gather that information from uh, fishers and to report their findings to staff. Then the um, interdisciplinary plan team or IPT would analyze the data available information and finalize effects in other sections of this document. Then the IPT draft is going to draft the second version of the amendment and present that to the council at the August meeting for, for potential final action. So this is the end of my presentation. Um, if you have, if there's time uh, for questions or for further clarifications of some of the items that I presented, um, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. I have Nelson Crespo. Yes, Nelson. I'm going to give an opportunity for Nelson. Obviously, he's, he's this expert among mm -hmm. the fishermen on, on that. And please make sure you put all your comments, even if it's a little detail, at the chat. And we're going to be informed to you which way we can organize the future participation from the DAP and others to support Maria effort. Uh, Nelson. Hey, thank you, uh, Maria. Excellent presentation. I know the all the time that you put on that, and we appreciate that. Um, I take the time to read the presentation, and, and on page nine, the second paragraph that said that increasing the numbers of hooks may increase the fishing pressure. At present, the deep water fishermen are using more than ten hooks, as we always have signs long before Magnuson Law was created. I mean, we are not going to increase the, the pressure on fishing. On the contrary, alternative two would cause that the fishermen who still use more than 25 hooks to re have to reduce their number and consequently reduce the pressure of fishing. Also, at the present, we are only uh, by local regulation, 
we are only allowed to fish 120 days per year for deep water snapper. That an increase of fishing days beyond that are not possible. Thank you. Thank you, Nelson. And make sure everybody put your comments. Like uh, in Puerto Rico, I think you're missing the use of squid as bait. And that's very, very commonly used around Puerto Rico too. And the next presenter. The modification of the spiny lobster. Uh, Marcos, if I may real quick, I think Carlos was uh, has a comment. Carlos Forchetti. Carlos, go ahead. Yeah, real quick. Um, thank you, Maria. Listen, on page eight, I believe it is. I was reading an alternative two around the fifth sentence where it says, under existing regulations of those fishing for managed reef fish in federal waters, only those, fi only those fishing commercially can use buoy gear. Is, is this language in the CFR? Because I, I know that in, on St. Croix, our waters are very deep in territorial waters and some fishers may fish for that species in territorial waters, but I don't think that gear is prohibited by recreational users. So, uh, Mr. Sherry, if I may. Yes, go so ahead. The federal regulations, um, the buoy gear as it's listed in our federal regulation is not just for managed uh, species by the council. It also is also an authorized gear. And remember, I'm, I'm, I'm referring to federal waters here. It's also an authorized gear for other non-managed fisheries. For example, for uh, what it's called non-FNP uh, pelagics, et cetera. Um, it is not, um, for federal waters, it's, it is not listed as an allowable gear uh, for recreational use. I do not know the particularities of the, of, of the regulations in the USBI for, for this gear. I, my understanding um, based on me reading uh, the gears that could be used by by recreational is that it it wasn't listed for recreational use but but if um if you know if somebody you or somebody else from the usbi can clarify that 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 will be great but i can only speak as to what it's allowed in 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 federal waters and the reason that we're being very specific in the alternative as to what this will be modifying is because this change is only meant to be for those um, uh, managed, uh, council managed reef fish. Anything else that this gear, um, this gear type um, is uh, an allowable gear for will remain at the 10 hooks. So that's why, that's why we, in the alternative, it says for managed reef fish. And I hope that answers your question, Carlos. Thank yeah, you. thank you, Mar yeah. Th thank you, Maria. Uh, we really need to pass the, to the next presentation. And I'm so uh, Marcos, thankful for Marcos. everybody, cooperation. Go ahead, Miguel. Hey, Marco, but before you, you rush into the next presentation, you people have to really understand Maria del Mar's presentation and also decide whether this is only for, for a management unit or it will be across the board for anybody who fishes those gears in the federal waters. You don't have to say that now, but you have to think about it because otherwise you'll be dragging this issue forever. And that's what Maria de Mar is trying to, to explain here. In one, um, in one public hearing in Maya West, there was a recreation fisher who used jigging. And he explained to us what jigging was. And he was concerned that jigging would be prohibited in Bajo de Chico and others. So those issues are still pending. And the council members are encouraged to look at it and, and come to us with uh, recommendations or suggestions. Because once this is approved, Although this will go through the process of going to public meetings and everything, and public hearings, of course, we, we want to make sure that the, the council as a group understand what Maria de Mar just presented to us. Uh, Marcos, if I may. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. One of the things that I am requesting in this presentation is uh, for the council to uh, if they would like to request the district advisory panels uh, to provide information, to collect information to this. And, and I don't know if that's something that the council would like to do at this time. Uh, Marcos, if I may. 
Go uh, ahead, Miguel. We we can ask the, the members of the of the of the council. We have to be careful not to call it a, a survey, but we can ask the the you know, Maria de Mar, Graciela, and I can put together uh, some uh, information that we need from from the DAPs, and we can send them emails to each one of them through the chairs, especially uh, Nelson, Eddie, and, and and Julian, and see if they if they can contribute the information that. Uh, Maria de Mar is, is, need, is in need to collect. And we can do that between here and this meeting. So if you all agree, I need to, to have your consent so we can go ahead and, and ask the DAPs about the information that she needs. Uh, I think the council will agree. Any opposition to the idea? Re hearing now, uh, let's do that, Miguel, and move forward. Okay, Graciela and, and Maria del Mar will get together sometime uh, in the near future. And for the next meeting, we hope to have the information from the DAP's members. Thank you. Thank you. Let, thank you. Hey, Marcos. Yes. Hey, this is Andy Strelchak. So I, I don't know if the council wants to wait for the information from the DAP, um, kind of given timing and proceeding with public hearings and final action, if the council's ready to select a preferred alternative today, that would be obviously helpful for further development of the document. Uh, well, uh, I think from my part uh, as a chairman and being involved in this discussion for a long time, I think the preferred alternative for sure will be number two. Yeah, well, we and, have to put that, my, my, Marcos, if I may, we need to put that on the screen. I would need a motion for that. Yes, I understand. Anybody, anybody that can help me out with the motion, if you agree with the alternative yes. two to be the Marco, or any alternative to, to be, the, we need to put that on the screen first. Let the, the staff to put it on the screen. Christina, would you please uh, share the screen with the, the alternative? Yes. There we okay. go. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Chairman, uh, here we are, and the language uh, is alternative to modify the definition of wood gear in 50 CFR 622.2 as it applies to the commercial sector, the long line hook and line component of the fishery to manage reef fish to allow the use of up to 25 hooks connected between the buoy and the terminal end. And that would be your motion. To yes. accept that alternative language. Any 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 second for my motion to accept the alternative no, no, two? No, 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 or... we need to, Marcos, we need to have the motion first. You cannot make the motion. This is Carlos Fashetti. I I motion to accept alternative two as written on the screen. Modify the definition of buoy gear in 50 Not CFR already. six. 622.2 as it applies to the map to the commercial sector of the long line hook and line component of the fishery for managed reef fish to allow the use of up to 25 hooks connected between the buoy and the terminal end. 
Thank you, Carlos. Any second? Second. Thank you, thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tony, for the sec second. Any opposition to the motion? Any comments? Hearing now, motion carries. Thank you to all. And now I think we are on the way to the next presentation of the Spiny Lobster. I'm a little concerned with the time constraint. Miguel, do you have any recommendation how we accommodate or we keep going with, with the next presentation right away? But you can break now at one o'clock and then uh, have a 15 minutes before the presentation at 1.30 and then you will move. But you have to break at three o'clock sharp. For yes. example, the, the DAP reports can be uh, done tomorrow uh, than today, first in the morning after 8.30. We, we have the 8.30 presentation by Dr. Michel Duval and then you can move the presentation by the DAPs uh, after that. So I think it sounds like a sounds like a plan uh, for the so modification. Break, yeah, you can break for lunch now and dedicate the 15 minute base. Final after reference points is very important. Yes, let's break for lunch now and come back. It's uh, 12.53. We come back at 1.30 uh, sharp. One, one, one one, 1.20? 1.30 sharp. Okay, one thirty. No opposition at one thirty sharp. Hello? Miguel, I think, Miguel, this is Maria. I can, I can hear you.
Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to start at 1.30 sharp. Thank you. Sí. Dígame. Sí, creo que Guillermo está ahí, lo, lo arreglaron ya. Pero si no, se lo decimos a Guillermo otra vez. Sí, a mí me pasó, pero ahora cayó. Vamos a ver. Good afternoon, everyone. Marcos Hanke. We're going to restart the afternoon section for the 173 CFMC meeting. Uh, the next presentation, and thank you so much for Sarah for wait to present after lunch with the modifications that we made on the, scale, on the sequence of presentation. Uh, go ahead, Sarah. Modification of spinal lobster reference points. Hi, thank you. Uh, Christina, do you have the presentation? Yes, I have it. Good afternoon, everyone. Sarah Stevenson for the record. This presentation will provide a summary on the draft framework amendment to update management reference points for spiny lobster following the accepted CDAR 57 stock assessments. Next. At the December council meeting, the council was presented with a first look at the draft amendment to update spiny lobster management reference points following CDAR 57 and the stocks change from a tier four to tier three under the ABC control rule that's included in the island-based FMPs. The council reviewed the two actions and their alternatives that were included in the amendment. Under action one, the council would select a preferred approach for setting OFLs, ABCs, and ACLs for 2021 to 2023. The two approaches included a variable catch approach in which the OFLs, ABCs, and ACLs would change each year, and a constant catch approach in which the values would be the same each year. And then under Action 2, the Council could revise the AM trigger for spiny lobster, which selects the year or years of landings to be compared to the ACL. Next, please. 
After reviewing the draft amendment, the council requested that the Science Center update the OFL projections and ABC estimates for Puerto Rico using complete 2019 landings data mm -hmm. adjusted using the 2019 expansion factors. At that time, the 2019 landings were available, but the expansion factors were not. The council also requested that the SSC review components of the draft amendment that were related to the timing of the OFLs and ABCs, specifically the shelf life of those values. The council also requested guidance from the SSC on the use of an arithmetic average versus a geometric average used in the process to trigger accountability measures. The interdisciplinary plan team for the spiny lobster amendment would make any necessary updates to the actions and alternatives following outcomes from the February SSC meeting and would add in a high level comparison of alter alternatives for council consideration. And that is for this meeting. Next, please. During the February SSC meeting, the updated OFLs and ABCs for Puerto Rico were not available at that time. So the SSC agreed to allow the chair the ability to approve the updated projections and estimates for Puerto Rico for recommendation to the council when they became available. Specific to action one in the amendment, <clears throat> the SSC discussed the years for which OFLs and ABCs should be included in the Spiny Lobster Amendment, as well as the council's intent to request an interim assessment by 2022 to update those values to reflect more recent data. The SSC decided to continue to recommend both the variable catch and constant catch OFLs and ABCs for the period of 2021 to 2023. In the event that subsequent rulemaking with new OFLs, ABCs, and ACLs that are updated from that interim assessment is not in place by the end of 2023, the SSC recommends that the OFL and ABC for 2024 and later be equal to the OFL and ABC set for 2023 under the variable catch approach. This would apply for both the constant catch and the variable catch approaches. And since the ACLs are de derived from the ABCs would apply to the constant catch and variable catch ACLs as well. Specific to action two in which the SSC was asked for guidance on the type of average used for ACL monitoring the SSC recommended that for spiny lobster, the council continue using an arithmetic mean for ACL monitoring purposes. Next, please. Here's a quick look at major changes to the draft amendment since the December meeting, which will be discussed in more detail in the following slides. The OFLs, ABCs, and ACLs for Puerto Rico were updated using complete 2019 landings data with 2019 expansion factors. The OFLs, ABCs, and ACLs for 2024 and later were set based on SSC recommendation from their February meeting. The alternative in action two that ramped up to a three-year average, meaning it, it started with a single year of landings followed by a two-year average of landings, then a three-year average of landings as the AM trigger, was replaced with an alternative that just uses a three-year average of landings as the trigger. In other words, no ramp up. The subalternatives using the geometric averages were removed based on SSC recommendation. A high level comparison of the alternatives was added for each action, including effects to the physical, biological, ecological, economic, social, and administrative environments. Chapter three, which is the description of the environments affected by the actions was added, incorporating by reference information from the island-based FMPs where applicable. And then finally, references and appendices were added to the draft amendment. Next, please. Version two of the draft amendment is included in the council's briefing book which is on the council's website and is available for your review. Next, please. For each action, the draft amendment includes a no action alternative that provides a baseline for comparison of the considered alternatives. Under alternative one, 
<clears throat> of action one, if the council were to take no action, the OFL proxy, which in the island-based FMPs was the SYL, the sustainable yield level under tier four of the ABC control rule, the ABC and the ACL specified for spiny lobster would remain as set in the island-based FMPs, which are listed here in this table. However, alternative one would be inconsistent with the requirements of the Magnuson-Stevens Act and National Standard 2 guidelines, and that they would not be based on best scientific information available, and the ACLs would be higher than the ABCs recommended by the SSC following the CDAR 57 assessments. Next, please. The other two alternatives under action one allow the council to select its preferred approach for setting reference points under this amendment. Under alternative two, the council would select the variable catch approach and use the variable catch ABCs to derive the variable catch ACLs for spiny lobster. Under alternative three, the council would select the constant catch approach and use the constant catch ABC to derive the constant catch ACL for spiny lobster. The top table has the OFLs and ABCs under the variable catch approach, and the bottom table has the OFLs and ABCs for the constant catch approach. And I will point out that the values here in these tables for um, St. Thomas, St. John, and St. Croix are the same that you saw in December, only the Puerto Rico values have been updated. You can see that for either approach, the values for 2024 and later are the same. Those values were recommended by the SSC at their February meeting in the event that subsequent rulemaking with updated reference points is not in place by 2024. Next, please. <clears throat> Alternatives two and three each include three subalternatives that would allow the council to set the ACL from the ABC based on the level of management uncertainty perceived for the fisheries targeting spiny lobster. Management uncertainty refers to uncertainty in the ability of managers to constrain catch so the ACL is not exceeded and the uncertainty in quantifying the true catch amounts. This table lists the proposed subalternatives for setting the variable catch ACLs from the variable catch ABCs. Under subalternative 2A, which is the third column in the table, no management uncertainty buffer would be applied, so the ACLs would equal the ABC. Under subalternative 2B, which is the fourth column, that would apply a 5% management uncertainty buffer, and the ACLs would be equal to 95% of the ABC. And then finally, subalternative 2C, which is the last column, would apply a 10% management uncertainty buffer, and the ACLs would be 90% of the ABC. Just to point out here what the plus sign is on the year 2023, since the ACLs are derived from the ABCs recommended by the SSC, the ACLs for 2024 and later would be equal to the values specified for 2023. So the values set for 2023 would continue in time until amended. Again, council intent is to ask the Science Center to conduct an interim assessment for spiny lobster for each island from which a subsequent amendment would be developed with at minimum updated OFLs, ABCs, and ACLs. The hope is to have the role updating those values in place by the 2024 fishing season. Next, please. These are the proposed ACLs under the constant catch alternative, which is alternative three. The reduction buffers, the management uncertainty buffers proposed here are the same as those under um, the previous alternative. Subalternative 3A, which is the third column, would have no management uncertainty and would set the ACLs equal to the ABC. Uh, Subalternative 3B, the fourth column, would apply the 5% management uncertainty buffer. And subalternative 3C, which is the last column, would apply that 10% management uncertainty buffer. Under this alternative, the ACLs for 2024 and later would be set equal to the values specified for 2023 under the variable catch approach. Again, those values were based on the SSC's oh, recommendation. <laughs> no, not at all, Madam Chair. 
Okay, sorry. Those values were based on SSE's recommendation for ABCs oh, in years me. after 2023. Okay, one, one, sec, one second, sir. Okay. Some, uh, there is a mic. Okay, can everyone hear me? Please make your uh, close your mic. There is a presentation taking Chip, place. I seem to be showing that you're self muted. Okay, I think we're good. Uh, so yeah, as I was saying, the the values for 2024 and later are just based on SSC recommendation for ABCs, and that those would continue until amended. And then just to point out, the council could select a different alternative and subalternative for each island or island group. Next, please. The higher ACLs under alternative one could offer greater economic benefits. However, those higher ACLs could result in reduced biological benefits to the stock through the greater risk of overfishing based on CDAR 57 outcomes. Increased biological and ecological benefits would be expected under alternatives two and three when compared to alternative one through the application of the best scientific information available. Managing based on best scientific information better ensures the spiny lobster stocks are harvested sustainably. Although the approaches for setting OFLs, ABCs, and ACLs differ under alternatives two and three, the total catch allowed under the variable catch approach, which is alternative two, would equal the total catch under the constant catch approach, which is alternative three. So the long-term biological benefits to the, stock, to the stock would be the same. Setting constant management reference points under alternative three could provide greater benefits to the socioeconomic environment when compared to the changing reference points under alternative two, since the catch targets would not be changing from year to year. The table shows the total catch allowed under the two approaches for the sub alternatives that use a 5% reduction buffer. When you compare the variable ACLs to the constant ACLs, the catch allowed in a given year differs but the total sum over the four years shown here would be the same for each island. And that's the, the bold numbers at the bottom. And this outcome occurs for the other sub alternatives as well as for the OFLs and the ABCs. For action one, the council would want to consider if they prefer changing ACLs over the 2021 to 2023 period or static ACLs and what level of uncertainty they have in the management of the stock. Next, please. Under action two, the council could revise the trigger for accountability measures for spiny lobster from what was described in the island-based FMPs. Alternative one is the no action alternative and would use landings from a specific sequence of years to evaluate an overage of the spiny lobster ACL. This ramp up process would start with a single year of landings from 2018, followed by a single year of landings from 2019, then a two year average of landings from 2019 and 2020, followed by a three year average of landings from 19, 20 and 21, and then thereafter a progressive running three-year average. So under this stepwise process, the no action alternative would not use a three-year average of landings as the trigger until the fourth year of implementation. Next, please. Alternative two would use the average of the most recent three years of spiny lobster landings to trigger an AM. An AM would be triggered if average landings exceeded the average ACLs in place during those years. The years of landings used to trigger an AM could be adjusted to account for the best scientific information available. Alternative three would use the most recent single year of spiny lobster landings to trigger an AM. An AM would be triggered if landings exceeded the ACL in place during that year. The year of landings used to trigger an AM, again, could be used or could be adjusted to account for best scientific information available. Next, please. <laughs> Sorry, next slide. 
Thank you. This table was included in the draft amendment to help illustrate the years of spiny lobster landings that would be used to trigger an AM under each alternative. This analysis was based on two assumptions. The first assumption was that final landings are not available until two years after the year in which the fishing occurred. And the second assumption is that the island-based FMPs and the spiny lobster amendment would be effective in the same year in this table that's fishing year 2022, and that the years specified in the FMPs as the AM trigger would be updated to reflect the most recent landings available. So in this table, in, if the FMPs and amendment were implemented in 2022, the most recent landings available at that time would be from 2020, and the sequence specified in the FMPs would be updated to use 2020 as the starting year. In this analysis, alternatives one and three would use the same years of landings in the first two years as the AM trigger, but then alternative one would start using a multi-year average. Alternative two would use a three-year average from the first year of implementation. It wouldn't be until the fourth year of the amendment application in this table, that's fishing year 2025, until the alternative one trigger would use a three-year average. And that would be the same three-year average used as the trigger under alternative two under these assumptions that were made. At that point and later, the AM trigger under alternatives one and two would be the same. Alternative three would only ever use a single year of landings as the trigger. Next slide, please. In general, using a multi-year average of landings to trigger an AM would be expected to account for biological and economic variability in the landings, thereby reducing the probability that an AM would be triggered. However, if landings in a particular year are very high when using a three-year average as the trigger, that one year of high landings could be used to calculate the average landings multiple times potentially triggering AMs in three consecutive years. So the benefit of the three-year average depends on the magnitude and the variability in the landings. Next slide, please. Landings for 2020 are not available at this time, but it is, it is expected that they would be less than the previous year's landings due to the reduced fishing effort that occurred in 2020 during the COVID-19 pandemic. If future landings of spiny lobster in Puerto Rico are landed at the 2018 or 2019 land, uh, levels, then AMs would likely be triggered every year under all the alternatives, as those landings would exceed the proposed ACLs under Action 1, uh, they would greatly exceed them. Annual landings of spiny lobster in St. Thomas, St. John and St. Croix since 2012 have generally been less than the ACLs that are proposed under Action 1. If landings continue at those levels, an AM would not be triggered under any of the Action 2 alternatives. Next, please. At the December 2020 meeting, the council preliminary preferred the constant catch approach to setting OFLs, ABCs, and ACLs, which is alternative three under action one. And using a three-year average as the AM trigger, which is now alternative two under action two. For next steps in the amendment process, following any questions from this presentation, the council could select preferred alternatives for the two actions at this meeting. For action one, the council would first select a variable catch or constant catch approach for setting management reference points and would then select the management uncertainty reduction buffer for spiny lobster used to set the ACL from the ABC. For action two, the council would select the AM trigger for spiny lobster. The IPT would then develop the framework amendment for final action at the August 2021 council meeting. And if so requested by the council, staff could present a summary of the draft amendment to the district advisory panels before the August council meeting. And with that, next slide, I'll take any questions.
Thank you very much for a great pre presentation. Uh, council members, uh, do you have any questions, any comments? Let me see on the chat. Miguel, there's anybody that requests a turn to ask on the chat? Don't see any. I, I couldn't hear, can you repeat that? I, I don't see any in the chat. I believe that what we should do is to go back to um, the last slide where uh, Sarah is presenting to the council the, the action needed. And then if you agree, we have to dictate the motion to the staff and Christina can, or Leah High can write it on Word that you will see on the screen. But you need to, after this presentation, select the, the in action one, which, which is your preference, you know, select the variable constant catch approach, uh, select margin uncertainty, et cetera. And then in action two, you need to, to look at the trigger for spinal lobster, uh, uh, the AM trigger for the spinal lobster. I have a question, Miguel. Is the motion is like with all the things in consideration or apart? Each one separate. And Sarah can help us with the language as you wish to. Oh, Sarah, can you, can, you, can you please, I, can you please I, um, suggest I have, the motion? Yes, I do have some drafted. Um, would you like me to drop that in the chat or send it to Leah High? You can put it in the chat right now and, and, okay. and send it to the high at the same time. Okay. You know, whatever is easier. So um, I did just do one motion for each of the actions. So I, I combined the two steps the council would need to consider for action one into this one um, motion that I dropped on the side. And you would just need to fill in where I have, for example, alternative X you would select either alternative two or alternative three, and we would change that to the uh, corresponding variable catch approach or constant catch approach. And then down later in the sentence, we would just, where it says sub alternative X, Y, we would just change that to two A or two B, and then we would add what percent management uncertainty buffer that uh, corresponds to. Okay. Let, let, let's go baby steps because I'm not, well, I'm not <laughs> listening to, to anybody uh, requesting the floor. Que I have a question for the, for the council member. On action one, select variable or constant catch approach. I need to hear from the council members. Anybody? Carlos, go ahead. Tony Blanchard for the record. Go ahead, go ahead, Tony. Uh, I'll select action one, select variable or constant catch approach. Well, that's so, the question, you need to select one or the two. So Tony, the variable approach would change the values from year to year and the constant approach would have the same ACL for 2021 to 2023. It would change slightly for 2024 if new rulemaking isn't in place by that time, but th those are your two options. Tony, I want- uh, My is Marcos. option would be a constant catch approach. Okay. Yes. I just want to make a comment. Yes, Marcos. Uh, yeah, yeah the, we, we discussed this on the past and at that time the council was in agreement with the con constant approach, like Sarah just explained. Uh, anybody on the group have any other comments about this specific discussion? Marco, for the record, you need to develop the record. You have to say, you know, which will be best for the fishery, the constant approach or the variable approach? And, and then you go with it. But you have now also Carlos Hachete um, wants to say something. Go ahead, Carlos. And then Andy. Well, I wanted to second Blanchard's motion to use a constant approach. Why? For, for option one. Uh, Do you have a rationale? Well, that was agreed upon in December meeting. Yeah, but we need to develop the rationale here, you know, otherwise we don't need this, meet this meeting. 
We need to hear from the council members. Okay, I, I select the constant approach because, and then you develop the record here. And I believe we also have Andy Sturcek. He would like to add something, Marcos, maybe. Allow them yes. To talk before you have be, the motion. Be, before Andy uh, uh, participate, I want to remember uh, Carlos that once we discussed this, this the main rationale behind was that it was much easier for the all the participants on this scheme of management to have a constant approach that doesn't change that will be too confusing over time that was one of the main things right uh, I'll come, you I'll agree? Come up with it. yes uh, let's give an opportunity to Andy Marcos let's go one second Tony we have somebody else on, online go with you uh, yeah, thanks, Marco. So I'm certainly supportive of a constant catch approach for some of the reasons that have already been stated. Um, it certainly provides, in my view, greater stability to the industry um, and uh, understanding that the catch limits obviously won't be changing from year to year. You also look at the landings data for, in particular, the USVI. Landings are well below those catch levels. So whether you set it at a variable or constant a catch level, you aren't expected to um, hit the catch limits based on at least current or historical landings data, and that the Puerto Rican data is not uh, dramatically changing whether you select a variable approach or a constant approach. So I would recommend the constant catch. Thank you very much. Uh, Tony Blanchard. Constant catch uh, approach. It's because you know what to expect every year, meaning as to what the ACL is going to be. The staggering up and down is going to be confusing, in my opinion. Thank you. Any, any you other? You want consistency. Fisherman want consistency. So, thank you, thank you Tony. Order, Mr. Chairman. So the, the motion by uh, Tony Blanchard is for the council preferred alternative to be the constant approach regarding the spiny lobster. And, then, and it was second by Carlos Fachete. Correct. And we are in the discussion, if I mislead that, we are in discussion about that motion right now. And there is a rationale behind it already stated on record. And uh, there is anybody else that would like to, to add to the discussion? Hearing none, I think we are ready to vote. Anybody, any, anybody in opposition? Hearing none, the motion carries. No, Marcos, Marcos, you have to say anybody in opposition, abstention, and then your motion carries, just in case. Anybody in opposition, anybody in abstention? Motion carries. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you to all. The, ne the next... Uh, Item for discussion, Sarah, can you help us again? Yes, it would be what level of management uncertainty do you want to apply to set the ACL from the ABC for each island for spiny lobster? So the options were the options were uh, no buffer, so the ACL would equal the ABC uh, five percent reduction buffer, so the ACL would be 95% of the ABC or a 10% buffer and the ACL would equal 90% of the ABC. And just for reference, um, in the island-based FMPs for spiny lobster, for all three FMPs, uh, the council selected a 5% management uncertainty buffer um, and so they set the ACL equal to 95% of that ABC. So that's what you did um, with the island-based FMPs, um, but the options here are, are slightly different and we are in a different tier. So I guess the council just needs to, um, for each island, determine what their level of management uncertainty they feel is. Um, and if you want, I can tell, we can go back to the slide that has those uh, Please do. buffers. All right, I'll tell you. Let's 
So this one, nope, keep going, sorry. Keep going. Keep going. So this one. The, uh, so this is your constant catch ACLs, which is the, the first part, the first motion you just made. From those constant catch ABCs, now you're going to set the constant catch ACL. Uh, Subalternative 3A, which is that third column, would be your ACLs for uh, Puerto Rico for 2021 to 2023. And then um, if we don't have new rulemaking in place by 2024, uh, it would drop. So for each of your islands, that's what. And then the, the next column, subalternative 3B, no, has a 5% buffer. And then the last column has the 10% buffer. So these, these are the options presented uh, in the amendment. Sarah, a question just for, for clarification. On the three, 388,750, uh, how many times Puerto Rico, I'm gonna use Puerto Rico as example, how many times Puerto Rico over the years uh, passed that number? Okay, so um, in the table that I had in there, let's see. So it went over, I'm just going to go back in time. So 2019 was higher than that. 2018 was higher than that. 2016, 2015. Um, so th those four years were higher than the 388,750. Okay. So four, four times in the past uh, however many years. I'm sorry to be repetitive of my questions, but what is the difference in terms of, for the livelihood of the fishermen of having exceeding using the 5% the 5 uh, uh, 95, 0.95 versus equal to ABC in terms of if you're gonna pass it anyway? Uh, Marcos, there's another issue with this. Remember the discussion that we had before where Dr. Roy Craft 3 told us that because of the uncertainties that you have, you also have to have a strong rationale to present to the secretary as to why you equal ACL to ABC. And uh, the buffer that was offered that you all agree 0.95 was because that taking in consideration that requirement because of the buffer, uh, 0.90 was, was too much. And the, if you want to be consistent, then you have 0.95. The question here is of 0.95 across the three areas in each island FMP, or do you want to leave that floating somehow? So yeah. no, my, my intention as a chairman was to, to create a little bit of elaboration on this over again, a little bit of repetitive, just to, to refresh the mind of the councils to get to this point, you know? And uh, uh, I want to hear from the other council members. Marcos, this is Tony Blanchard. Go ahead, Tony. But I would go with sub alternative 3B, the, nine, the 0.95 to stay consistent for, no, for one thing. On the other hand, we have not overrun the ACLs for, I don't think it was ever overrun. So I don't see the, the 0.95 as being with a, a small buffer a problem. And because of the size of our lap soil, we have a three and a half inch carapace, minimum size. So that's my rationale for going with a 0.95. Would you like to present that if in the form of a motion, Tony? Okay, um, I may need some help with the wording. <coughs> the, I the, would, I would support Okay, the, the wording will be for the council to adopt alternative uh, of 0.95 of your, as presented in the table here for. So the, the setting ACL sub alternative that you have in action one, you select as you prefer alternative, ACL equal ABC times 0.95. In other words, you are given a 5% buffer. 
Yes. So we need a second for that one, Mr. Chen. Hold on for sure, yeah. second. Let's go for discussion. Anybody else want to comment? Yeah, I have a comment, Carlos. Um, I noticed in, in the fine print on, on page 10, where it says that if a subsequent assessment is not completed and an amendment is not implemented by 2024, the ACL equal value is specified as 2023 plus, that means it will reduce by 19,000 pounds automatically on 2024. If an assessment, not a full stock assessment, that's just an interim assessment. Is that? Yes, that's correct. So who, who would do that interim assessment? Would that come out from Division of Fish and Wildlife from Director? No, Andrew? that would, sorry, Carlos, to interrupt you. That would be the Science Center. But that data would have to come from, from Fish and Wildlife, right? They would use the same data that they used, uh, I believe, in the CDR assessment. So they would they would get updated landings data and updated uh, length data, the tip data, and they would use that to, to conduct uh, an interim assessment um, internally at the Science Center. And please feel free to jump on and correct me, anyone from the Science Center, if you'd like to, if I said that wrong. But they would do it and they would update the OFL projections, they would use the same ABC control rule um, that the council has already, and the council and the SSC has already established for the tier three stock, spiny lobster stocks. And so they would get updated OFLs, ABCs, and we would apply the same management uncertainty buffer as you guys are selecting here and get new ACL. So that's all to be done in the future. It was council's intent to request that interim assessment um but you you remember in the beginning the the science center gave us six years of ofl projections and the council didn't want to use all six years so they said let's use three years and let's get an updated um, assessment after those three years to set the next round of of management reference points so that's what the fine print is alluding to if that helps answer your question. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just concerned that if something doesn't happen, all of a sudden the fishermen are gonna lose 19,000 pounds. And, and as it is right now, you know, we've lost quite a bit of fishermen through attrition. And so the, the lobster harbor is not as high as, as it used to be. So I'm a little concerned about what would happen if they just dropped it because something didn't, no assessment was done. But the point is that all that could happen anyway. What you are setting up here is a mechanism for the interim assessment in 2024. And the, this is the best approach that the council could think of. Going back to your question, and I understand your, your concern, the data that is uh, examined by the Saudi Fishery Science Center, which is the ultimate authority for us, is the data that is submitted by the local governments and or any data that is collected uh, that is feature independent for any particular species that they are going to be looking at. So to your question, you know, aside from everything that Sarah told you, which I believe she's right on the money with the process, um, the, the data that the center received come from the two local governments. Okay, yeah, that was kind of my concern because I think that, you know, recently here, Fish and Wildlife has been doing a, a great job, but who knows what's going to happen in 2024 if there's not continuity of government. So you have to vote for the right people, I guess. Okay, uh, any, any further discussion? Uh, any, hey, Marcos. Advice? Yes. Hey, Marcos, I have a comment. Yeah, go so ahead, I'm I'm supportive of the uh, recommended subalternative um, 0 0.05 buffer. Um, I will comment that for Puerto Rico spiny lobster, I mean, given recent landings history, I mean, we are potentially looking at a situation where the accountability measures will be exceeded. Uh, given the catch limit being set relative to kind of prior landings history. 
So that's something I think just to be aware of. And regardless of what buffer you set, uh, if we're unable to kind of constrain the catch to that catch limit, that will result in future triggering of accountability measures um, if landings stay at these higher levels. Yes, uh, I agree with you. That's why my original question when I start to speak about this, and uh, there is a long there is a long conversation behind that. One of the points is that Sara just described that we have uh, five years or so uh, that the numbers of reported numbers of landings are higher. I just hopeful that the new uh, scientific information that come up going to help us understand a little better what is really going on in the water. And uh, my concern is that I don't want to, to, to tie anything on, uh, on a science that we need to improve, that we are doing that right now, right? That's my point. That's my concern. But anyway, about the motion, I would like to see the motion uh, for everybody to be clear or anybody that can read it for, for the group. To, to move along. And one of the things on the motion is that I want to make sure that they include all the areas, not just one area. If it's the motion presented by Tony, let the high, let the high put it together in the, in the word. Okay. Somewhere. A question for Tony is on your motion, just to be clear, you want to include all the three areas? On your motion? Yes. Thank you, Tony. Yes. Can you see my screen? This is the motions wording. Please let me yes. know if the wording is okay or is exact. If there's any modification, apologies if I put on the wrong people in the motions. Let me know. Um, Leah, hi. Something. I'm gonna. Yes. Um, I dropped a, a updated one in the chat for you. Um, since we already did the the first part okay. of this motion, um, I think you could can you, just. Could you please send it on? email because we wait, cannot wait, wait. copy paste this uh, from the chat i don't no, i am just, not able just, hey just guy wait let's play like we are in the room just dictate to your high what we need okay. to have on the screen and that will be better I'm, I'm, okay I'm so help with that one you're actually going to leave uh how it starts and you're going so for action one in the spiny lobster draft framework amendment comma the council moves to accept sub alternative so we're going to grab alternative x all the way to sub alternative and delete that so all the stuff in the middle will get deleted so 3b 95 percent um so actually it's just a five percent buffer um and then after the parentheses add in for puerto rico st thomas st john and St. Croix. For the meeting in December, we would like to invite Sarah Stevenson <laughs> to come to Puerto Rico. <laughs> and I believe that should do it. So Tony, do you agree with the language as written on the screen? Yeah. And the second, okay, and the seconder, Mr. Carlos Ochete? Yes, I do. Okay, so that's it, Mr. Chairman. We are ready for any further discussion or vote. Any Apologies, further discussion? By... Motion was Tony Blanchard. Thank you. A hearing, uh, there is anybody else that want to make a comment? Or in or are in opposition. Hearing none. Wait, wait. You have to uh, we, ha we don't have any abstention. Motion carries. 
that they all just put unanimously accepted. Perfect. Sarah, any any other action that we need to undertake at this time? We need to discuss the accountability measures action. <laughs> I was talking on mute. Yes, thank you, Andy. Um, so the action two alternatives, uh, you have the first was alternative one to keep what is in the island-based FMPs, which is that extended ramp up. Um, alternative two, which is to use a three-year average of landings and then alternative three was to just use a single year. So those were the options uh, presented. So Mr. Chema, we need to hear from the council, which is your preferred alternative. Tony Blanchard, I would go with a three year average because that's what we have been doing. Number one, it seems to have been working and just to keep consistency. Anybody else? Tony, can you make a motion? I need some help with the wording. Okay, let, let's start uh, and Lehi work it out first. Um, so we're going to copy the first part of the last action and we're just going to change it to action two. So for action two and the spiny lobster draft amendment, Copy the council moves to accept. You can copy that first whole sentence of your last one and just change the number. So grab it from the beginning. Sorry. For action, go. Okay, yeah. Well, change it to two. So, and we're going to change it from sub alternative to just alternative. And that's going to be alternative two. And then you can delete uh, the stuff in the parentheses and just put or, and leave for Puerto Rico, St. Thomas, St. John, St. Croix. Um, as the so and delete to set the ACLs from the ABCs and replace that with as the AM trigger for spiny lobster. Oh, look at that. So after alternative two, you can delete the, the islands that are duplicated. Perfect. So for the record, Mr. Chairman, the motion to be considered by Tony uh, is for action two in the Spanish Lobster Draft Framework Amendment. The council moved to accept alternative two as the preferred alternative for the AM trigger for Spanish Lobster in Puerto Rico, St. Thomas and John and San Croix. We need Tony, do you agree? Do you agree yes. with the language? Okay. Yes. Call for Sherry Sutton. <laughs> you are making the work easier for yeah, yeah, the high. <laughs> the motion and the second is the same person. I was just waiting. I, I didn't want to paint it right, no, no, right no, away. That's, that's, <laughs> that's great. We, we thank you and Sarah for this. So, Mr. Chairman, th there you have yes. the language. Th thank you very much. And uh, we're going to hear from the council now. Uh, if the, anybody in opposition? Hearing none. And there is any abstention? There's no abstention. Motion carries. Okay, uh, Sarah, have we finished uh, with the yeah. Spanish officer presentation? Excellent. Yes, thank you very much. Well, I, I'd like to thank uh, you, Andy, and Alia Hyde for excellent job. Thank you very much.
Thank you to all. Uh, let's go for the next item on the agenda. We're gonna pass, which is the listening, what time it is? It's 22. Miguel, we, do we have time for a strategic plan? Until before three? I was talking to myself. We, we can start now with Michelle's presentation and if the discussion goes into, let's say, uh, five to three, we can stop it there and continue afterwards. So if you agree with that. Yes, uh, everybody ag agree with that. I didn't hear any yeah. comment. Let's go for, with Michelle and, Duval. And just for the record, what we are going to have today, especially those of you who are not familiar with the council, uh, at three o'clock, we will have a listening session. It's like moving from this building, from a building to another. And that listening session will be chaired by the National Wildlife Fisheries Service. Uh, Attorney Sam Rauch will do that. So uh, the chairman will introduce him at that time at three o'clock. So from three o'clock to four o'clock, we have the listening session on 14, Executive Order 14 Section 216C. So, Michelle, are you ready? Um, thanks, Miguel. I was going to ask if I could share my screen. It might actually go faster um, if I can do that. OK, will you make you a host? OK, you have the floor. Great, thank you. So can everyone see my screen okay? Yes. All right. So um, let me just put this in presentation mode for you. Okay, great. So first of all, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, council members. I will do my best to be efficient here today. So I just have a presentation for you on the draft strategic plan framework. Um, and just a brief overview of what I'm gonna cover. I'm gonna just quickly review the components of a strategic plan because it's been a little while since we've talked about those. Then I'm gonna review the sources of information that were used to develop the draft framework. Um, I'll go over the general plan organization and structure. Um, and then the next steps are really review and selection of draft vision, mission, and goal area statements by the council and review and approval of the draft island specific objectives as modified by the DAPs. And so Mr. Chairman, my suggestion is that I go through the entire presentation and then we can circle back to those items that are needed for action by the council, if that's okay. Go ahead. All right. So just a quick review of the components of a strategic plan. So there's five major components, the vision, which is the desired future state an organization would like to achieve. This is meant to be very aspirational. The mission, which is really the fundamental purpose of an organization, sort of you know, why, what its reason for existence is and its general approach to achieve its vision. Um, goals are meant to be those very broad outcomes that help an organization to achieve its vision. They are not measurable, but they're just steps along the way. Objectives are those items that are specific. They are often measurable, um, and you can think of those as mini steps or a subset of the goals. And then the strategies are really how an organization is going to meet an objective, and those are more action oriented. And so just to translate this into an example, I'm bringing this back from um, our, our vision statement brainstorming session back in August of 2019. My problem is that I'm tired, I'm grumpy, and my pants don't fit. And that probably serves a lot of us right now um, after a year of COVID. But uh, my vision is that I look and feel fabulous. And so to achieve that vision, my goal is to get healthy. And so to achieve this goal, I have established three objectives, which are to exercise more, eat better, and to lower my stress. So these are many steps to achieve my goal. The strategies are how I'm going to achieve these three objectives. So to exercise more, I'm gonna jog three times a week, do yoga a couple times a week, and take the stairs. To eat better, I'm gonna make dinner at home five times a week, eat less meat, 
eat more vegetables and likewise to lower stress that yoga is also going to help me lower my stress. I'm going to spend a little bit more time with my dog. So to translate these components into um, uh, the council's world, the vision is really what does the council want U.S. Caribbean fisheries to look like in the future? Uh, the mission is really the council's mandate for management under the Magnuson Act. So, you know, what by law the council is required to do as well as for as well as its approach for achieving its vision. The goals are really the big picture focus areas. So these should describe the ultimate impact of the council's work and they are necessary to achieve the vision. And then the objectives are again, the, will be specific and observable. These are intended to describe um, results and can be directly linked to an issue or a problem. And then the strategies are just the approaches again that the council will take to meet its objectives. And so, I do just want to review the sources of information that went into uh, the development of these draft vision, mission, and goal statements. Um, so first of all, the council vision statement brainstorming session, which we had in August of 2019. The next is the stakeholder input report. So I gave you all a presentation on this in December, um, but this contained all the input from the strategic planning sessions that the district advisory panels went through last August. Um, as well as feedback from the outreach and education advisory panel and council feedback um, and issue prioritization. So we reviewed a bunch of issues in four major theme areas, which I'm gonna show in a minute and prioritize those. We also conducted management partner outreach. So this includes um, the folks at the Southeast Regional Office, the Southeast Fisheries Science Center, um, as well as the territorial management partners. And then we also had a public comment form that was on the council's website that allowed um, members of the public who may not have been able to attend one of the other DAP meetings or a council meeting, the opportunity to provide input. And then finally, um, the island-based fishery management plans and the previous public input received through that process. So the goals and objectives of the island-based fishery management plans were also part of the sources of information for this process. And these are just the four different um, stakeholder and public input discussion themes. Um, you'll recall seeing these previously. So these were focused on management and operational issues, resource health, social, cultural, and economic issues, and communication and outreach. And so this is just the structure of the, the draft strategic plan or the draft framework. Um, the, the Caribbean Council will have a just a single vision and a single mission that the council is unified under. And then underneath that vision and mission, we have four different, four different goal statement themes, again, based on those four discussion areas that I showed you on the previous slide. And those are management, ecosystem and resource health, social, cultural, and economic issues, and communication and outreach. And so for the first three of these, um, so management, ecosystem and resource health, and social, cultural, and economic issues, we will also have a series of island specific objectives for each one of those goals. So for example, the management goal will have a series of Puerto Rico specific objectives and each one of those objectives will have a series of strategies that are specific to Puerto Rico. Similarly with the other goal, the other goal areas with the exception of communication and outreach. So if you recall, this was um, an area that is something that is, is council wide and uh, the the priorities that were brought forward during um, our strategic planning sessions last year spanned all of the council's districts. So again, this is, this is how um, we are planning to set up the strategic plan so that we can most appropriately recognize the unique characteristics of each of the island districts, as well as um, address each island district's priorities. So now I'm going to get into the vision and mission statement alternatives. I'm going to start with the vision statement alternatives. And again, these really build on the concepts that came out of the vision brainstorming session that you all had in August of 2019. And some of the, the themes that came forward from that were um, sustainable and resilient fisheries, healthy ecosystems, um, cultural and social and economic benefits, as well as stakeholder and community input and support. And so you all had directed me to take um, the results of that brainstorming session and develop three to five different vision statements. So these are the three different vision statement alternatives, which are healthy island ecosystems that support sustainable and resilient local fisheries and fishing communities, thriving and resilient island ecosystems, fisheries, 
and fishing communities that provide cultural, social, and economic benefits for all, and healthy island ecosystems and sustainable, resilient fisheries that provide cultural, social, and economic benefits for all. Next, we'll review the mission statement alternatives. So again, remember the mission statement is, um, you know, the council's, reflects the council's mandate under the Magnuson Act, so what the council is required to do. So this first sentence that you see here in white up at the top of the slide, um, which reads, the Caribbean Fishery Management Council conserves, restores, and manages fishery resources in the U.S. Caribbean consistent with the requirements of the Magnuson-Stevens Act. So this is really the council's mandate, its reason for being. Um, the second sentence, which there are three different alternative here, alternatives here for you to consider, this reflects the council's approach um, to, to carrying out its mission and achieving its vision. And so again, these were... Um, based on uh, the feedback that came out of our visioning session that we had in August of last year, um, which emphasized collaboration and stakeholder input. And so those three alternatives are, the council is committed to the stewardship of these marine resources and supporting island ecosystems through collaboration and stakeholder input. The council is committed to advancing the collaborative stewardship of these fisheries and supporting island ecosystems through education, outreach and stakeholder input. And the third is the council is committed to advancing the stewardship of these fisheries and associated island ecosystems through stakeholder outreach, education and collaboration. And so next I'm going to review the different goal theme statement alternatives. And so we're going to start with the management goal alternative. And so um, so some of the common management goals across the different island-based fishery management plans were, um, you know, managing within local ecosystem limits, ensuring the continued health of fishery resources, providing for sustained community participation, uh, fostering territorial and uh, federal collaboration, you know, minimizing adverse ecosystem impacts. So these three uh, alternatives reflect those themes. The first is develop management strategies that provide for healthy, sustainable island fisheries and fishing communities and reflect local ecosystem productivity. The next is advanced management approaches that provide for healthy, sustainable fisheries, account for local ecosystem productivity and consider the needs of island fishing communities. And the third is advanced management approaches that promote healthy local fisheries and ecosystems consider the needs of island fishing communities and foster collaboration among management partners. The next set of goal statement alternatives are the ecosystem and resource health goal alternatives. So some of the common ecosystem and resource health goals across those island-based fishery management plans were uh, focused on ensuring continued provision of ecosystem services, again, managing within the limits of ecosystem production, ensuring the continued health of fishery resources. So the three alternatives here are, the first is support ecologically sustainable uses that provide for healthy, resilient marine resources and maintain island ecosystem structure and function. The next is promote sustainable utilization of local marine resources in a manner that maintains local ecological structure and function and provides for resilient fishery resources. And the third is advance ecosystem-based approaches that support healthy, resilient fishery resources and promote local ecological productivity, structure, and function. The next set of goal statement alternatives are the social, cultural, and economic goal theme area. And so um, again, common goals and objectives across the island-based FMPs were uh, focused on providing for sustained participation of communities, minimizing adverse impacts on communities, uh, promoting fair and equitable use of the resource, and recognizing differences in local environment, culture, and user groups, among other things. So these three alternatives. Um, the first is ensure that management decisions consider the unique characteristics and needs of island fishing communities while promoting fair and equitable resource use. The second is promote fair and equitable resource use while considering the social, cultural, and economic needs of island fishing communities. And the third is ensure that management decisions promote fair and equitable resource use and consider the unique social, cultural, and economic characteristics of island fishing communities. 
The next set of alternatives uh, we'll review um, are the communication and outreach goal alternatives. And so again, these, um, you know, the communication and outreach goal is something that, you know, spans the entire council jurisdiction. And um, some of the themes that came out of our strategic planning meetings with the district advisory panels and the OEAP and the council were, first of all, that more outreach is needed, um, more is always better. Uh, they were also focused on the diversity of tools to reach different audiences, um, increasing uh, public participation in the process, increasing um, educational outreach materials specifically for the general public, um, things like, uh, you know, ensuring that our communications are, are clear and understandable. So the three different communication and outreach goal alternatives are engage, in a, engage a variety of audiences through education and outreach that fosters understanding of and participation in the council process. The second is engage, educate, and inform a variety of audiences to improve public understanding and participation in the council process. And the third is foster engagement in the council process through communication and outreach that informs and educates a variety of audiences. So now I'm going to quickly review the draft island specific management objectives. And so I, again, these were developed based on um, the island based FMP objectives, as well as the feedback from the district advisory panels during the strategic planning sessions that we had last summer. And I do want to note, you know, these have been reviewed by the, the DAPs. They did that at the very end of March and provided feedback on these island specific management objectives. Um, and they also reviewed uh, a set of potential strategies for each one of those. And the DAPs are going to be meeting again in June to provide additional input with respect to, to strategies under these objectives. Um, and so before I actually get into those, I do want to offer a few general observations. So, you know, within each theme, there are significant overlaps in the priority issues that were identified by the DAPs and the council. And so this results in very similar and often identical island specific objectives. You know, and this is not very different from um, the island based FMPs. There is a lot of overlap in the goals and objectives among uh, each of the three districts and some of the some of the islands actually have exactly the same objectives within their FMPs. Um, the next is that a lot of the priority issues that the DAPs um, and the council discussed are really more appropriately addressed as island specific strategies or as activities as part of an implementation plan and that will be sort of the final product of this process um, is an implementation plan for next year. And so I just want to make sure that, you know, everyone understands that ultimately all U.S. Caribbean island districts are working towards the same broad goals. So these are just, I'm not going to read these the way that I read the different alternatives for the, um, for the, the vision and mission and goal statement themes. Um, I just want to note that, you know, these are the draft Puerto Rico management objectives. Um, you are going to see that the ones for St. Thomas, St. John, as well as St. Croix, um, are very similar and in some instances identical. And I'm just gonna highlight some of the commonalities that, um, that were identified during, the, uh, during our planning sessions, which were you know, themes of accurate and timely commercial and recreational data collection, um, enforcement of, in, of existing regulations, um, fisher involvement in data collection, uh, territorial licensing requirements, um, incorporation of climate change, uh, balancing commercial and recreational concerns, and things like that. And so each one of um, each one of the, the DAPs had a slightly um, had slightly different takes on that with respect to potential strategies. But you know, you will see that uh, these four objectives reflect you know, accurate and timely data collection programs, promotion of collaborative research and fisher involvement in meeting our science and information needs, you know, ensuring that management measures encourage regulatory compliance. And then collaboration with uh, both domestic and international partners on, on the management approach and ensuring that those management approaches are efficient. And so very similar for St. Thomas, St. John. Um, in fact, those first four are exactly alike. The one thing that was also um, identified as a priority by the St. Thomas, St. John DAP was climate change. And so there's an additional objective here um, considering the potential impacts of climate change. 
And then finally, the St. Croix draft management objectives. Again, these are identical to those first four that you saw um, for Puerto Rico, again, due to the fact that all of the DAPs had um, significant overlap in the development, or excuse me, in the identification of priority issues. So the next set are ecosystem and resource health objectives. And um, so again, there was a lot of commonality in the priorities that were identified across uh, by the, the different DAPs. So these included a suite of issues related to erosion and sedimentation, um, coastal development, uh, different forms of pollution, um, habitat loss and destruction, as well as habitat creation and rehabilitation, um, a lack of biological and ecosystem information, um, as well as illegal fishing and climate change. And so these four um, draft objectives um, are, are meant to incorporate those, but also the significant amount of work that the council has been doing over the past couple of years with respect to the development of your fishery ecosystem plan, which is sort of you know, the framework that you're using to implement your island-based FMP. So that's what this first objective is about, is to really implement um, what's being incorporated into that plan. The second objective is focused on, you know, identifying and managing and protecting uh, the habitat resources. The third is about collaborating with management partners uh, to address the impacts of natural disasters. This is something that was specifically identified by the Puerto Rico DAP. And then collaborating with management partners to address enforcement concerns that can affect ecological relationships. And similarly for St. Thomas, St. John, again, we have an objective that's focused on implementation of the fishery ecosystem plan, you know, specifically as it relates to the St. Thomas, St. John ecosystem. Again, an objective about habitat, um, rehabilitation and uh, restoration of fishery resources, collaboration with management partners, again, to address those enforcement concerns that can impact ecological relationships. And then a final one, collaborating with science partners to identify and address ecological data and information gaps. Um, and again, these are the St. Croix draft ecosystem and resource health objectives, very similar to the last two sets that you saw because of the overlap that has been identified. So we have an objective on the fishery ecosystem plan, an objective pertaining to habitats, an objective pertaining to um, rehabilitation and or creation of fishery resource habitats to support that ecosystem structure and function, collaboration with management partners to address enforcement, and then also um, ensuring that approaches, uh, that ecosystem approaches are responsive to climate change. Finally, we get to the draft social, cultural, and economic objectives. And so um, with respect to those, again, some of the overlaps, the issue overlaps were pretty significant here. So one of the things that all, all uh, three of the DAPs in the council identified were things like closed seasons and stock assessments for expect, affected species. And this was something that actually affects um, or is incorporated into uh, objectives that, uh, that cross all of the different goal theme areas. Um, illegal and unlicensed commercial fishers, lack of social and economic data, um, uh, things such as infrastructure needs that you know, impact the um, social and, uh, and economic ability or success of fishing communities, um, the impacts of inadequate enforcement on social and, and um, economic well being in these communities. And so these four draft objectives that you see here for Puerto Rico, again, you're going to see similarities for St. Thomas, St. John, as well as St. Croix. But the first is focus on promoting the collection of that social and economic data that's needed to make decisions. Um, the second is focused on evaluating you know, the social and economic impacts of management decisions across different user groups. The third is focused on uh, promoting efforts that will support social and economic opportunity and stability. And then the final one is focused on those impacts of enforcement that everybody identified. Um, and again, these are uh, very similar, uh, identical, in fact, uh, for St. Thomas, St. John. And then for St. Croix, um, Saint, the St. Croix DAP offered a few uh, um, edits to these draft objectives. So these are, these are incorporated here, but still focus, uh, the first objective focused on the collection and dissemination 
of that social and economic data that informs management decisions and the next evaluating the impacts of management decisions. And then the third, really considering the impacts um, uh, of you know, not just enforcement, but non-regulation um, and illegal fishing that was identified by the DAP. And then finally, we get to the draft communication and outreach objectives. And so, you know, there are three major areas um, that emerge from the discussions in under this theme area. And the first was really focused on, on tools. Um, the second was focused on participation. And, you know, the third was really focused on understanding and awareness. So, you know, this first objective is use a variety of communication tools that consider um, the social, cultural, and economic characteristics of target audiences um, in coordination with the Outreach and Education Advisory Panel. The next was to promote participation of a variety of stakeholders in the council's process. And then the third is improve public and stakeholder understanding and awareness uh, of fisheries management current issues in the council process. And so just the next steps um, in this process are as I mentioned earlier, the district advisory panels are gonna be convening in June to review the potential strategies for island specific objectives within each theme. We sort of had a, we had an initial cut at that uh, at the end of March, um, but we, we felt it was important for the DAPs to have an opportunity to really thoroughly review those and refine them. Um, also OEAP review of the communication and outreach strategies and then um, after that is incorporated, we'll have a complete draft of the strategic plan. And as Miguel mentioned at the beginning of this meeting, um, the council will approve this draft of the strategic plan for public review and feedback um, in July. And once we get comments back, we'll review, I'll present that public input to you all um, and provide any changes that have been suggested as a result of that input. And then we'll have approval of the final strategic plan. Um, so we're coming to the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and then one final component is development and approval of an implementation plan. So this, an implementation plan really takes those strategies and objectives and translate those into ac actions um, specific to the upcoming year. So with that, Mr. Chairman, um, I think what, uh, as I indicated at the beginning of the presentation, the council action that is needed is really selection of a draft vision statement, mission statement, and goal statement alternatives for each one of those goals. And then um, we're just recommending that you approve the island specific uh, uh, objectives under each one of those themes since they've already been reviewed by the DAPs and will under, undergo uh, further review in um, the upcoming months. So I'm happy to, I'm happy to take any questions. Yes, uh, any questions uh, to Michelle? Uh, I have a observation to you, depending on the question, how this go, uh, do you have any strategy, how we can move this uh, on an effective way during this meeting, depend on, what, on the comments we receive? Yes, yeah, so, um... My suggestion is that we take these one at a time. So up here on the screen, I have the vision statement alternatives. And so I think, um, and I will also, you know, defer to advice from Miguel as well. But I think if the council can select one of these three alternatives and come to some consensus for approval of that, I can identify that. We can do the same thing for the mission statement in each one of those four goal area statements. And then, Mr. Chairman, if a motion is needed, I do have, um, we can just slip the alternative number into some text that I have developed that I could uh, quickly email to Leah High that could be displayed on the screen. Any comments from the council members? Anybody else would like to make a comment? Uh, Marcos? <clears throat> yes. We are nine minutes to three. So I suggest that we go one by one and rather than having a motion for each one of them, we pick one, the one that, that we like. And if you like it, then by silence, you approve it. And then on the 21st, we will have a chance to go over this again. We will have a meeting in June with the DAPs. Michelle will be able to fine tune everything that, that is needed to be uh, added or changed or whatever. So you have ample, ample opportunity on 
uh, July 21st to go through the whole document. But at this time, if you look at the mission, vision statement, I remember vision is where you want to go. The goal is where you are now. And then the objective is what you're going to do to achieve your goal. So here you have, uh, and these are, they look like motherhood and apple pie, but they are not. And they're a little bit changed. Uh, they're sort of changes, but they're important changes. So if you look at the vision statement, then you have uh, the third alternative will be healthy island ecosystem that supports sustainable and receiving local fishing and fishing communities. But you also have, in the case of the second alternative, thriving and resilient island ecosystem, fisheries and fishing communities that provide cultural, social, and economic benefits for all. Island ecosystem and sustainable resilient fisheries that provide cultural, social, and economic benefit for all. One is a little bit different from the other, but I believe that number, the one in the middle, uh, goes in tune with what the island-based FMP uh, essence is, which is addressing each area by itself. And then I believe that this vision statement uh, encompassing all that we have been discussing because you want resiliency in each one of the island ecosystem. You want that fishery to be thriving and, and be resilient. And you want the fishing communities that provide the cultural, social, and economic benefit for, for all also thriving and resilient. Uh, so it goes more into the specific of what you have been saying all along the last 10 years. So my personal vote would be for the one in the middle but it's up to you really which one you like. Yes, I think I share with Miguel that the, the mid one is the most complete and, and describe why we are sitting on this, on the council. And uh, my, I would like to hear the, from the rest of the, uh, from the council members, maybe to move along on this one, if you guys agree. Any comments against it or if you? Mr. Chairman, I see in the chat that Damaris uh, has said agree. Yeah. Anybody else want to say something? Tony Blanchard, Tony Blanchard for the record. I would agree with Miguel and Marcos because I think this is the one that covers basically what we have been saying and looking for. So I will support number two or the one in the middle, however, however you would like to put it. Okay. The, the one in the middle or the second one on the list is that look like is the consensus from the people. Anybody in opposition to choose this one? Hearing none, that's the one. Okay, it's if five there a to motion? three. No, you don't need a motion. Just go, just go with it. So, but the overwhelming silence, I believe that everybody agree with it. And we have heard from Damaris on the chat. Tony, well, well stated. And we move to the second one, to the other one. We have, I believe, chance for one more. Okay. So this <clears throat> go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, sorry, Miguel, I was just going to say, so again, um, you know, the mission is really your reason for existence and uh, what, what the council's mandate is. So that's what that first sentence reflects. So that's the first sentence of uh, your mission statement. It's really the second sentence that represents the council's approach. That's what you're focusing on right here in these three alternatives. Sorry, Miguel, go ahead. Sorry about the plan. No, 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 that's okay. It just, but anyway, here, here we, we we need to select one of those of these three, and again, if, if you look at it, uh, please consider it based on what you decided to be your mission statement. So, rather than me picking one, I would like to, for example, hear Marcos what you think, and then follow by the others. And at three, we break for the listening session. What I'm, from what I'm, I'm, I'm really between the first and the second. I, I feel like the second is a little more inclusive and complete. I will say the second one is the one that we should, I, I will pick. Uh, anybody else? I'm just only that, I'm in agreement with Marcos. I think the second one 
is probably the best alternative or the best statement. Anybody else want to comment or are in opposition to it? Uh, I see Damara says in the chat, um, any of the three, so she seems to be in agreement. Well, look like it's the same case. We stay with that mid one, the second one on the list. Yeah. Okay. So Mr. And Chairman, I, I believe that we should break here mm -hmm. and then ask Dr. Duval, how many other uh, decisions we need from the council so when we break at four o'clock, we can come back to them. Um, thank you. Thank you, Miguel. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we just need four more management, um, ecosystem and resource health, uh, social, cultural and economic issues, and then communication and outreach selection of those goal statements. Um, I think, you know, because the district advisory panels have already reviewed the island specific objectives um, and because we plan to reach out to the outreach and education advisory panel on the objectives as well uh, you know that 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 input funnels up to the council so if there's no object if there is no objection to any of the um, island specific objectives we can leave those for when we have you know the the complete plan and just four more selections um, after the listening session okay mr chairman Yes, I think we, we that's it sounds like a plan. Let's do that. Miguel, the proceed the process now to to we're gonna share pass the the screen okay, to at, at, at three o'clock chart we are and, and let me thank Michelle for understanding and offering the, the alternatives to continue after four o'clock. Uh, I believe that uh, we are ready uh, for at three o'clock for the listening session that will be chaired by uh, Sam Rauch. Uh, he'll be uh, leading this meeting. He just entered the, the meeting. So Marcos, can you introduce uh, the attorney Rauch for the group? Yes, uh, he's connected already. Yes. Yes. Uh, I'd like to introduce and pass the meeting, the, uh, the running of this meeting for Sam Rauch for our, uh, the listening section uh, of President Biden's EO title, The Climate Crisis at the Home, home and Abroad. Uh, Sam? Yes, Mr. Chairman, can you uh, hear me okay? Yes, I can. We can hear you. All right, and I do believe that uh, I had a presentation. I'm not sure whether somebody can load that up or not. I can go without it if I need to. Well, let me just go ahead and go on. Um, thank you very much for having me uh, here to discuss the recent executive order. On one of his first days in office, President Biden issued executive order 14008 titled Tackling the Climate Crisis at Home and Abroad. It is quite lengthy. It has a number of sections dealing with a wide variety of subjects, wind, oil and gas, and other issues. One of those sections is section 216, which itself has a number of sub uh, provisions, and I'll talk about a few of them. The one in particular that we wanted to talk about is 216C. And that one, and I will read it. Uh, I thought I would have a slide that would say it, but I'm going to read it, and I apologize for reading it verbatim. But it requires NOAA to initiate efforts in the first 60 days from the date of this order to collect input from fishermen, regional ocean councils, fishery management councils, scientists, and other stakeholders on how to make fisheries and protected resources more resilient to climate change, including changes in management and conservation measures and improvements in science monitoring and cooperative research. Um, and so that's what we're doing here today. I am, for those of you who are not familiar with me, I am the deputy director of the National Fisheries Service. Uh, I oversee the regional offices and the headquarters offices. And on behalf of the whole administration, I'm formally asking for the council's input and advice on how to make fisheries and protect resources more resilient to climate change, including changes in management, conservation measures, and improvement in science monitoring and cooperative research. 
And I will say this knowing full well that this is not something that is new to the councils. The councils in general manage with an eye towards ecosystem resiliency to trying to ensure that we can provide a stable source of marine seafood and recreational opportunities uh, year after year, despite the various environmental perturbations that may occur. Um, we constantly design our conservation and management measures to look at things like that. And the councils have been looking at climate change as one of those changing variables and trying to fig figure out how that works into management such that we can continue to provide the resources that we do and make sure that the protected resources are not adversely impacted as we do that. So the councils have a long role, and I think the president recognized that when explicitly he indicated the councils should provide advice on this subject. We know that climate-related changes are affecting our ecosystems in various ways, whether we're talking about warming oceans, increasing acidification, rising seas. That affects not only the resource um, in that you may have stocks that are adversely affected, so they may not be as healthy as a population, or they may just move following a temperature gradient or an acidity gradient, um, or the fishing communities themselves, which are often on the coastline. We could see uh, significant impacts to those as uh, sea level rise uh, affects that and affects our, the coastal estuarine areas that are important for um, productivity. So this is something that councils deal with quite substantially across the country. I know this is something this council has also dealt with. Um, but we're asking for your input here as required by the executive order. Um, and we do look forward to getting your comments and, and expertise on this issue about things either that you're currently doing or things that you believe we could be doing better, both we uh, as the federal government or you clearly with your strong role in management, developing management and conservation measures and in providing uh, stakeholder outreach and initiatives to get input from the fishing community. So we'd like your thoughts on those things. Uh, it is not just, although you clearly are, you yourselves is, are a Magnus and Stevens Act body, it's not just related to that. To the extent that you have views on how we could uh, use other authorities, the Endangered Species Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Sanctuaries Act, the Coastal Zone Management Act, others, all of that is subject to input. We would like your feedback on that. The president did not lay out explicitly what we are supposed to do. The executive order just indicates we are supposed to start the process of collecting information, and we're doing that. Did not indicate explicitly how we are supposed to use that information, but we will use it as, uh, you know, as we and you take actions over the course of the next year or more to inform rulemaking, policy making, uh, resource planning that we may do in terms of how we allocate resources here or there, Specifically, we are looking at the next series of our regional action plans that we've developed under the NOAA Fisheries Climate Science Strategy, and we will clearly take input into that. Um, I have been giving this presentation to a number of councils and a couple of other things that come up before I take public comment. One is um, we recognize that the councils do not meet in constant session. And so uh, if you give us input today, we will very much take that. If you give us input later, we will also take that. This is not a one and done kind of approach. We are interested, much like the councils themselves, you're constantly looking at your policies and strategies and tweaking them, making them better. We're interested in doing the same thing. So if you're not able to provide full comments today, but wanted to take time over a meeting or two, that would be all right as well. We did have a public comment period that ran through the beginning of April uh, for the members of the public who uh, wanted to provide independent of the council process. Um, that is, that has been concluded. We did get some valuable input from that, uh, and we look forward to adding the council's views to that as well. One last thing I want to talk about, um, because this always comes up, which is the other part of 216, 216A. So we've been talking about 216C, which is the one that explicitly members, mentions the council and is a requirement on NOAA. 216A is a requirement on the Interior Department to prepare a report on how we might conserve 30% of the U.S. land and waters by 2030. 
The executive order does not define conserve. It doesn't use the word protect. It means conserve. And it does not say that we are going to conserve anything tomorrow. Uh, but it is a report that the Interior Department has been working on. And I imagine, I have not seen the report, but I imagine that the report, when it comes out, and it is due any day now, uh, at least to the White House, um, would, rather than outline specific areas, which says, conserve this area, conserve that area. I imagine that it will lay out a process for which you would evaluate how much of the, the ocean is currently being conserved, what that metric actually would look like. That metric is not defined. So we do not currently know what is the definition of conservation, how much of the ocean or land is being conserved. And then what would be the process for stakeholder engagement in deciding if we are below 30% how you would get to 30%. So this is an interior related effort. The report is due imminently to the White House, but interior is still taking comments on that. And I envision that one, even once the report comes out, there will be a, a public um, process for gaining further input into some of those questions. Any questions, any comments that you give us now under 216A, we will forward to the interior department we're taken into consideration to the extent that the administration uh, develops a process going forward for stakeholder engagement. So that was quite a number of things, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I do apologize. I thought that I would have a brief PowerPoint, but that's fine. Um, uh, I'm happy to take any questions or comments that the council may have on that issue. Thank you very much, uh, council members. Any of you would like to comment? Marcos, I, I if, I, if I may. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> the uh, first, thank you uh, to Sam Rock for the uh, opening the meeting and the presentation. Uh, the first part is 216C, which is comments on how we can uh, make uh, climate change, uh, the fishery resilience to climate change and protective resources. How, how do we need to change any management scheme that we have, conservation measures, how we can improve or should improve science, monitoring and cooperative research for the things that we have. Uh, my, my proposal is, and taking in consideration what, what uh, Sam uh, just said, uh, I suggest that we can put together a little committee uh, maybe staff and the chair and put together a letter, draft letter, uh, taking into consideration uh, the comments that we have received and the comments that we might receive today. So we can send it to, to some office for consideration. Regarding aid, which is mostly the one that people are more concerned about, uh, aid is really for the Department of Interior as stated today. However, we can put together also a letter addressing that. Other councils have done so. And for example, there's an issue about what is the meaning of conservation? Because for us, conservation is anything that you do under the Manuson Act to manage the fishery on a sustainable basis. For other conservation is don't take it, don't touch it. This is close to any activity that will, that will cause any harm to the fishes and the habitat that we have here. And that's more or less the two issues that have been addressed by letters that I have, that we have seen. So for conservation, we would like to stress the point that conservation under management, uh, under Manuson Stevens Act is taken into consideration all the time for the last 40 years. And we consider that around 72% of the fishery of the United States are under some sort of conservation uh, management uh, scheme uh, or management uh, regime rather. Uh, where we protect uh, the resources, protecting the habitat and so forth. And regarding my, uh, alternative A, by coincidence, you just saw the heard the presentation and saw the presentation by Dr. Bertrand this morning, where she found that 27% of the areas within the area jurisdiction of Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands are already closed uh, for some reason or another. The National Fisheries Service is consider area closure for fishery purposes, but those are not considered by the Department of Interior uh, 
for the IUCN for, for, the, for that matter, just for discussion. And just, just to make a point, we don't follow I, IUCN. We follow MS, MSA and the other applicable laws of the United States. However, those laws sometimes uh, mimic what the IOCN and other organiz inter international organizations do. So this time, Mr. Chairman, what we'd like to hear is uh, we have one hour until, until four o'clock. Any comment that the group present here, uh, council member, chairs of the DAPs, et cetera, uh, may have to provide to Sam at this time regarding climate change and how we should be moving toward the management and conservation and moving to the conservation measures that we have for improvement of the science monitoring and uh, cooperative research that we have. Uh, today we heard that, that we need to address those for other reasons. So this is the time for the group to talk. Yeah, we have Nelson online, Miguel. Nelson Crespo. Nelson Crespo is the chair of the DAP Puerto Rico. Uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to read a letter that I have here and I want some indications where to send my comments. Uh, and I hope to contribute something with my comments. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nelson Crespo. I am a commercial fisherman. And in one way or another, I have been involved in the management and protection of our fishing resources for many years. These are my comments and suggestions to the President Biden's Executive Order 14008. On Section 216C, how to make fisheries and protected resources more resilient to climate change. As a commercial fisherman for more than 40 years that had witnessed the changes in our coast, I understand that the greatest negative impact on our waters and resources in relation to climate change come from the land to the sea. Coastal development and erosion, river runoff and unprocessed water discharge to the sea are a few issues that should be addressed urgently to make habitats and marine ecosystem strong and to afford climate changes. This factor greatly affects our waters which consequently affect the entire marine ecosystem in the US Caribbean. Develop and implement among the fishing community the use of new effective fishing techniques and promote in the market the consumption of lower demand species would greatly help to reduce fishing pressure from other species with higher demand. Finally, the allocation of the necessary resources to implement effective enforcement in the management plan would be a great help to achieve the proposed goal. On section 216A, conserving at least 30% of our land and waters by 2030, the US Caribbean cannot take any more closures. Despite it is a small size have many closest areas in addition to the management plans under the Magnuson law. The Caribbean, by its location, has the great advantage to protecting their waters in a natural way. I mean, in winter, we face cold fronts with high pressure system that bring strong winds and high swells. In summer, we are subject to tropical wave and storms and hurricanes. In addition, we are facing periods of strong currents through the year. The combination of all the factors, we call them natural closures. In my opinion, the integration of coastal communities in the existing management plan, expand collaboration with the scientific community and the allocation of the necessary resources to implement a program of cost and education management and enforcement will help to complement the health of our resources. Thank you very much. Th thank you, Nelson. Sam, do you want to, co to make any comment or we'll go for the next comment? Uh, well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I 
I'm happy to uh, have a discussion if you would like. I think that those are very good comments in terms of particularly the importance of climate change and how the council may or may not suggest we deal with them. Um, I would be interested in, uh, in terms of getting them to us, accumulating those councils. I mean, any comments that the council wishes to forward, um, the, the public comment is closed, but we are happy to take comments from the council, including those comments as well. So if, if the council wanted to gather that, that written letter or other comments and send them to us, we would accept those. Yes, we, uh, I would like to, to propose to the council to create this committee, to create the letter that was proposed by Miguel and to streamline and to make, uh, to produce a letter that have a little more elaborate idea behind it and that can, that can be helpful for the whole process that is taking place. Uh, all the council members agree with that? Hear, hearing no objection. Uh, this is Marcos, what, me, Marcos, go ahead, Miguel. But also for the record, we need to hear from the voices of the council because I can write a letter myself right now, but if, if, if I don't have any support from the council, it doesn't do anything because I'm just a staff member. Wait, what Sam is proposing is that we address a letter to him, uh, you, or your signature, and then uh, incorporate Nelson's comments, and maybe an attachment to that letter, and any other comments that the rest of the council may have. In addition, the committee should be very small and with a due date, so no more than three weeks from now, that letter should be in the hands of, of Sam at the office in Washington. And our proposal for our committee will be chair and the two local government designees. And the letter should be uh, circulated among all the chairs of the DAPs, SSC, et cetera. So we will have their input uh, ready for the final uh, drafting of, of that letter. Yes, Miguel, I was just following up on that idea and uh, I want to ask one, one more time to the to the council members if they, they have anything else to add. Otherwise, I have something to say. In the meantime, with the people are thinking, uh, I want to... I just... Hello? Yeah, Tony? just Tony. Go yeah, ahead, Tony. I, I got a comment. I, and, and this is for basically because I we are having information the council has and the local government. Sorry, we have problems with your audio. You have to to probably leave the room and come back again. For a better audio, we cannot. We cannot. We can. We cannot hear you very well. Go ahead. Okay. Right now. In the meantime, I want to comment. That okay, let me, You could hear me now. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. This is this is my my take on the whole thing of climate change. We all know that. Climate change is not a, a simple a simple fix, but I believe in giving responsibility back to the people who hold the uh, let's say who's responsible for taking care of certain things. I am on the same page as Nelson. When We, we, can, we cannot hear you. Uh, Which I don't know how much the council's input could do anything about it, but. Hello? Yes. All right, we uh, switched off and come out. It, it was very broken. Uh, we couldn't hear it very well. Sign off and come we... back on. Okay. And then, on the meantime, I want to say that Damaris Delgado just uh, put on the chat her intention to participate on this special committee because the DNR, local government DNR have projects and things running around the, the issue of climate change. I want that to be on record. And uh, uh, 
in the meantime, Tony, come back. I would like to, to say something in terms of comments for the section 216C. I think supporting the local researchers and local fishermen by creating a program or a committee or a system uh, like a national adapt adaptative and sustainable fishery program that address the way we do the research, the way we conduct the fishing and the way we can adapt based on, uh, on science, that will be something desirable for everybody uh, for, to take the decisions from the, from the right direction. Ideally for the Caribbean, especially in the case of the Caribbean, we have very peculiar situations in terms of habitat, in terms of sociocultural aspects and so on and resources that the local feedback from the fishermen, fishing community, stakeholders and local researchers especially are very important on this process. And uh, on, that re on this regard, I send a letter uh, addressing with a little more elaborate thought uh, a few weeks ago. And, uh, I, and also I send a, uh, some comments on the section 216A, uh, which is a question. Do you want to hear that now? Uh, or I just leave as a letter, uh, personal letter, or you want to include that on the council discussion, Sam? Uh, well, that's up to the council, Mr. Chairman. If the council would like to include uh, your thoughts or any thoughts in that letter, as I said, we're only specifically here talking about 216C, but if you would like to give us comments on 216A, we will take them, circulate them to Interior as appropriate, or if there is a future collaborative role, and I imagine there will be, we'll take those into consideration. So if the council would like to do that, I, we, we will uh, accept those comments on 216A and get them to the right uh, agency, whether that's us or somebody else. Okay. Then, uh, Tony, Michael's are you ready? Tony. Tony's not ready. I'm gonna take the time to do it then. Uh, section 216A, to include all managed manage areas on the analysis of, uh, because one side don't fit all for all regions. Uh, include all the analysis uh, uh, on the analysis areas closed by special management, especially the ones that are created with extensive public input over the years, like MSA managed areas. There is no point to arbitrarily close more areas just to meet a potentially arbitrary 30% of land and water and water closure, knowing that all the areas are not the same or include the same habitats or resources. Appropriate management while appropriate management while respecting the expertise of each federal and local agency is at minimum appropriate. The U.S. Caribbean has already a major percent uh, percentage of its fishable grounds and areas closed or fully managed by different agencies. Any decision must be based on science and the so and social economic effect of its creation. Solution, add more and new resources to research and enforcement to US region, especially the Caribbean. This will reserve, result in a great benefit to the natural resources and stakeholders. I invite to consider multi multinational effort to protect and manage natural natural resources, especially on species or issues that Caribbean wide, that is Caribbean wide. This will, this will be more desirable and will result in a greater environmental benefit. The US cannot fix or, or the mispractice of other nations or countries, but we can manage our, our resources using science always recognizing the U.S. and local, free, local communities and fishermen are responsible stewards of the sea. That's my comment. Marcos, to whom do you address your letter? I, I send the letter via email and I want to share with my, my, my partners on the council. And the uh, email was, I'll let you know now where I send it oceanresources.climate at noaa.gov. I receive a, res 
uh, I know that uh, was received because they, I received a, like a receipt, you know, of yes. that my, my comment was received. This is what Mr. I have to share with the council. Mr. Chairman, if I may, that was the public uh, website that we uh, opened to accept comments from the public uh, during the comment period, which I mentioned was going to April 2nd. So you sent it through that public portal. We received that and that is in the record already. I'm happy to receive that again through the council, but just to know that they, we did receive that through the public comment process. For me as a, as a chairman, I would like to receive comments or observations from my partners on the council to see if they share the things that Nelson and myself have been expressed today or anything new, uh, just to give clarity that we are all on the same page which is what we are looking for on this message that you take from us. Anybody else? I'd like to hear from Carlos Farchete if he, he can help us. Sure, Mr. Chair. I, I agree with what you and Nelson have already proposed in, in your comments. And I do believe that those two comments should be incorporated in that uh, small ad hoc committee that uh, staff is going to form with um, Miguel and you and Graciela and, and whoever else they put in there, or the, or the two government representatives. So I, I do agree. Thank you. Anybody else? I would like to hear from Tony because he wasn't cutting off and I don't want to miss his what he have to say. This is Tony Blanchard. <laughs> Something has is still a problem with the audio. I am in full agreement, Emmy. I have a problem with the audio. Why? Yeah, uh, Tony, uh, we cannot hear you very well. I just heard Can you the hear most me? important part. We're we are, we are hearing you now. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I am in agreement with. with uh, Nelson and the sound of it, Marcos is on the same line. I believe that the government, the local government has a part to play and a big part to play in this. I believe agencies need to step up to the plate and take their responsibility and do the job as for we, uh, waste management, as for DPNR when it comes to runoff and certain other things that needs to be addressed. I think some of the problems are fixable. I think we have more than enough rules and regs and the books that if it was to be enforced, we would take up some of this mess that we are in and clear it up. But I don't know how much leverage the council actually has in this in doing so, in making a local government uphold to what they need to do. So just like Nelson said, this starts from the ridge to the reef. We could try fix the reef all we want, but if we don't straighten out the problems on land that goes into the sea, we're fighting a losing battle here. And that's the reality of it. I don't know. I mean, it would be like trying to plug a hole in a dike. You could even only plug that dike so long before it blow. So unless we fix these problems from the shoreline, we can't fix the problems on the sea. And that's my comment. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I have a, a, in the chat, I have from the Maris Delgado that climate change is a priority for the Puerto Rico DNR, the Natural Resources Department. So she'd be in charge. I believe that uh, the three people who have spoken, uh, Tony, you, and Nelson, are more or less in agreement. So it's a matter of drafting uh, a letter containing those paragraphs and put it together so everybody will have a chance to see it before we send it to the appropriate office. And I believe that we can send it to Sam Brown with a copy to Andy Strzok, who is a regional administrator. And we should do that as soon as we can. So I propose that if that committee, if everybody agree with the committee, we can draft the letter, let's say by next week. And the following week, we circulate the letter, so we have we, we send it on time. The reason for that is that although the 
the interpretation by National Marine Fisheries Service was that we have 60 days to start the process. And some people thought 60 days to submit all the documents until uh, uh, April the 2nd. So we are on time to submit that, that information. Uh, Marcos, do we need to, I mean, do we have anybody else that, um, Vanessa, uh, Damaris herself, Angeli, that wants to address, yes. especially Nicole Angeli, who's going to be a member of the committee. Yeah, I, I just have a text uh, on the shop, turn to speak to Nicole Angeli. Uh, thank you so much for bringing up this important issue and for having the listening session. I'm excited to be on the committee. I was also on the committee for the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies in the letter that they created. And I just wanted to read into the record, not the specific goals, but the general principles that we've agreed on um, as directors um, across the country that I believe may help guide any discussion. The first is cooperation early and often that state agencies, along with the federal agencies, have the primary responsibility and authority for conservation of fish and wildlife and their habitats and uses. The second is to clearly define purpose and intent. There is very considerable concern for definitional presuppositions. So what is protection versus conservation? What is sustainable use? What is regulated hunting and fishing and trapping? Clear definitions will help us to sustainably use our resources and not affect the livelihoods of communities, especially disadvantaged communities. Um, that third, a one size approach should not drive policies or actions, much like we have our island based fisheries management plans. Um, individual states and jurisdictions should be recognized for their individuality um, in any legal criteria. Fourth, that science-based collaborations should drive policies and actions. State agencies have a long history of conserving natural, res natural resources, uh, restoring natural resources, managing and regulating natural resources uh, with scientists. And so any policies should recognize that demonstrable track record of our jurisdictions. Fifth, that we should use our existing regional partnerships. I would recommend that our regional fisheries councils are included in any, uh, in any landscape conservation goals because they, affect multiple jurisdictions and provide the appropriate scale for collaboration and conservation of fisheries. That we establish collaborative and transparent processes. The processes, the goals and successes of the 30 by 30 will hinge on whether or not we take everyone's viewpoint, perspective and facts into account. Robust stakeholder processes like the CFMC include fishers, anglers, outdoor enthusiasts, private landowners, our scientists, our state agencies, our federal agencies, conservation organizations, advocacy organizations. That's the only way we'll have a, a true partnership. Um, the last, um, we have something in our states called species of greatest conservation need. Many of our fish are on those lists and that we have proactive and voluntary conservation of those species of greatest conservation need that include incentives. Incentives will be necessary to implement existing plans by our state agencies, as well as funding. Unfunded mandates are not useful. Um, and that we focus on tools. Conservation measures and frameworks are just that. Rather, we need tools that are tied to outcomes for habitat and ecosystem functions. Land protection, water protection is just one tool and should not be considered the only tool. There are permanent conservation mechanisms, semi-permanent conservation mechanisms, including leasing, following, things that have sunset clauses. Those collaborative management based on state, tribal, regional, community-based, science-driven and input-driven approaches 
will allow us to conserve habitat and ecosystem function. Um, and I think this is maybe my favorite, that there are opportunities ahead. The 30 by 30 conservation framework, rather than being a punitive loss of space or use, should prioritize intact high quality habitats and communities and their uses, especially when those uses are vulnerable to loss, fragmentation, degradation. We should be considering connect connectivity of those landscapes and waters to enhance the resilience of fish to climate variability. This will allow us to fish into the future. Um, so I hope some of these points we may include in our letter um, so that we may allow sustainable use of fish to provide food, to provide jobs, to provide economic sustainability for our region. Thank you very much. You complement uh, all the previous comments in, uh, in some new and some more elaborate, which is great. Uh, we have Julian. Marcos, before Julian, um, Nicole, can you send us an email with that letter so we can use it for the draft letter that we are going to prepare for the committee? Yes, of course. Thank you. Julian? Yeah, Julian McGrath, um, for the record, DAP Chair of St. Thomas, St. John. And uh, I, I'm thankful for this great opportunity for us to get our points across. You know, I totally agree with my um, counterpart, Nelson and Marco Tenki as both fishermen and their great concerns of actually what's been taking place um, for all these years actually from on the land that ends up in the ocean where we suffer on a regular basis. What, what I see is taking place here is very, very similar to what have, has been identified in the making of the eco-based management plans where in our case, we have identified 13 top issues that are affecting our ecosystem. And uh, you know, there's so many plans in place to try to protect the ecosystems already, but they're not being followed. And most importantly, they're not being enforced. Enforcement is a big issue, and we continue to turn the blind side to enforcing the people who have been breaking the laws that are affecting the fisheries. The only one that seemed to be affected 99.9% .9 of the time are the fishermen. Back in 2004, 2005, we did a 30% reduction through the Sustainable Fisheries Act to protect the fisheries. And here again, we are looking at another 30%, which I, I, I can't see us taking any more closures or any more rules and regs. I think, I think what needs to come out um, from this executive order is um, from the higher level, Sam Rauch and above, is how do we get the local government to actually do their job and correct the issues at hand. You know, coastal runoff, the sewage being dumped directly into the ocean, you know, and this is raw sewage. Don't even have to talk about oil. You know, we have some, uh, we have the Bennett Bay area where the, the levels of toxins are so high. You know, if we start by picking a few of these areas and correcting them, you know, that would be more than a 30% reduction instead of maybe looking at new areas to um, protect. You know, we have St. John where we have the national park, which they have, they own most of the land there. I would say it could be incorrect, but I say 50% or more. And we also have the Coral Reef Monument. So I, I think there are a lot of measures out there already and, and somehow um, the, high, the, the, the higher powers that be need to find a way to enforce, enforce and get these people to do their jobs and 
you know, don't leave it come down where it's going to affect the commercial fishers, the recreational fishers. And, you know, we are, we are a socio economic community. So, um, you know, I want to put that out there. And, and this committee that's being formed, you know, with the, the local um, entities from both areas and um, Mr. Chair Henke, I, I don't know if it's possible to include the DAP chairs on this committee. Yes or no, um, I leave that to uh, Miguel and, and the team. But um, those are my comments. Thank you. Uh, to that point, Mr. Chairman. Yes. The committee, is, is, the committee is to draft the letter. But all the chairs will have a chance to look at the letter and make comments. The reason we have a, a small group is to be able to, to write it so everybody will have a chance to see it. So all the chairs will be able to look at the draft letter, make comments, add delete. And once we receive the input from everybody, we will go ahead and send the letter to the appropriate, uh, in this case, will be not no fisheries. But let's, you know, <clears throat> be sure that you are gonna be contacted. Yeah, correct. For this it's it's a very inclusive process because we we want to hear everybody have something to say that is important to put on that letter. That that will be the case, Julie. Uh, Sam, do you uh, do you have uh, anything uh, anything else to say to share with the group? Uh, no, let me just well, let me first of all thank you for your thoughtful comments on this. Uh, in advance of receiving the letter, the discussion here has been very helpful to, to listen in on. I want to reiterate what I said at the outset, that uh, a lot of these issues are not new for the councils. The councils do look at resiliency. Um, they do try to figure out how to manage to make sure that the resources we have are sustainable through a wide variety of environmental uh, changes, including climate change. And I know this is something um, that is important to the Caribbean Council. And so I do look forward to that. Thank you very much for the input that you've given us and the input that uh, you're going to give us. It'll be very helpful. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Sam. Uh, before we close, I want to use the comments that Julian uh, made that I think some way, somehow, the government on the upper level should facilitate or coordinate the connection between agencies federal and local to land protection to work it better because right now they seem to be disconnected. That's another recommendation that I'm, uh, or comment I'm making. And That's thank you very much, Sam. And uh, Miguel, we, Sam, well, do you, <clears throat> let me know if you need to close the meeting now and go for a break or we leave it open, how we do? Well, the the session, the listening session is really NEM session. So Sam will say, you know, thank you. And, and we close it. Your comments are contained in the letter that Angeli just read. So that will be part of the letter that the council is going to prepare. So Perfect. the question is really for Sam, can we close the listening session at this time? Uh, if we feel that we've got all the input that we're going to get from the council, I think we can close the listening session with uh, my thanks for your, all of your participation. Thank well, you very thank much. You, the, the listening session is closed now and we're going to go to a break uh, for five minutes and come back, Miguel. Okay. Uh, Sam, I, I'm sorry that you are not able to go on a boat with Marcos again, but I hope to see you next time going free so you can visit the Caribbean again. Thank you a lot. S soon. Soon that will happen. <laughs> yeah. okay. Okay. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, five minutes, we come back at... Uh... 51. Okay. 351. See you guys okay. back at 351. Thank you.
Welcome everyone. Uh, we are back in business. It's 351, like I said, very sharp at 351, restarting the meeting. And uh, the next item on the agenda is the public comment from 4 to 415. Miguel, we have to wait for four o'clock specifically. Uh, maybe Jocelyn can uh, let me let me know about that. Marcos, it's not for the comment now. We need to finish what we started with Dr. Duarte. Hello? Hi, Miguel. Okay. Oops. Yes, I have my ear, my audio off. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, we need yes, to finish let's, Dr. Duarte's presentation today. Yes, let's, let's do... Uh, Dr. Duval presentation then, then we go to public comment. And people from the public that wants to comment, please uh, stay connected because we really want to hear what you have to say. Uh, Dr. Duval, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we, um, you all selected a, a draft uh, vision and draft mission statement. So next are the different goal themes and moving on to um, Management, so these were the three different management goal alternatives for your consideration. And so, you know, as Miguel has suggested, uh, select one of these, we will incorporate this into the full draft that you will see in July. Give a few, se few seconds for people to, to read it again, to re-engage on the discussion. Yeah, so again, I'll just, um, maybe I can just highlight that uh, these, um, that the management alternatives were really, um, you know, these are based on uh, overlap in the, in the, you know, goals from the island-based FMPs that uh, pertain to management. So, you know, that was the basis for these different um, for these different alternatives, you know, and, and these cover, you know, a variety of themes such as um, managing within local system ecosystem limits, ensuring continued health of fishery resources, providing for sustained community participation, uh, fostering uh, territorial and federal collaboration, um, things of that nature. So that's what these, these three alternatives are meant to encompass. Um, I'm happy to read them again, but uh, I thought perhaps other folks could read them on the screen and um, and provide okay. some, some thoughts. We, 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 just to make sure, I'm sorry to ask again, we have to choose one, correct? Correct. That's correct. And, so that uh, will be your, and, your draft uh, alternative. Yes. And uh, again, I'll like the mid one, the second one on the list. This is Marcos, the chairman of the Caribbean Council. And I'd like to hear the comments from the rest of the group. It's Tony Blanchard. I think the last goal, uh, management goal, I don't is the one that I, I believe works the best. The advanced management approaches that provide healthy local fisheries and ecosystems, consider the needs of island fishing communities and foster collaboration among management partners. I think that is my choice. I think it's the best choice. I think it takes into consideration all the things that we look for, or at least I look for. Okay, uh, lo uh, look like Damaris agree with Tony. Anybody else? This is Carlos, I do agree with Tony. Well, then, uh, anybody else? Well, Marcos, I'm um, not, I uh, don't have any problem to change my, I, got, I get his point and the rest of the people to, to agree on the third uh, bullet. Uh, the third bullet, uh, Michelle. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So let's move on to um, the next, which is the ecosystem and resource health goal alternatives. And so 
Um, you know, again, these were meant to in encapsulate common themes across the, the goals of all three of the island-based FMPs, such as continu ensuring continued provision of ecosystem services, uh, managing within the limits of local ecosystem production, um, ensuring the continued health of fishery resources, you know, and also, um, you know, this is a goal that will encompass your work on the fishery ecosystem plan. I'm going to follow up on the same line. I'm going to pick one for people who agree or disagree with me to just to move mm -hmm. the, the, the discussion. I, I pick the, the mid one, promote sustainable utilization. Any comments? Any, anybody, in, in, any, anyone in opposition? This is Carlos, I, I agree with you, Marcos, the middle one. Okay. Uh, hearing no opposition and agreement of Carlos, the middle one, that promotes sustainable utilization. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we have just two more. Um, this is a social, cultural, and economic goal statement alternatives and Again, you know, some of the common goals um, and themes from the island-based fishery management plans were providing for the sustained participation of communities, uh, you know, minimizing adverse impacts on those communities, promoting fair and equitable resource use, recognizing differences in local environment, culture, user groups, and things like that. Anybody else would like to comment? I just saw Damaris in the chat, number one, and I, I am in agreement with her. Anybody else will uh, wants to comment? This is Carlos, I agree with number one because it shows the unique characteristics of each island fishing community. Okay, any opposition to that? Hearing none, that's the one. Marcos, I'm, I'm, I'm trained. Okay, go ahead. I'll, Marcos, I'll wait for you, Tony. I'll, I'll, yes, I'll wait for you. Yeah, give me a minute to overlook this a little bit. No problem. We'll wait for you. Tony, we cannot hear. We cannot hear you. Put on the chat. Please. Tony, we cannot hear you. A little bit. Which one? We I'm trying to tell I'm trying to figure out what's the difference. I, I can hear you oh, now. We can Tony. hear you now. Okay. I was trying to figure what is the difference between alternative one and alternative three. What is the difference between them? If you could explain that to me. This is a question for Ms. Duval. Thank you, Tony. So I think really the, the difference between alternative one and alternative three is, is which piece of the statement comes first. So in alternative one, it's um, you know, ensuring that management, it, it puts the unique characteristics and needs of island fishing communities sort of in front of the fair and equitable resource use. And in the last alternative, it puts the fair, promoting fair and equitable resource use um, in front of unique social, cultural, and economic characteristics of the fishing communities. The third alternative also expands on what those unique 
characteristics are by calling out social, cultural, and economic characteristics. The first alternative um, just uses the blanket phrase of unique characteristics and needs of island fishing communities. Tony, we are waiting for you. Hello. Yes, are you there? Go ahead. Yeah, I'll support um, alternative one. Thank you, okay. Tony. Thank you, Tony. Uh, any, any, any other member in opposition? Hearing none? alternative one, the first one on the list. Okay, Mr. Chairman, this is the last one. Um, and then you all can go to public comments. So these are the communication and outreach goal alternatives. And so again, these were focused on some of the themes that came out of uh, the input that the council and the district advisory panels and the OEAP provided about um, trying to encompass things like uh, promoting public understanding um, and uh, uh, promoting participation, um, focusing on a diversity of tools um, and engaging audiences and uh, educating those audiences. So each one of these alternatives tries to incorporate all of those things. Just to start the discussion, I prefer the number two. This is Marcos. Anybody else? This is Carlos. I agree with Marcos, number two. Engaging is important. And I see Damara says I'll in support. the chat either two or three. I'll support number two. This is Tony. Thank you, Tony. Uh, anybody, anybody in opposition? Hearing now, number two it is. All right, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And thank you, council members. I, I really appreciate it. Um, and I'm looking forward to, uh, well, first of all, I'm looking to, I'm looking forward to engaging with the DAPs and the OEAP, um, hopefully in, in mid-June, I think were the dates that we settled on, and then a full presentation of the draft to the council in July for approval for um, some public review and comment. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, that will be July 21st. July 21st. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Duval, thank you very much. Like always, a great presentation, very clear, and you are very uh, organized and easy to, to deal with over the computer. <laughs> you make my life very, very easy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the public comment. Anybody from the public that they would like uh, to have a five minute period? This is Carlos. I'm not from the public, but I'd like to get a chance to say something when I get a chance. Go ahead, Carlos. Yeah, um, I kind of noticed that this morning was a, a, a mad rush. And I remember in the December meeting when Blanchard mentioned the same thing about rushing through agendas. And I'm wondering if maybe the council, when they have such a heavy load of an agenda, would consider either two and a half days or three day council meetings so that I think a lot of input was missed this morning that no one got a chance to, to participate because of how tight the schedule was. That's it. Thank you, Carlos, for saying that. And running the meeting was very, very tight. And I agree with you. We lost some opportunity of learning more and using the resources that we have available to us. We, I, I totally agree with you. That is something that in some cases we should explore that, that opportunity. Anybody else from, from the public? There is anybody else that connect from the public? Anybody else want to make a comment at this I'd like time? I'd to make a comment, Marcos. Go ahead, and Tony. Tony. I agree with Carlos. I thought that we were through that agenda. I think the agenda was stacked. 
it wasn't like it was a, a, a light agenda. It was a, a very heavy agenda. And I think at times where we wanted to pass because of trying to meet a timeline. And that's man, a computer not being face to face to actually have, actually have a conversation, in my opinion. I'm not a computer person. I, I feel a little out of water dealing with this, this uh, meeting this way. And I don't think I'm the only one. And I don't believe Carlos is the only one either. So that's just my take on it. I think we need to, to break down this. We lighten up on, on the agenda. And that's, I got, that's what I got. Thank you, Tony. And for, for sure, we have to explore uh, maybe a little more time, like Carlos said, or do less on the agenda. I think there was many important uh, opportunities today to get informed. We got a lot of information, but the comments are, are well noted. Thank you very much for both. Uh, we have a closed session coming up. Miguel, do you want to make any, any final observation? Observation about what? You don't have any other comments? We're going to adjourn the, the meeting just before saying, not before saying that we move the DAP reports for tomorrow. Miguel, can you help me with the, which time again we're going to accommodate uh, the DAP tomorrow? Okay, tomorrow we have at 8.30 the presentation by Dr. Chervet. That will be 15 minutes. By the way, Talking about the, the time of the agenda, that's okay if we spend the time, but also the time that only two council members talking, the rest are just silent, they're doing nothing. And it's very difficult to move the agenda. If it wasn't because Tony is there and Marcos, the other guys are quiet. So we can have one hour for one discussion, but if everybody really keep quiet, we don't go anywhere. Anyway, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Tony especially uh, with all the audio issues that he have, he was able to move, uh, to come to uh, Carlo Facetti, for that we are grateful. Tomorrow we can accommodate the presentation of the, of the dabs. They were put together by Graciela and Liahai. So right after Dr. Shever's presentation, we can have uh, the presentation by the, the, the APs. And then you move, you move the rest of the agenda accordingly. Thank you. Let's do that then. And uh, right now is 4.09 p.m. And thank you very much for, for everybody that attended to the meeting. Thank you for being kind to the chairman and uh, to all the staff. And I want to, to say the big thanks to the staff and all the support that we have to organize the meeting. Thank, thank you, everybody. Uh, the, me the meeting is adjourned. We have public uh, closed section coming up at 4.30 p.m. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You can close the meeting. Uh, Christina. <laughs>